All right. Welcome back, everyone, to Rejects and Friends Event Horizon. Rejects and Friends is mini showcase event for races, relays, uh, randomizers, anything that is auxiliary to our main stage events. Um, this is our 3D Zelda relay being done by Mini Mini 352, The Wildebeest, Dope Zera, The Real Nomen, The Corpser, and Your Average Link. Um, this is also a charity event. This is not just our standard event horizon fair. So if you take a look at the about page for this channel, you're going to see a QR code as well as a Redux and Friends 3D Zelda relay graphic. If you click on the graphic or go to the QR code, it will take you to a Tiltify page, which um, should allow you to donate to um, Planned Parenthood and also to the event. Redux and Friends always benefits Planned Parenthood and we are um, honored to be able to do that every single time. Um, this event will go on for quite a while. Um, many will be first with Wind Waker. Um, I will actually, excuse me. I will actually be passing it over to H Dog, who will be your first host for the event, and then I'll top and back back at the end. So, without further ado, I will turn it over to her and let her introduce the run. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Welcome on in. We are about to get underway with Minnie's Wind Waker Any Percent run, which is the first run of the relay today. Uh, on commentary, we've got Gymnast Eighty Six, who. I'm sure needs no introduction whatsoever. Um, so I'll turn it over to you two to introduce and give a bit of an intro to what you're doing. Yeah, hi. <laughs> Going to be doing Wind Waker Any Percent, and this game has a very long intro, so I'm ready to just start the run whenever, and then we can get to explaining. Yep, I'm ready. Alright, so this is Wind Waker, and like H said, I'm here with Jim. Hello, Jim. Hello, nice to be here, and nice to watch the Wind Waker intro again. Always a fun time. Yes, we love the intro. So, this run is going to, well, it's going to begin with a very difficult trick called Manual Super Swim that we'll get to. Um, it basically involves a lot of frame perfect pause buffering, and I'm quite nervous for it because. It's very easy to mess up, so I'm going to be like deafening and muting myself during that. But uh, we'll get to that in a second. But this run is basically like split into two parts. There's the first part where we just go and get all of the items we need to beat the game, and then we go and beat the game. And other than that, there isn't too much like story stuff we have to do to beat the game. So yeah, that's how it's going to go. Yeah, thankfully uh, with the glitches that we can do in Wind Waker, we can sort of just cut a path like to the end of the game once we have uh, all of the items that we need very conveniently so yeah uh, that is what we will be seeing yep uh, mini is also running the game on the japanese version uh, because the text is just faster on the japanese version that's pretty much the only difference in this specific category there are some minor version differences between like NTSC, POW, and JP, but the text is the only one uh, that really matters for any percent. Yeah, it's a lot faster. Unfortunately, uh, can't skip the intro. The intro, uh, at least on the Japanese version, uh, we don't get control of Link until I'm like just after the five minute mark. <laughs> yeah. So. We do allow skipping the intro using a cheat code or a save file, um, but just for relay purposes, we're not doing that right now. But yeah, after we do eventually gain control, like I said, I'm going to be doing the manual super swim. So essentially what's going to happen is I'm going to jump into some water and when Link does a 180 degree turn in the water, the game is going to apply some negative speed to him, which is like backwards speed. Um, so if I continue to turn back and forth frame perfectly, then I will just build up as much negative speed as I want. And I'm going to use that to do a super swim all the way to Dragon Roost, as my first goal is going to be to get the Wind Waker item, which will be extremely useful. 
Yeah, the game, uh, the game just doesn't have a cap, or it doesn't have like a, a check to make sure that like you have too much negative speed. Uh, it only tries to cap your speed in the positive direction when you're in water. So if you can just keep on, you know, gaining more and more negative speed, uh, there's no cap on that. And with enough speed, uh, you can simply just swim pretty much anywhere on the ocean that you want. Um, and as long as you have the, like, necessary air timer in the water to make it where you want to go. Yeah. So during the first RAF marathon, I did an all dungeons run, where I also did MSS. And I had to do some crazy backups during that. It worked, but it was very scary, so I'm hoping it can go a little bit smoother this time. Yeah, super swimming is a, uh... It's a very cool trick, but it's also extremely difficult uh, to control well, especially this first one uh, that we do at the beginning of the run. There will be more super swims that Mini does afterwards, but this first one is like, uh, it's, it, in my opinion, it is the hardest trick in the run to do well. Yeah, I would agree. And the thing with this as well is that during normal attempts, you like if you mess it up, you would just reset and try again. But during a marathon, obviously, you want to try to get it if you can. So doing these crazy backups is not something you would normally see. And something I don't hope to see, but yeah, it is always interesting when you have to try to back it up. But we are almost ready to gain control. Um, and yeah, as I said, I'm going to just not talk during this trick because I need to concentrate. So. I will be gone for a few minutes after this. Yeah. Now everyone gets to learn about all the nuances of manual super swim with Gymnast. Yep. Yeah, so like Minnie said, um, this trick allows him to get to Dragon Roost Island. Or, I mean, he could go anywhere in the ocean, but he wants to go to Dragon Roost Island so that he can get uh, the Wind Waker item because the Wind Waker is very useful. And ultimately, this will allow him to skip pretty much the entire introduction of the game. Uh, like, he's never gonna have to go back to Outset Island after this, once he swims away. So right now he's swimming over to this specific spot on the island where he can uh, get an air refill while he's still in the water. Um, in Wind Waker you have an air timer whenever you're swimming around that allows you to stay above water for 30 seconds before you drown. Uh, but if you swim against this wall that Minnie's up against, uh, there's a collision below uh, where he's swimming such that the game uh, essentially just refills his air meter all the time. Uh, which is very useful and is uh, one of the things that makes this trick possible to do. So we're seeing Minnie pause buffer uh, constantly here. Uh, for reference, um, each, each frame-perfect pause buffer that Minnie does to turn Link around uh, gets him essentially three in-game units of speed. And he needs to buffer up to about 500 units of speed um, before he can go into what we call the upcharge, which is where we can simply hold up on the control stick and sort of make the game's camera do the work for us on getting the super swim. Um, but of course that takes a while because that means you have to pause like 167 times <laughs> minimum. Um, so he has to do at least 167 frame perfect pauses for this trick to work, right? If he gets a two frame pause, uh, that's essentially the same as nothing happening because in a two frame pause, Link gains the speed on the first frame and then just loses it on the second frame. So uh, a two frame pause is not helpful, unfortunately. But it looks like Minnie's doing pretty well right now. Uh, we can see during the pauses that Link is uh, getting some serious distance on those frames. Probably has about 300-ish speed right now. Um, the scary thing about doing this trick is that you don't want to do what's called an early pause, where if you try to repause the game too early, um, like, the game won't repause at all. Like, there's no zero frame buffering in this game, like you might see in, you know, Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask. Um, so if you get that, you just don't pause again, and then you lose a whole lot of speed. Uh, because then you'll just be swimming in one direction for at least a few frames. But obviously, or it can be a lot longer than that, depending on uh, how bad the mess up is. But it looks like Minnie's doing pretty well so far. 
uh, he does almost have the necessary speed. Unfortunately, you can't quite tell what Link's exact speed is, uh, just based on, like, what the distance between uh, his oscillations is on every frame. Because the amount of distance that Link actually travels uh, is also dependent on where he is in his animation, like his swimming animation, right? Because he sort of, like, bobs his head up and down and, like, will go uh, forward or backwards slightly... Uh, like, slightly more or less, depending on where he is in his animation, and that effect gets exaggerated when you have, you know, like, 500 speed, which, for reference, uh, a regular roll in Wind Waker is 26 uh, in-game speed units. So, Mini Mini is almost there uh, with the speed that he needs. Obviously, like, the longer this goes on, it can kind of become a bit mentally taxing with just pausing over and over repetitively. Um, Minnie's also going to want to get a little bit uh, away from the island, just like that, uh, to make sure that he doesn't accidentally hit the land when he goes into the upcharge here. And let's see, he should be going into it within the next few pauses. Though he's just going to be holding up here, and because Link has so much speed now, uh, the camera is going to try to flip around every single frame uh, to look back at Link, which gives us the effect of we can just hold up on the control stick and we can uh, get more and more speed now without having to pause buffer, which is really nice. Um, and now Mini Mini is going to get the final air refill before shooting off to Dragon Roost Island. Very good. He successfully did not hit the shore, and it looks like we should be good to make it all the way there. Mini's also using a technique called uh, ESS swimming, where if you hold slightly outside of the dead zone while you're swimming, uh, you lose speed less quickly as you're going through. And all right, very good, he was able to make it. Pretty good time too for a marathon. He'll get the Wind Waker uh, before the 11 minute mark here because the cutscene is about a minute long. All right, so, Hello. yeah, very good. Yeah, not bad. Not GG's amazing, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, definitely not like the fastest ever Wind Waker time, but I just played it really safe and I'm just happy to be past the trick. Yeah. <laughs> Relatively speaking, most of the rest of the run is smooth sailing. Yes. <laughs> no pun intended. Because there won't be, like, any sailing, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, there'll be, like, ten seconds of sailing in the whole run. But smooth sailing, yeah? Yeah, very smooth. Yeah. Alright, so... Oh, yeah, you can go. Yeah, so we've got the Wind Waker, which will let us do a glitch called Storage, which has many applications throughout the run. Um, the first one we're about to see is it's going to make super swimming much easier. So that whole ordeal I just did with pausing for like five minutes is about to be obsoleted using the Wind Waker. So I'm going to do what's called a Wind Waker dive here and cancel it frame perfectly to give myself a glitch called Storage. And then I can activate a glitch called Camera Lock, which lets me automatically charge a super swim. And then, do you want to explain where we're going now? Yeah, so now that we can essentially super swim wherever we want uh, without having to pause the game 160 times, uh, we're going to be super swimming to Northern Fairy Island, and specifically the Northern Fairy Island submarine. Now, uh, this might seem kind of random, but the Northern Fairy Island submarine has moblins inside it, and specifically moblins which hold lanterns. And moblins which hold lanterns are special because if Link does not have a sword, uh, moblins with lanterns will simply throw him into the Forsaken Fortress jail, regardless of where he is, right? Because normally in the game, the only time you're not supposed to have a sword while you encounter Lantern Moblins is in Forsaken Fortress. So they're just hard-coded to throw Link into the Forsaken Fortress jail if they see him without a sword, like right here. Yeah, so he throws his lantern at me and suddenly I'm in jail. Yeah, so this, this is actually very convenient um, because we do have to complete the first iteration of Forsaken Fortress in this run. Um, at least, technically you don't have to, but uh, we're not going to get into how you do that, because that's way too yeah. complicated. <laughs> right, yeah, so, so, um... Beating Forsaken Fortress 1 is, like, really the only main story event, I guess, that we have to do in the run. Everything else other than this is pretty much just getting items and then going to be the game.
but we do need to beat Forsaken Fortress 1, because if we don't, the game will crash at some point later on. Yeah, so uh, if you guys remember when Mini got the Wind Waker, the King of Red Lions was not present. Um, even though like his, his speech and text was still there in the cutscenes, the King of Red Lions himself was not loaded. And the important thing about beating Forsaken Fortress 1 is that beating Forsaken Fortress 1 is sort of like the flag that allows the King of Red Lions to exist. Uh, so that's why it's necessary here. The mini's also going to get storage here on this ledge, and he's going to store uh, a very specific text trigger, uh, which we call the Gossip Stone trigger, here at the bottom of Forsaken Fortress. Uh, and the reason he did that is because one of the items that we need in the run is uh, the bombs. So, and the bombs we get in the pirate ship when it comes to Windfall Island. But the pirate ship actually has two different states, right? The first time you go into the pirate ship, it has the spoils bag. And then the next time you go to the pirate ship, it's supposed to have the bombs. So the way that the game switches between those two states is when you activate that specific Gossip Stone trigger in Forsaken Fortress that Mini Mini just stored. So now when he goes to the pirate ship later in the run, he will be able to actually get bombed. Instead of it still being in the uh, early game spoils bag state. And here we're also going to see another application of storage, which is called chest storage. Uh, so Mini got storage and then opened up that chest back there. And the uh, animation of Link opening the chest didn't quite finish. Uh, because the storage sort of ate that cutscene. But we still got the effects of opening up the chest, one of which is a reduced number of collision checks between Link and things colliding with Link, which allows Mini Mini to do stuff like this, where he can kind of just walk up walls. So he's going to use this effect to climb up this pillar to get to the top of this room uh, so that he can finish Forsaken Fortress quicker and get some rupees to buy the sale later. Yeah, and when I stored that chest, it didn't actually give me the rupees until I loaded a new area. So once I went through that door, then you heard the rupees sound effect. And now I have 60 rupees. Yeah, so as we can see, Wind Waker is a very useful item uh, because it allows us to do the storage glitch, which has many useful functions. Uh, Mini also picked up and placed down that barrel right there because if he didn't, then the moblin that was walking along the path would have seen him. Uh, the game sort of gives you a, a little bit of, like, invincibility when you put on the barrel, because, you know, you're supposed to be hiding so the moblins can't see you as easily. Uh, but that effect still persists even when you put, or even when you take the barrel off. Uh, the effect still persists for a few seconds afterwards, so we can use that to skirt past the moblin easily. Yeah, and now when I'm side link, I'm kind of mashing my control stick like flicking it and then going back to neutral it just makes you sidle a little bit faster. Okay, now we get a sword. So yeah, coming to FF1, Forsaken Fortress 1, there's already three things we want. Uh, the Gossip Stone trigger that we hit earlier, we want this sword because we never got a sword earlier, and we also need to just beat FF1. All right, long cutscene time. Yep. Would now be a good time for some donations in that case? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Team have been super duper generous. So we've got $20 from the lovely Jade Minabu. She says, excited to watch this 3D Zelda relay. Always happy to donate to a good cause. I hope all the runners have fun and I wish them and the commentators the best of luck. So Thank you very much, Jade. Uh, we also have $5 from Pippi in the Top Hat, who will be commentating later. Um, she says, please put this toward posting Minnie's Bail for Speed Jail. <laughs> so there you go, Minnie, you're, you're safe. Have Thank we you. got time for one more? Yeah, go for it. One more from Anonymous, someone being V secretive, um, says MSS feels okay, man. Have they given themselves away? We don't know. <laughs> It did feel okay. So yeah, I guess this cutscene gives us a bit more chance to explain um, that whole camera lock super swim we did, because I kind of glossed over that because <laughs> we were doing like two things at once. Um, so I got storage, which storage basically is essentially what it does is the next time an event happens that tries to take control of the camera, 
um, that event gets cancelled or stored. And so what I did was I got storage and then tried to pull the Wind Waker. And that event got cancelled. But normally when you pull the Wind Waker, the camera gets locked in front of Link's face. So that camera lock, what we call it, kind of persists when you store pulling out the Wind Waker. So if you get storage and try to pull the Wind Waker, you go into camera lock. So the camera is locked in front of your face, and that means if you go into water and just hold up on the stick, then Link will turn around, but then the camera will turn with him. And so then on the next frame, he'll turn around again, and the camera will go again. And so it just lets us automatically turn around every frame. Yeah, so... Thankfully, this glitch happens to exist in a game where the main mode of transport is a giant ocean. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's extremely convenient. Um, it's also, uh, it's a little bit more difficult than, like, just holding up. You do have to sort of look at Link and see, uh, like, which direction he's, he's, uh, facing to the side of the camera. Because he's not facing, like, directly into the camera, uh, yeah. for camera lock. So you do have to hold, like, slightly up left or slightly up right, depending on what, uh, Link's orientation is. Which makes it a little difficult to control, like, really well. Uh, but yeah, Minnie's an experienced runner, so he knows how to control it good. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we're now at Windfall, and I'm going to collect some more rupees by the sale for 80 rupees. And then our next goal is to go and get a Quiver upgrade, which seems a bit random at first. Like, why do we need just a Quiver upgrade? We don't even have a bow. But uh, it will be useful later, we'll see why. But first, getting the sale. Oh man, only three flower rupees. Yeah, not great. Yeah, so the rupees in the flowers are RNG. Uh, the blue rupees in these pots are not RNG, they're thankfully uh, consistent. Yeah. So this pot here is, if I get a green rupee, then that sucks. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> uh, the good old 79. Always gotta have the, uh, the marathon RNG to start things out. So now I need to go talk to King of Red Lions, but I'm going to store his text box. That was interesting. What? <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> right, so I get storage. Now I've stored his text box. I'm going to use this to do a trick called door cancel, which is going to let me enter the fairy fountain very easily to get the quiver. Yeah, so right now Mini is going to get storage again while he has the text on screen. Uh, so this is going to give him the effect of having storage while there's text on screen. And this is important because if you have text on screen and cancel it, uh, that will give you storage again if you don't already have it. So he used his first storage to store opening up that door right there. And then he canceled this text, which now... Um, oh, excuse me, he used the first one to activate camera lock. And then he cancelled the text and used the second storage uh, to open up the door, or to cancel the animation of opening up the door. Uh, so this had the effect of turning out the lights, because the game, you know, normally fades out when you open a door like this. And now because he's in camera lock, he can super swim with the lights out. But he also has the effect of, uh, he doesn't actually collide with anything horizontally now. Like, all horizontal collision has been disabled, so he can essentially just walk through walls. Right. Although uh, the lights being out does make super swimming over to the fairy fountain with the quiver upgrade a little bit difficult. So Minnie does have to pause to make sure he's going in the right direction uh, here. But it looks yeah. like he managed to get it. Yeah. And then very luckily, when you pause the game, it lets you see for a brief second. Yeah. And then you can also see certain light sources uh, even in the state. Like you can see the fire in front of the fairy fountain, which is a good visual cue to know if you're going in the right direction. I. <laughs> Got lost. <laughs> but yeah, so because there's no horizontal collision, Minnie just goes through the wall and enters the fairy fountain. Yeah. Normally you would need the hammer to enter that one.
Alright, and then if I try to enter this fairy fountain through the exit, that fire is still there and it's actually just going to immediately knock me back into the fairy fountain. However, because of the way the game updates its save flags, which is like where it thinks you should save warp to, if I do a save warp here, the game is going to put me back at windfall. Because after you beef a stake in Fortress 1, the game says, okay, you should spawn at Windfall now if you save warp. And because it doesn't expect you to leave Windfall, then that doesn't get updated until you start sailing away in King of Red Lions. So I am just back at Windfall now. It's yeah, so a very convenient save warp location. Because um, Minnie is actually going to be doing. Uh, a trick called Great Fish Cutscene Skip right now, because the next goal in this run is that Minnie wants to go get the bombs. Uh, and to get the bombs, he first has to go to Great Fish Island so that he can uh, trigger a cutscene that will start the Endless Night sequence of the game and will put the pirate ship on Windfall for him to go get the bombs for. Uh, but he doesn't really want to watch the Great Fish cutscene, so he got an instance of double storage again. So he has storage while he's super swimming over to Great Fish right now, right? And what he's going to attempt to do is he's going to attempt to drown, but because he drowns with storage, um, the game is sort of just going to continue running in the background while he drowns, and it's going to activate the cutscene at Great Fish. But because Link drowns and voids out, he immediately spawns back at Windfall where the King of Red Lions is, but with the effect of the cutscene having been played. Because thankfully the flag for Endless Night gets set right at the beginning of the cutscene there. So very nice on that. Good job. Right. And now the pirate ship's here means we can go get bombs. And uh, normally you would have to go and watch a long cutscene to get the pirate, not the pirate, the password to enter the ship. Um, however, I'm going to do a trick called a roll clip, where I climb a ledge, partially clipped into the wall, and then do a frame perfect roll to clip into the wall, and then I can just easily navigate and go into the door from behind. Yeah, so even though the like the out of bounds collision there is like pretty thin, you don't have a lot of space to work with. But uh, there's actually the setup we use is like very consistent thanks to the notches on the control stick. Yeah, it's very nice. Ah! <laughs> now we get to swing on some ropes and hopefully not fail it. This is very easy to mess up, though. Yeah, so the strategy here is we kind of uh, want to jump on the ropes, or at least on this first rope, with the diagonal orientation already, because in this game you can't turn and swing on ropes at the same time, unlike, say, Wind Waker HD, so turning on the ropes is very slow. So anytime we can avoid doing that is nice. Yeah, and then I also did some uh, re-grabs on the rope where if you jump off at specific timings, then Link can re-grab the rope and gain some speed. Just stops you having to swing back and forth as many times. Alright, so we got the bombs. And the last item we need to go get is the Deku Leaf. After this text, he will be save warping again, clipping the bombs. Uh, we wanted to get the bombs first because normally to get the Deku Leaf, you need to have the grappling hook item just to like grapple a spot to swing on uh, to get up to where the Deku Leaf is. But we don't have the grappling hook, and the grappling hook takes a long time to get and is not useful for very much. So instead, we get bombs first uh, because bombs will allow us to uh, reach the Deku Leaf uh, using a glitch called Zombie Hovering. We will get to once we super swim over to Forest Haven. 
So the game is also going to be uh, in the or in the endless night state here for the rest of the run. So hope you guys like the rain. Yeah, and I'm doing what's called double storage on this super swim, where I stored that text box before activating camera lock and then close the text. So I now have storage, which means I can store this intro cutscene at the island, which would normally soft log in camera log. Here, I'm going to try to do a ledge clip while in camera log. So I just clip through that ground. And now because I'm still in camera lock, I can activate, I can charge up another sort of mini super swim and go straight into Forest Haven. So that ledge clip, I placed a bomb and I tried to climb into the bomb and then the game basically says you can't be in the same place as the bomb so it pushes me the other way but then that ends up pushing me out of bounds. going to take some damage. Yeah, so this damage will be for the zombie hover trick coming up soon. But before the zombie hover trick, um, Mini Mini is going to be doing a trick known as Deku Tree Cutscene Skip. So normally when you meet the Deku Tree, uh, you have to kill a bunch of choo-choos that are annoying, and then you get this like two minute long cutscene uh, that you have to watch where the Deku Tree explains some things and then also makes the Deku Leaf appear. Uh, but what we're going to try to do instead, or I guess what Minnie's going to try to do, is he's going to try to uh, sort of do the same thing that he did for the Great Fish cutscene, where he voids out and then activates uh, that cutscene, which will still set the flags associated with the cutscene. And the way he does this is a bit weird. Uh, he first got storage once and then bonked into the Deku tree, so he stored... Uh, that bonking animation, which puts the choo-choos in this really weird state where they're just kind of sliding along the ground. And the way that he's going to try to kill the choo-choos in this sense is he's going to push them out of bounds so that they fall all the way uh, out of the map. And once they fall far enough, the game considers them to be dead. Um, this seems a little strange, but uh, <laughs> the reason we're doing it like this is so that we can actually set up getting crushed by the Deku tree. Uh, as a way of voiding out, so that we don't have to watch the cutscene. So I mean, he's going to side hop into the last chew to push it out of bounds, and then he's going to wait for the Deku Tree to sort of go through this like cyclic motion a bunch of times before he attempts to get crushed by the Deku Tree's chin right here. And if the timing all worked out with the chew pushing out of bounds and getting crushed, then we skip the cutscene. And it looks like that was good. Yep, he respawns standing up, which is an indicator that the trick worked. Uh, so no cutscene. But the Deku Leaf is still spawned at the top of the tree, so... Uh, now we have to get to the top of the tree, where Mini Mini is going to be doing uh, the zombie hover glitch right here. So he's going to kill Link using a bomb, and then uh, once Link gets up, there's actually a roughly 10 frame window that you have to do a jump attack. Um, and when you do a jump attack when you're dead, the game is like, oh, you're not supposed to be able to jump attack. So it immediately cancels the jump attack to try to get you to fall down to the ground and die. But that gives you the opportunity to do another jump attack, right? So you can just sort of keep on chaining jump attacks over and over again by mashing the B button as fast as you can, which is what Minnie is doing right here uh, to get all of this height going upwards. And because the Deku Leaf uh, is located in a bit of a weird spot, he has to, like, uh, go up against the Deku Tree's... Uh, tree? I'm not, this isn't a branch, I don't know what the word is, but... so. <laughs> He's just zombie hovering up against the Deku tree so that he can get into the proper position to get to where the Deku Leaf is. And thankfully, the game allows you to collect items when you're dead, so we can just get the Deku Leaf like this. Yeah. Very is lucky. Is it a trunk you're thinking of, Jim? Yeah, the trunk. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. So we now have all of the items we need to beat the game. And so the place we're going to go is to Forsaken Fortress, which is on the complete opposite side of the map from here. I'm going to do another double storage super swim so I can get chest storage, which we saw earlier, or let me walk up bits of collision. And the chest I'm storing is located at the very uh, bottom right corner of the map, and Forsaken Fortress is at the very top left corner, so this is going to be basically 
the longest possible super swim you can do in the game. Yeah, and this the super swim is uh, a bit scary, not just because it's like the longest super swim you can possibly do, but because if Mini isn't careful, um, there is a chance that the game could trigger a reload um, just due to how the game manages uh, memory for things that get loaded on the ocean. Um, so he has to be careful to not load specific quadrants of the ocean to reduce the chances of that happening, right? So he doesn't want to, like, for instance, super swim back into the Forsaken Fortress quadrant or super swim into the Windfall quadrant uh, because those quadrants take up a lot of memory in the game. So he's specifically trying to avoid those. And he also doesn't want to accidentally swim into the Great Fish quadrant again because if he does that, the game's get a soft lock because... Uh, the cutscenes there didn't quite get resolved when we did the Great Fish cutscene skip, so um, if you try to go back to the Great Fish quadrant after doing that, the game just soft locks, even if you don't have camera lock. So he's gotten enough speed. He was able to get air refills with chest storage uh, on uh, the five star aisle aisles there. And now he's just super swimming across uh, about halfway there now. Looks like it'll mostly be good. Uh, it is obviously a bit difficult to see because of, uh, like, the fact that it's nighttime and it's raining, but Minimini was able to make it here. Uh, he does obviously not want to drown, though, so he's making sure that he can get to uh, a spot where he can stand on. All right, there you go. Not where I meant to land, but that was. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, now with chest storage, it's uh, a pretty quick climb up Forsaken Fortress. Uh, chest storage essentially just allows you to climb any wall that's angled less than 90 degrees, which there are a lot of here, so. Yeah, so we just <laughs> ascend up the walls. And then at a certain point, the walls just stop having collision. So we can just jump right through them and into the loading zone. Yeah, so very convenient. Uh, big shout outs to chest storage. Yes. All right, well, now we have another uh, very long story cutscene, so I think uh, now would also be a good time if we have more donations. We do indeed. Thank you very much. So, first one comes from our good friend Yadam Goof, and it's for ten dollars. And um, <clears throat> I need to do this properly. I believe it's um, it's pronounced. Um, <clears throat> Oh! If that didn't clip out completely. <laughs> um, we also have a massive $50 from Golden Devil 1711 who says, Happy to donate to a fun relay for a fantastic cause. Good luck to all of the runners, Kalok Champ. Um, for one more? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one final one from GMO Pasta for $20. Uh, it says, Good luck, Mini. Jim Fish, Mini. <laughs> And mini mini wobble. I'm not going to read it all out, but both both your best emotes. I would say. I would say. Thank you. There you go. Beast posted it. All right. So yeah. So the reason we're coming to Forsaken Fortress Two is because it is essentially just the easiest way we have of getting to the end of the game. Because after you beat Forsaken Fortress Two, the game like forces a trip to Hyrule, which is where Ganon's Tower is, where we can be the game. And we can just come to Forsaken Fortress whenever we want. It's it's just always on the overworld. We can just come here. And yeah. This cutscene right here is also very important because it switches a flag internally in the game called the animation set, which isn't super important for this run, but basically if you try to watch late game cutscenes without watching this cutscene first, they would all just crash. So we do actually have to watch this cutscene at some point. Yeah, and the, the, the interesting thing about that crash, while well, also Errol is flying here because uh, Gonzo yeah. doesn't <laughs> exist, but um, the interesting thing about like the cutscene crashes that happen is that um, those cutscene crashes that happen don't happen because like the game can't handle like the cutscene with the ran with the wrong animation set. The game can, it just looks weird. Um, the reason the game crashes is because the developers told the game to crash if the animation set was wrong. Basically, nice. so... <laughs> um, 
yeah, they, they left some assertion statements in the game. For those of you who are programmers. So, uh, we don't have the Skull Hammer. Um, which, normally you need to beat the Helmrock King. But thankfully there's like six different ways you can skip the Helmrock King. Uh, so the Skull Hammer will not be necessary. Yeah, even a glitchless speedrun can skip it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thankfully the Helmrock King is one of those bosses where uh, the loading zone to like continue the game after you beat the boss is just always loaded. Uh, it's not like, you know, a, the warp at the end of a dungeon that only appears once the boss is beaten, because uh, the exit for this arena is opening up a door into Ganon's lair. So we're just going to fly around the Helmrock King here using the Deku Leaf. Uh, to get past him, and then Minnie is going to be damaging down here to get to uh, a heart and a half of health, which is critical health. Um, this is where Link's animation changes, and he, like, hunches forward a bit if you just, like, stand still. And this is important because it makes this next clip right here that Minnie is doing uh, basically free. Uh, if you climb up uh, far enough into that ledge right there, uh, you just kind of are in the wall. And if you have critical health, you just go into the wall for free, basically. If you don't have critical health, you have to do what's known as a roll clip, uh, which Minnie did to get into the pirate ship earlier to successfully do that clip. So uh, even though it's technically slower to do uh, the critical health method, uh, it's significantly more consistent because you don't actually have to do anything once you grab the right spot on the ledge. Yeah. And I'm actually damaging down for a zombie hover later anyway, so... It really is barely slower to do that. Yeah. But yeah, and you see Link right now. He's holding the Hero Shield and the Master Sword. And that is not just a visual thing. I actually have the Hero Shield and the Master Sword now. Because this game, if Link tries to draw his sword in a cutscene, and you don't have that sword, it just gives it to you. So I now have the Master Sword and the Shield. Yeah. He also has different clothes, but uh, the clothes he doesn't get to keep, those will go away after the cutscene is over. Yeah. But yeah, so the, the reason, at least I'm, I'm pretty sure the reason, this is kind of just speculation, but like, when you first get the Master Sword, um, like, you get it in a cutscene where Link draws it, right, out of the pedestal, so I'm pretty sure that the reason the game just gives you the sword if you draw it in any cutscene is because it just has that same effect that the Master Sword cutscene has when he draws the sword there. But yeah, very convenient effect because not having the Master Sword for uh, later parts of the run would make things very difficult. Yeah, and a shield as well. We do indeed need a shield to be the game. Yeah, just got some more cutscenes here. After we go to Hyrule, um, basically the plan of action is we're going to enter Ganon's tower by doing barrier skip, because there is a big barrier that tries to prevent us from getting to Ganon's tower early. And it managed to prevent us for, what, 17 years? But <laughs> eventually we found a way past it. And then in Ganon's tower, I'm going to make my way to get the light arrows, and then in this run, I'm going to attempt a very, very difficult trick called Puppet Ganon Skip, which is essentially a very long zombie hover with a bunch of bomb boosts and stuff. And it saves some time, but again, it's very difficult, so my plan is to attempt it once to see if I get it, and if I don't get it, I'm just going to fight Puppet Ganon as intended. But we'll get there when we get there. Yeah, for now, we can enjoy uh, the Lu just kind of sitting on nothing, because we never raised the Tower of the Gods, so it's just not in this cutscene. Yeah. Actually, there is one part of the Tower of the Gods that's in this cutscene, and it's the bell at the very top. Yeah. For some reason, uh, the bell at the very top of the Tower of the Gods is just always there. <laughs> Yeah. Even if you haven't raised the Tower of the Gods yet. Yeah, 
even just on the normal overworld, you can, if you really wanted, you could zombie hover up to the bell, and it's just there. Unfortunately, ringing it doesn't do anything on the overworld, but uh, it's funny yeah. that it just exists and is floating all the way up there. So this is uh, the cutscene that would have uh, crashed the game if Mini hadn't completed Forsaken Fortress 1 earlier. And this cutscene would softlock additionally if Mini didn't buy the sale, or at least it would have potential to softlock if he didn't buy the sale and he wasn't, like, careful. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we beat Forsaken Fortress 1, is to make sure we could get past this cutscene. <laughs> All right, so that is like the last long cutscene for a while. There's going to be quite a lot of stuff going on now. He Hyrule says as we're in another cutscene. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man, this is actually the last cutscene for a while. The castle is all broken. It's pretty intense. I'm going to be rolling a wide path here because there is a. Uh, King of Red Lions text trigger, where if I press A, it'll activate some texts, and I want to press A to roll, so I just avoid the text trigger. Oh, All right. a barrier. Yeah, it's time for the biggest trick in the game. Yep. So, the barrier actually has two parts. Uh, there's the knockback barrier, which we can visually see here, uh, that Minnie is trying to get into. Uh, to cancel the knockback barrier, you basically need to activate some sort of cutscene on the uh, next time that the damage barrier would try to hit you, just like that. So then he pulled out the Wind Waker at the same frame that the damage barrier tried to hit him. And now he's doing a specific series of inputs to get into a very precise position. Um, because to do barrier skip in this game, you essentially need to drop a bomb behind yourself and to have that bomb push you forward in a very specific direction and angle. So let's see if he gets that here. Okay, so he missed uh, missed the two frames that he had to drop the bomb. All right, very nice. So the barrier, uh, there's like a... The, the barrier sort of comes together at two different uh, collision polygons in the center of the bridge, uh, but those polygons don't quite come together correctly, so... There's, like, the tiniest of gaps between those two polygons. And if Link has enough speed when traveling directly through that gap, he will just go through, basically. Uh, none of Link's normal movements give him enough speed. Like, rolling is not enough speed to get through that gap, right? Uh, but if you drop a bomb on top of Link, the bomb will displace him enough distance to clip through that small gap. Uh, which is why we had to drop the bomb behind us and couldn't just, like, you know, roll or side hop or something like that. Because even though it's just one frame of displacement, it's enough to get through. And that's how we skip uh, pretty much the whole game. <laughs> yeah. So, who would have yeah, so thought that... just drop a bomb behind you? Yeah. So with that, right, the position, the angle, and the timing were all very precise. It's very perfect, as well as all the position and angle. And now I'm doing right. trial skip. Yeah, so the first thing that you're normally supposed to do in Ganon's Tower is you're supposed to refight all of the dungeon bosses again. Um, but we don't have any of the dungeon items, so we can't really do that. Uh, but we do have the power of ledge clipping and roll clipping, so uh, we simply clip out of bounds and get behind uh, the door that normally tries to block us. Yeah, so just another roll clip there. And then to enter that door, I just did a weird thing where, for some reason, on that side of that door, if you sidle into the wall next to it, you can just kind of clip into the door and touch the loading zone. So that's what I did there, and then I also did another step where I dropped a bomb at the same time. So it just kind of pushed me while I'm sidling and made me go into that door a little bit faster. So this maze, thankfully, uh, the order, or like the directions you have to go in the maze are the same every time. So we just memorize what the path is and execute that path. 
The way you're supposed to know what the path is, is uh, when you defeat Phantom Ganon in each of these rooms, his sword will fall in a specific way that points you to where the next door is supposed to be. So you can get to the end here. Ah, oh, nice RNG. Right, RNG. So there's, there's three different attacks that Phantom Ganon can give you, and the fastest one is the one where he just spawns in a circle uh, with like a bunch of fake clones around, because the other two attacks you have to essentially wait for him to attack you uh, before you can counter the attack and damage him. A nice, like, eight second time save that, that RNG gives. Yeah. So I have the Light Eyes now. And this is the reason I got the Quiver earlier, is that you can't actually use the Light Arrows if you just get the Light Arrows. You need a Quiver. And normally when you get the Bow in Tower of the Gods, it gives you a Quiver with it. Um, but because we only got the Light Arrows, the game would not recognize that we have a Quiver, and so we wouldn't be able to actually shoot any. But now we can because I got the Quiver. Now we just do Grand Staircase, kill all these enemies. And then after this is when normally you would go and fight Papa Ganon. But I am going to be doing a trick called Papa Ganon Cutscene Skip, which is going to, as the name suggests, skip the cutscene and also prevent Papa Ganon from spawning in the room. And that is going to allow me to do the Papa Ganon Skip trick, which again is a just a very long and difficult zombie hover, which I will attempt once. Yeah, this is by far the longest zombie hover in the game. Of like all the possible useful zombie hovers that there are. So, uh, what Mini is gonna do to skip, or I guess it. It's more it's like a. He's gonna prevent the cutscene from being able to play when he enters the Puppet Ganon room. So, he's first gonna store. Um, the door into the room right here after he gets storage. And this has the weird effect of just removing the door's collision completely. Um, but this also gives us uh, free access to like the loading zone that's behind it, which is what actually loads the room. And with this next iteration of storage that Minnie's going to get, he's going to attempt to do what's known as a void warp um, into the Puppet Ganon room, where he's going to activate the loading zone into the room, but then he's going to void out. And what that's going to do is it's going to um, essentially spawn Link into the Puppet Ganon room, but it's going to force Link into a respawning state, which is going to prevent the cutscene from being able to activate properly. So Link's just going to like get up off of the ground, basically, uh, once Minnie does the void warp here. The two rolls, place the bomb behind him, and then targeted slash, and down he goes. I picked up a heart by accident, but that's fine. I have enough bombs. Alright, so I'm gonna mute and deafen myself during this. I want to concentrate. So yeah. Good luck, me. <laughs> Good luck. Alright, so Mini is going to set up against this pillar right here. And he's going to backwalk a bit, get into position, and wait for the bomb to blow him up, because he wants to keep this extremely specific angle that he has right now, uh, while he zombie hovers up into the room. And this is going to take a while, just because this room is really tall. Um, he's also not exactly parallel um, with the wall right now. He's, like, ever so slightly aimed to the right of it, so eventually he is going to, like, go past the wall uh, once he gets high enough. Um, so the tricky thing about this is that Mini needs to heal when he gets to the top of the room somehow, right? Um, but the only source of health at the top of the room are two pots that each contain a fairy in them. Uh, so what Mini has to do now is once he gets to the top of the room, he has to somehow, uh, change his orientations that he's facing towards where one of those pots is, and then he has to break the pot and then get touched by the fairy that's inside the pot. So he's almost up to the top right here. Uh, okay, yeah, so this is the part of, like, the wooden infrastructure that he wants to be on. And so Minnie's gonna be attempting to use, uh, bombs to change his orientation while staying at the top of the room here. 
So he's gonna pull out a bomb and then pull out the leaf for one frame to drop the bomb while he's in midair. And then he's going to be hovering up against the bomb in hopes that he uh, keeps a specific angle next to it. So that the bomb will blow him up and change his orientation for him. Right, so there's the first one. And now for this next one, he has to do it again. Uh, so he has to hover up again really quickly and then pull out the bomb, pull out the leaf to drop it, and then hover up against it again so that he doesn't go in front of it, which would be bad. And he has to make sure that it blows him up to the correct orientation again. Okay, this looks good. And then he has to start the hover again. <laughs> and so now he's in line to uh, get to that pot in the distance, which has the fairy. And he's also going to use the uh, scaffolding right here to push himself to the right so he's actually in line with the pot. So, uh, I believe that's the hardest part done. I've never actually done this trick myself, but from what I understand, the angle changes right there are the hardest part. So he's gonna get really high up again. He's gonna drop a bomb somewhat far away from the pot first, and then he's going to hover farther forward and drop another bomb so that the fairy pot actually explodes uh, with the proper timing here. And I believe he's trying to get blown up into the fairy. And, yep, so, okay, so the fairy didn't touch him right there by the looks of it, but I think he's gonna hope that the fairy runs into him. Uh, unfortunately, the fairy is kind of running off in a bad direction, so I'm not sure this is gonna work anymore, unfortunately, but... Uh, basically, ideally, you would get healed by the fairy at the end there. Um, but yeah, it doesn't look like that's gonna happen, which is unfortunate, but a very good display otherwise. I'm pretty sure you did everything correctly there, it just didn't work out with the fairy. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've been very consistent at getting to the ending today, but I've not been good at finishing it, but hey, I got to the end. That's good enough, I guess. Yeah, a good demonstration anyway. And now we can see a perfect pup again in fight, right? Yes. <laughs> Alright, would have been cool to get it, but I'm happy with that either way. So unfortunately, we still have to watch the cutscene um, for the fight because we didn't like, like we didn't like you know, uh, like trigger the cutscene earlier. We just completely bypassed it, so it's it's still here, unfortunately. Yeah. So it's on the Pichu skip in any percent saves a lot of time. Um, normally in the Pichu skip route, you get to skip getting the quiver as well because you just skip light arrows completely. Um, but for the relay, I didn't want to just like soft lock if I couldn't get the skip, so I just got the quiver anyway. Because if you go to Hyrule without the quiver, then it's impossible to beat the game unless you do the skip. And I didn't want to just get stuck here forever. Yeah, it's nice that, uh, it's kind of cool that both skipping Puppet Ganon is, like, a cool trick, and fighting Puppet Ganon itself is also just, like, a cool fight. Because it's, yeah. it's one of the fights in the game that's, like, actually challenging to do really well. Um, most of the other fights, like, you can get fairly consistent at for the most part, but Puppet Ganon is always the one that uh, is, like, a true test of, like, skill and, like, adapting to how the boss is trying to do things uh, on the fly. Yeah, so this fight is essentially just sniping with the bow. Each phase, three phases, each one I have to shoot the tail three times, and I'm just going to try to aim good, hit it fast. So if I'm good at the beginning, I can get a really fast shot. Good. Pretty good. Yeah, that's basically a perfect fight, or perfect first phase. Yeah, normally, like, uh, 
Normally the right. game expects you to use the boomerang to like cut down the tail and shoot it, but if you're good enough, you can just snipe it as it moves around, so. Yeah, then the second phase, the spider, I can get a double shot here. The spider with six legs, that is. Uh, a little bit early on that. I think magic drops by the keys, thankfully. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, that's okay. I want to take damage anyway. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> what? Forgot to switch back to light arrows. That is silly. Again, and uh, sometimes does not cooperate. That is not very good. <laughs> this yep, is okay. exactly the same thing I did in the last relay. <laughs> I died on the last phase, last hit. I did that like last week. So <laughs> this is unfortunately something that just happens sometimes. Try again. See, so, yeah, I'm with Chad on this one. I'm pretty sure that was Makar's fault. Yeah. Yeah, he just turned in a weird way. I wasn't expecting it. Licked his tail at me. Thankfully, we don't have to watch the cutscene again this time, so it's just straight fight. Yeah, one of the weird things about uh, the first phase is that Puppet Ganon's tail, after you hit it each time, it sort of has like, uh, like it can sort of be either more to the left or more to the right of the, uh, like behind Puppet Ganon, and if it's more to the right, it can make it more annoying to hit, um, because uh, it's easier to shoot the tail right before Papaganon tries to attack you because he's standing still, but when his tail moves to the right, it's uh, it's mostly blocked by him the entire time, which is annoying. I cannot do Crip Shot right now. Also, it's the keys would be nice. I fought Puppet Ganon yesterday, the keys were not nice. Once again, ow, did I tried yeah, to damage yeah. down, but. Yeah, a little too far away. <laughs> right. Just playing safe this time, I guess. Yeah, so for the third phase, um, like, it is technically fastest to do the third phase by, like, sniping the tail just from wherever you are, but, um, 
We do want to take damage because we want to damage down for the upcoming zombie hover that we use to get to, uh, like, the Ganon fight. And every time Puppy Ganon runs into you, he does half a heart of damage, so it's generally better for the third phase to just, like, hold out a bomb above your head and just let Puppy Ganon ram into you. Uh, so that you get stunned and you get damage out of the process, which you will use later. So, like we mentioned earlier, we never got the grappling hook in this run, and normally you're supposed to use the grappling hook to climb to the top of this room. There are two requirements for it. The first one we can skip with a very nice clip. Well, I say very nice, a pretty dumb clip that hopefully won't fail, but <laughs> sometimes it does. Um, and then the second one, the way I'm going to try to to do it is by shooting a fire arrow at one of the morph enemies and hoping that it will burn the warp pot lid. But unfortunately that is RNG. Yeah, so uh, the when you shoot an arrow in this game, the arrow moves fast enough that like uh, if an enemy is close enough behind, like, a wall or a ceiling that you shoot the arrow into, uh, the arrow will also, like, kill the enemy or make contact with the enemy. So let's see, Minnie get the clip. Okay, very nice. So, Minnie's gonna shoot a fire arrow up at the morph up here. Um, and what'll ideally happen is the morph will catch on fire, and during its death animation, it will uh, make contact with the lid of the warp pot and burn the lid of the warp pot. Okay, so unfortunately it did not happen here. Um, for some reason, the way that the Morph dies is RNG. Like, the specific animation it has is RNG. And only one of the animations that it has actually works for getting enough distance to hit the Warp Pot, so... Uh, instead, Minnie's gonna go for the backup strategy here, where he's gonna blow up the uh, Warp Pot using a bomb. Uh, by hovering up here first. This is slower because uh, Minnie's now dead, so he'll either have to get revived at the top here or he'll have to uh, uh, death warp and run all the way back up. Although I believe he's trying to go for the uh, the alternate strategy here where he gets healed by the fairy. Thanks. Yep, alright, very nice. That hover is kind of hard to land on the fairy, but... It is very nice not having, not having to, you know, death warp and then run all the way back up. Yeah, so now he just has to take all the damage again. Yeah, because we have to do another zombie hover. Uh, let me just do this. Get my mobs back. Right, and then also in this room, you're supposed to have the hook shot, which we're going to skip with a different zombie hover. And this time, instead of using a fairy to heal, I'm going to use one of these morph enemies. Yeah, so uh, normally um, the morphs, uh, if you try to like shoot them with your bow, they don't drop anything. Um, they're specifically only programmed to drop uh, like hearts or magic if you kill them with your sword. But very conveniently, uh, there happens to be a glitch we can do where we can kill the Morph and have it latch onto us at the same time. And that will set the flag that says the Morph has been killed by our sword, so it actually drops a heart. Uh, but it doesn't actually, like, kill the Morph, it just sets that flag. So now Minnie was able to use the Leaf to blow the Morph up onto the platform, and he's getting it into position right now so that he can zombie hover up to the heart that it's going to drop. Um, and then he's gonna shoot it, it's gonna drop the heart, he's gonna start a zombie hover by using a bomb, and as long as the zombie hover is done well enough uh, before the heart disappears, uh, you can just make it up here and heal on the heart. And then Minnie also grabs some safety morphs, because he's gonna want to get, um, yeah, some extra hearts for the uh, Ganondorf fight. Because Ganon will do one heart of damage, regardless of what attack he does, so... If you don't have safety hearts, you only can you're, you can't get hit at all during the fight, which sometimes doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> if you have the grappling hook, you can get some hearts from Zelda, but we don't. So 
that is not an option. Yeah, yeah those two hovers were... Cutscene. Yeah, <laughs> those two hovers were pretty clean. Happy with how they went, at least. I find it uh, quite ironic that the puppet cannon room simultaneously has the longest useful zombie hover and the shortest useful zombie hover. Yeah. In the same room, one right after the other. <laughs> <laughs> Do we yeah, have time for a couple of donations in this? Yeah. yeah. Me, or have I left it too long? No, Wonderful. that's fine. Awesome. You got like three minutes. Wow, oh, excellent. I'll slow down a bit. Um, we have $20 from Renegade Boss, who didn't leave a message, but we thank you all the same, kind sir. Um, and we also have a massive $50 from Coco Jammin as well. He says, GG, Mini. I second that. GG, that was nice. a lot of hovering. I bet your hand hurts now. Nah, uh, it's fine. <laughs> I'm used to it. Yeah, so... Uh... At least with, with, at least for me personally, uh, like the way that I zombie hover is by like repeatedly flexing and unflexing my bicep. So zombie hovering doesn't actually hurt like my hands or wrists at all. It just yeah. makes my bicep sore if I do it too much. Yeah, same. So yeah, after this cutscene, just going to be fighting Gandalf. It's a pretty short fight. Um, stuff can go wrong, but hopefully with two hearts, I'll be okay. Yeah, the doing this fight optimally is pretty risky, but like doing it safely uh, is like still possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other than failing PG skip and then dying on PG, I've been pretty happy with this run. But those two things definitely lost a lot of time. Like I had basically one hour flat best possible time going into PG skip, but now it's like one twelve. Yeah, the well, having to like watch the cutscene and fight Puppet Ganon takes a really long time compared to being able to skip the cutscene and do Puppet Ganon skip. Yeah. There actually is a, there's an alternate method of doing Puppet Ganon skip. Um, where if you clip out of bounds at the bottom of the room, you can shoot the morths all the way from the bottom uh, and like burn the warp pot lid all the way from the bottom, but we don't really have a way of getting out of bounds at the bottom of the room with the items that we have in this run, unfortunately. Otherwise, we would probably do that uh, version of Puppet Ganon Skip. Yeah, um, in about a minute, end of the run will be coming up for the next run to start. Which will be TP by Beast. It's just going to be using quick spins and then talk to Zelda to get her to shoot another light arrow a bit earlier. Do it again. That is the first phase. And then now we just try to lure him into doing the right attacks. And then we can do a parry and attack him. Pretty good RNG there. And just pull his order one more time. Alright, and then. Uh, done! Go, beast! GG. Thanks. And GG's. GG. GG, Vinny. All right, and we're off. All right, welcome to Twilight Princess Any Percent. This is the one of the longer games.
It uh, used to be in the middle a few years back, but now it is by far the longest of the 90% of uh, the yep. 3D Zelda games. We're hogging the stage today. So right off the bat, Beast is going to click through a gate and then void out and reset on the same frame. This will make it so he respawns on the title screen. He will then void out on the title screen, which allows him to save the game. And when he reloads that file, he will have inherited the properties of the title screen um, sequence, because that is not a, a movie that plays, it's actually um, the game playing in real time. So the link on the title screen that you'll see during the opening sequence of the game does have um, he, um, the hero's tunic, um, a pawn tamed, and a sword and a shield. So that will speed things So he's doing the safe uh, method there that you usually see for races and marathons, which is much easier than side hopping and pulling up the item wheel to reset. So he's just voiding out here to uh, make it so that the HUD disappears, so now he can save the game. And then just does a save warp, basically. And when he loads this file, then he will be in Ward on Spring. Or, um, Fire on Spring, I mean. So it puts him uh, a little bit ahead. Yeah. <laughs> puts him a little bit ahead at the start. Skips uh, some day one stuff with Oron Village. Yep, and it locks us out of a few things too, which will be important in uh, 10 minutes or so. Yes, so um, the state that the game is now prevents us from getting the Ordon Sword and, uh, and Ordon Shield. Uh, he has already has the Ordon Shield, uh, Ordon Sword, but if he, if he looks at the paw screen, the equipment screen, it's not there, so it's 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 working for combat, but the game doesn't uh, you know, say that it's actually obtained the way it's supposed to be. So he needs to perform a glitch later to, you know, in order to progress with the run. And that is where most people who pick up the game get stuck for a while. And for good reason, it's a very hard trick. We'll touch more on that later. But for now, you just got the lantern from Korra. The lantern is used... Uh, not in too many places of the game, but there's like one hard check in Arbiter's Grounds. It's one room where you absolutely need to use a lantern. Uh, otherwise, it could be skipped in theory. And Unless he's just you're going very to be... scared of dark nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just going to progress with the, the starting like the starting sequence of the game here to save Tallow from some monkeys. Um, so he can get himself out of Ordon as soon as he can. There's a lot of rolling in this bit, so it's a good bit to talk about movement. Um, yep. As Human Link, I'm going to be rolling most of the time, because uh, that's the fastest mode of transportation. And ideally, I'm going to be chaining my rolls frame perfectly most of the time. There are some cases where I don't want to, um, but basically I want to be at top speed and chaining rolls frame perfectly whenever possible. Um, so I'm going to be trying to do that all through Farron despite the lag. And if you really, really want to check whether I'm getting frame-perfect rolls, you can look at the HUD in the top right corner. Uh, if you see the lantern doesn't flash during um, or between rolls, then I have chained them frame-perfectly. If it does, I have not. I believe that was the same with uh, Wind Waker as well. Uh, if it doesn't flash, then you've done a perfect roll. Hmm. I thought I'd heard Wind Waker rolls um, like you'd maintain top speed in a two-frame window, not just a one. Yes, that's correct. So it's a little bit trickier in TP. So, Halo has gotten himself caught by some goblins in his cage with a monkey, followed the monkey at the start of the game. We didn't get to see it because we performed a glitch where just we skipped the cutscene and just started the run, did a save glitch and just skipped ahead, but that's what has happened in the story. Uh, this game you can skip cutscenes, most cutscenes, by just pressing start twice. It's a very nice feature. Um, it says I can't skip S. <laughs> yeah, selected cutscenes you can't skip, but luckily they are usually very short. And most of the time very significant, like a boss dying or something. Yeah, this is pretty different from some other Zeldas in that we get to begin our gameplay right away. We take control of Link 9.2 seconds after loading the file. Yep, if you have a good Wii. Yeah. Yeah, I still haven't done my load tests. <clears throat> I checked your load times a few months back, and you have one of the best uh, ones for at least the first, uh, like the start of the game. Nice. I believe I get control at around 9.6, which is a bit slow. 
Next is goats. I gotta herd these guys. There are 20 of them. I'm gonna try to herd exactly 20 of them. It'll say 20 at the top of the screen if I heard the right number. <laughs> yeah, so goats are a bit finicky. They are very oh, sensitive God. to uh, your yeah your radius, your whoop radius, and like how you approach them. Um, there's not really much RNG to it. They're just very sensitive. Um, although sometimes they can be a bit annoying when it comes to going into the barn. Oh, I got a palindrome. 2772. Nice. Yeah, anything below 30 for this is totally fine. I mean, in, if we're doing attempts getting a PB, you'll be really happy with sub-20, but if you're in like some sort of 20 range, then you'll take that most of the time and be content. Yeah. But going over 30, it, it starts to hurt a little bit. So because of the game state with the save glitch that Beast did at the beginning, he's able to obtain the Iron Boots right away. Because as far as the game's concerned, he has sort of just um, done stuff in Kekariko and tamed the Pona there, so he can go back and get the Iron Boots from Bo, uh, so he can use that to enter Gora Mines. Uh, we're not yeah, going be really to be really convenient going for never coming back to Orden later. Yeah, uh, we're not going to be going into Gora Mines at all, but we do need the Iron Boots. So it's very convenient that we can just get the Iron Boots while we while we're here in Ordon. And this is usually a cutscene that plays outside of the house and then transitioning into the house, um, but. Beast, Beast needs to uh, initiate the, the cutscene himself by talking to Bob multiple times to get each text box up. And here he wants to uh, mash around 11 to 12 hertz uh, times per second for an optimal one cycle if Bo cooperates. So it's rock, paper, scissor with a lot of mashing. Not quite. Well, that was the good RNG, but... Um, yeah. Just slightly not enough mashing. But Bo stood still, which was good, so he was able to just slap him off or bonk into his belly so he falls off. Boing. Let's see for the second phase or second cycle. Not quite. Oh boy. <laughs> I am not doing very well at rock, paper, scissors. Okay, not too bad. That's not too bad, yeah. So because this happens really early on in the run, um, and you could get some really bad uh, wrestling, yeah, this is where you can see a lot of people re reset, uh, depending on how, how bad it gets. It's very convenient that we get this minigame at this point and not in like a 100% run where you can't do the glitch at the beginning because you lock yourself out of getting some items like the fishing rod you would come here like a bit over an hour in and having a terrible bow at that point would you know obviously be much worse than having being able to do it right away so or more on mines saved. rta where you do it two-thirds of the way through the run exactly so beast is saving the game here because he's going to use the properties of um at leaving bow's house at this state in the game for a glitch later uh in, when he gets to forest temple and we'll talk more about that when when the time comes There'll be so much to talk about. <laughs> uh, so we got a few more scripted story events going on before we um, before the game is a little more open to us. I've got to become a wolf. Gotta go wolf. And to become a wolf, all you have to do is crawl through a hole. This works at home. You can try it. <clears throat> Just remember to skip the cutscene after. Yeah, so there's a lot of things that happen here uh, with cutscenes, but because you can skip all of them, you just kind of suddenly turn into a wolf and you're in um, Hyrule Castle area in a, in a cell. Fun fact, if you stand completely still there, uh, the game will not progress. you got to move a little bit yeah. before this uh, try timer counts down. Oh, no. Beast failing a break. trick that saves two frames, I believe. Something like that. Uh, well, it saves more if you do that. Hmm. Hmm. So now we've met Midna. Midna will be very useful for many reasons. Uh, this part of the game teaches you how to use Midna's abilities. So first off is senses. So right now his X button is dimmed. It doesn't say sense or senses. Um, but in the next area, he will see a cutscene of of a guard, and Midna tells him that you can press X to um, turn on your senses. <laughs> so that's when you get that ability. Wee! Nice hop. Thanks. Now it says sense. 
And the next thing is uh, <laughs> Midna jumping, which we'll see in a bit. I promise I've played this game before. Um, and, uh, wolf movement is a little bit simpler than human movement in that I'm basically just going to be dashing everywhere. Um, and just I say to do that, it doesn't really need to be frame perfect to maintain speed. But there is something that is a little bit more nuanced called dash canceling that I'll be doing. Um, because if Link begins a dash and the dash is interrupted within 10 frames, then it'll be able to dash again immediately. Whereas if you just dash and then stop, um, like after 10 frames, then you won't be able to dash again until a timer is waited out. Um, so I'm going to be canceling my dashes on purpose in some places so that I can dash again more quickly, or sooner afterwards, rather. Just to maintain top speed as long as I can. Right and here, Beast is going to go for it. Yeah, so you can skip that text if you um, have a nice angle jumping off of the ledge there. Ooh, time to talk about one-framers. Yeah, uh, this game normally, has a lot of first framers. <laughs> yeah. Um, normally, anytime you're doing a Midna jump, there's a little animation of Midna flying away before you can actually begin the jump. But there's one frame between closing your text box and that animation beginning where you can input the jump anyway. And it just saves a little bit of time. That skips that animation. Or, well, you're jumping during the animation. Um, and there are so many one framers between animations and text boxes and stuff in this game. Um, Coming up right here. The, yeah, there was another one. I skipped that cutscene and then pressed A to do a jump attack on the very next frame to skip a text box. Um, and some of them just save like a second or two, like the ones that we're talking about right now. But later on, there will be one that um, can save me over a minute. And hopefully I'll get it. The infamous Gorge Void trick. Nice, another one. Yeah, so these seconds can actually add up quite a lot if you are uh, comparing against your PB. Let's say you got them all in your PB and suddenly you miss all of them in your next run. You start to see the time loss there. Alright, so here is Zelda. Hi, Zelda. Hi. I've heard about your legend. Eh, yeah, bye, Zelda. Hi, Zelda. So this is sword and shield skip coming, short sword and shield skip coming up, and this is where a lot of people get stuck learning the game. Um, it is very difficult, um, but there are very good resources on ZSR for learning the trick, and anybody is encouraged to post videos of their attempts in the TP Discord. There's a lot of people that who immediately reply. Uh, it's actually quite funny how a lot of people like they'll sort of fight each other to help you as soon, uh, be the first one to help you. So that's always great I to see. Need that. So we're yeah, luring this uh, Bulblin over to the Twilight Barrier, um, going into Faron, and he's going to aid us to uh, to gain entry. Because there is a trigger where Midna says you need to go back and get the Sword and Shield, but because we cannot get it due to how the game state is, we need to do a long jump attack with an enemy, known as an enemy long jump attack, or ELJA. And it is pretty precise, but hopefully it goes well. You can attack him, he falls over, and then you jump attack towards him again, and if he is on higher ground, uh, if you attack enemies on higher ground, then you can get like a long, uh, long jump. Nicely done. So he he hit the second trigger, which is you have like welcome into Faron. Uh, there's there's like one the first. Trigger there is go back, get the sword and shield, and the second one, which is, which is an air trigger slightly further ahead, is the one that lets you into the, the twilight. So he avoided the first trigger and just hit the second one, and said yes, and now he's in. Failing that loses about a minute, so it's really nice to get that first try. Obviously for, like, for any reason, but especially in a marathon setting. You sure are thick. Yeah, um, that one's a bit daunting right at the beginning of the run because, like, if you fail it, you just void and try again there's no other way past it you can't do an easier strat um at this point so i played that pretty safely this is where we learn about uh midna charge so by holding b midna will 
um, raise your hand up and you can target onto enemies. So we're gonna run over to Midna and now we have learned that technique, which we need for later. Well, we can't get past this point without using it. Yeah. And then I'm gonna be traveling through Farron. Uh, normally what the game expects you to do at this point is to beat the Farron Twilight, but I'm actually gonna skip it entirely. I'm not gonna get the vessel. I'm just gonna run right by. Hi, Farron. Hi, Farron. Um, Cause it is not needed. I'm going to, th th there's one little trigger that prevents you from leaving Farron without clearing the Farron Twilight, but I'm just gonna do a cool glitch to get over it instead. That's the way we like it. Yep. But to do that cool glitch, I'm going to need a couple of things. Um, I'm going to need the boomerang to do it, and then I can't use the boomerang as wolf, unfortunately. It would be very funny if I could. Um, so I'm going to need to get the master sword to turn back into a human. And of course, normally beating or uh, getting the master sword requires beating the first three dungeons uh, and the first three twilights. And um, doing Minda's Desperate Hour, then going over to the Sacred Grove and beating Skull Kid. But fortunately, we got a giant sequence break. Yes, and, we do. Uh, the Sacred Grove that you're only supposed to be able to access with a Golden Cucko, or, well, or mid to jumps, um, is accessible anytime as long as we can get over there. So I'm just going to do an out of bounds jump in the next area. Can I make this? Yeah. Um, and hopefully get up onto a high ledge where I can jump to the Sacred Grove. Yeah, so this sequence break does not work on the HD version. They patched it by placing a bunch of invisible walls around the area. You can get past that by doing something called a pickup slide for several hours with a Deku Seed. Or, yeah, uh, like slingshot ammo. But it takes, you know, it wouldn't be beneficial in a, in a speedrun. Nice. Can it's I very, do an attack? It's very important that he doesn't defeat all Shadow Beasts here, otherwise he won't be able to do the trick. Because he needs one to stay alive. Can, please. Oh, so close both times. Uh, Luckily this trick is a lot faster to retry than Sword and Shield Skip. And the Shadow Beast can give you fast or slow swings. It is possible, hey, technically, to do it uh, with, a, with a fast swing, but you don't go for it usually, so... Very nice. I'm just gonna... Yeah, yeah grab some hearts. So that is early Sacred Grove, and since you're supposed to be Wolf when you get here the first time anyway, you can just do the whole sequence here as if you had cleared the first uh, few dungeons. Early Master Sword is like a staple in a lot of 3D Zelda games, like a, like a big trick that um, speeds up all the games that it's in, and it's really fortunate that we have it in CP as well. Yeah, it's super useful in TP. Um, as I alluded to earlier, it'll let us transform between wolf and human at will, and uh, going along with that will let us warp at will, even outside of Twilights, which is very, very convenient. Um, it'll also... What will it do? Uh, the Master Sword is good for combat because it does double the damage of the Orden Sword, and it'll allow us to get into Lake Bed early, which we'll explain a bit more later. Yeah. Well, specifically getting into Lake Bed without the Zora armor. Such a teaser. <laughs> I haven't gotten to Freezer Teaser yet. Oh, yeah, Freezer Teaser. I guess you'll be going for that. Yeah. Yeah. Show off the newest TP trick. Yeah, so Twilight Princess hasn't really received any big time saves as the other games have, uh, which I alluded to at the start. Uh, over the last like five years, we've seen um, just small time saves add up over time. The biggest one being Stalar Skip, though, uh, which was deemed a task only trick until... Uh, has it been a couple years now, I think? Almost two years? Um, no, I think it's been like a year. Year, okay. And that saves a lot of time. That saves about 1 minute and 45 seconds-ish, I think. Yeah, it's a, a minute 40. Minute 40. 
Uh, but most of the other time saves that I've just accumulated over time have been like five seconds, uh, one second, two seconds. Uh, the Snow Peak reroute that happened a couple of years back was, or I guess almost three years back now, two and a half, was I believe 15 seconds. So that was like a really big deal when the when that dropped. Yeah. But you look at any of the other games and it's like, oh, a 30 minute time sale or a 10 minute time sale. Yeah, we do get new stuff. It's just uh, not, you know, cutting the length of the run in half or anything. But that's okay. I like playing Twilight Princess. I'm going to play it for like three hours today. <laughs> so for this fight with Skull Kid, uh, Beast wants to defeat one of the puppets and then hopefully just one because if you hit multiple you get lag frames like the game lags each time you kill an enemy for an effect so you hopefully just want to do one just like that and then there's like a timer counting down before skull kid blows his horn again and when he does he'll be vulnerable so he waits until that before he attacks him and just repeat that three times and that's the the last fight here and uh, the master sword puzzle coming up has a few solutions um this was one thing I personally had written down on a piece of paper when I was a kid and had it inside my game case. And Beast might be going for it. There's like a two-frame window where you can turn senses on as you're hopping between the platforms here, just for show. Yeah, no purpose at all. Just keeping us entertained while we do this puzzle we've done a million times. There are 12 hops. So I can get a total of 12 sense presses. I've missed one so far. Another popular choice is to uh, just listen for the game audio and just do the control sticks, um, the control stick input uh, as you, you know, do this puzzle while you open Twitter. <laughs> How much to make the statues bonk into each other? Oh, it's too late. I can't. Sash. It would make a nice doing, though. All right. We have the Master Sword. Uh, I meant to get it a little bit earlier than this, but this is like early-ish Master Sword. <laughs> um, yeah, so we talked before about uh, how important the Master Sword is. We haven't really talked about the outline of the route yet, so I kind of wanted to get to that. Um, we've just done a bunch of uh, kind of early game stuff and then gotten the Master Sword, which is supposed to be about halfway through the game. Well, less than that, but... Um, so for any percent, we're going to have to beat Ganon, which is, you know, the whole point. It's the final boss. And to do that, we're going to have to beat Hyrule Castle, which is the final dungeon. To get there, we're going to have to beat Palace of Twilight. And to get there, we're going to have to beat Arbiter's Grounds and City in the Sky. So we've got a pile of dungeons to beat. Um... And then to get to Arbiter's Grounds, we need to beat Lakebed, one more dungeon for us. Um, and then to beat Lakebed, we're going to have to do a f uh, several other things, which I'll enumerate in just a minute. So there's a long chain of dependencies here, and <clears throat> that dungeon rush is going to be pretty close to the... Or I guess it's going to take up the second half of the run. Um, to get to Lakebed, I'm going to have to clear Lanayru Twilight, and, and, well, and then to beat it, I'm going to need to get bombs. Um which also requires beating Lanayru Twilight for the way we do it. So, I'm, or, and to beat Lanayru Twilight, I need to beat Elden Twilight. So my next goal is to get to Elden Twilight so I can beat Lanayru Twilight, so I can get bombs, so I can beat Lakebed, so I can beat Arbiter's Ground, so I can beat City in the Sky, so I can beat Palace of Twilight, so I can beat Hyrule Castle, so I can beat Ganon. And to get to Elden Twilight, um, I'm going to need to get the Boomerang. So I'm going to enter Forest Temple. And that is the next step. It's quite the shopping list. Yes. Um, but I'm not going to beat Forest Temple. Because the dungeons that I mentioned are the only ones uh, that we're going to need to beat to progress the game. So I'm going to enter Forest Temple, but not finish it. I'm just going to leave after getting the dungeon item. And I'm going to do the same for um, Snow Peak Ruins later. And uh, there are two dungeons, Goron Mines and Temple of Time, that we're not even going to see in this run. Yeah, Temple of Time Skip is actually the biggest sequence break in CP, but it when when the uh, skip does happen, it seems pretty trivial, and it is, but it, it does save a bunch of time. You skip a whole quest and everything, the, the Skybook quest. And yeah, no, unfortunately... Was that? Yeah, 
Uh, I was gonna say most uh, sequence breaks for TP, like the big ones, were found pretty early on. Like early Master Sword was, I believe, February of 2007. So like, if just a few months after the game came out. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm doing a lot of backtracking here uh, because even though I am able to warp now, I don't have the North Farron warp portal, which is near Forest Temple, um, and I couldn't get that because I was using one of the Shadow Beasts. Excuse me, to get out of bounds to get the Master Sword early in the first place, and if I were to kill all the Shadow Beasts while doing that, then I would be warped back down to the ground. So I had to warp back to South Farron, and now I'm just making my way back to North Farron. Uh, it's a little bit faster to transform and use the Lantern to get through this mist rather than taking the Midna Jumps again. Very nice sequence there. Uh, you can do as minimum as three Lantern Swings to get past, but you're also like, you're, like, you're very close to voiding out each time. You're kind of being at the edge of uh, of the range of the lantern. And it's totally fine for Beast to just have the lantern out because we won't really be using it that much and it depletes very slowly. Yeah, and the couple of places where we need it, there's lantern oil nearby anyway, but yeah, it's not going to be a problem. So Beast saved after leaving Bo's house um, and he's going to use that save file in this trick coming up. Uh, he's going to perform back in time again, which was what we saw at the beginning of the run. So he will respawn on the title screen. But then as he jumps to Void out, he's going to select the file. He's going to start the game, which will bring up the file select screen. He's then going to select the file that he saved after leaving Bo's house. And that is going to do some funky stuff I'll get to in a second. We'll just see how it goes. It's going to... Uh, hello? Oh, D-pad. We love I... the D-pad. That was the start button. Oh, right, yeah, you do the start method. Interesting. All right, so he needs to save the game, which is very important. Otherwise, he, you know, he needs to go back to Forest Temple after performing this glitch. So if all goes well, he should respawn on the title screen here. Yep. So listen for the audio now. He's going to jump off. Link is screaming. He's now selecting the file from Bo's house. He's now going to be warped into the King Bulblin fight. Skip this cutscene while resetting. So right what at the, the heck did that do? Yeah, to so... Be Forest Temple, what's the, what's the point of going in the King Bulblin fight? Do you want to cover that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so when you start a boss sequence in TP, there's a flag set that says, hey, you're in a boss sequence. And it means that if you somehow void out or like need to respawn during that boss sequence, it won't play the intro cutscene another time. Uh, but when you set this flag, it carries over, like, if you set the flag and reset, really? Okay. <laughs> um, it can carry over across files. It doesn't get unset. Oh, God. Um, so I can set that flag in the King Bulblin fight, which I got to via back in time, and then apply it to Forest Temple. And in Forest Temple, the major impact of it is going to be that it gives me monkeys. Um, the main shtick of Forest Temple being that you save the eight monkeys around the dungeon. Is Nancy being really nice? Uh, yeah, actually. Okay. Oh, wow. That was really fortunate. Yeah. So I, I messed up throwing the first Baba Seed, or Baba Nut, rather. But Nancy decided to take pity on me today. Um, yeah, so I set that flag, and now I have a bunch of monkeys. And we will see all of them in just a few seconds. Well, not all of them, actually, just four of them. Oh, yeah, so the look at all these monkeys. Is, uh, it's shared with other events of the game, so for some reason it's shared with the monkey having monkeys in Forest Temple. So, yeah. Yeah, as long as you have a value of, I believe, four. It starts at 49, I believe, and then as you're resetting in the, in the King Boblin fight, it ticks down, but you're interrupting the reset sequence, so your value gets stored at, like, around 20-ish, which is plenty. Yeah, plenty of monkeys. So now we have the miniboss Ook, which will give us the boomerang. He will hop around a random amount of times, the minimum being two and the maximum being infinite in theory, but the max we have seen is... Is, is it 25? It is something like that. Oh, uh, I thought I was on my way to infinite. It's closed. <laughs> So we can one cycle him with the Master Sword because it deals so much more damage than the Ordon Sword, which is very, very nice. Yeah. Yeah, Nuke will give us the boomerang. Uh, so we skipped 
doing pretty much any of Forest Temple. This is, I've come to realize recently watching some Skyward Sword runs that this is a very Skyward Sword style dungeon. That we enter, do some back in time shenanigans, and then we skip most of the dungeon. And uh, back in time in TP is not nearly as powerful as it is in Skyward Sword, so we're not really going to see, or we're not going to see any more of it actually um, in this run. Sometimes you would, yeah, yeah, and in some other categories you would see a little bit more of it. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. The rest of the dungeons will be done, well, they won't be done as intended, but they'll be done uh, without hacking. Yeah, so we'll see st still like some remnants of the glitch in uh, Lakebed, but we won't be seeing like respawning on the title screen. Yeah. So save warping and leaving for a sample, and this uh, now we get to the point <clears throat> where that Beast talked about earlier about leaving the uh, Pharaon area. So normally you would have to beat for a sample and clear the Twilight to be able to leave. Otherwise, Midnight will say, "Hey, you can't leave yet." But we're going to use the boomerang to perform an LGA long jump attack, like just with like we did with the uh, Hugo, the Bulblin. Um, the, yeah, only uh, I don't need to push the boomerang around. It's going to be much easier to manipulate. Yeah. So Link will get a long jump attack if the thing he's jumping towards is on higher ground <clears throat> or over void, and because the ground is sloped, it will mean will be higher ground than Link, so he will get that long jump. Uh, it's pretty precise. Uh, needs to be like right at the edge, like right before the midnight trigger, uh, like right in front of the midnight trigger. Throw the boomerang, uh, and then jump towards it, and that's it. And he skips the whole. It skips being. He skips needing to clear the twilight and beating for his temple. So it's a pretty nice sequence break. I don't know if this works. We'll see. Come on! That was so close. Very close. <sighs> this should work. That looks good. And just like that, we're in Hyrule Field. Yep, that <clears throat> skipped Beating Forest Temple and Clearing Farron Twilight. Now there are two paths we need to go uh, to towards the Elden Province and also Lanaria Province. Um, routes over the, <clears throat> over the last, like, Eight years have changed a bit. Like we used to do, uh, go to Lanaria Province first in 2014, I would say. But uh, yeah, uh, but first off, we have a mailman skip. So there's a mailman trigger here, which we can skip by doing the same technique that we just used. So the boomerang will be traveling out of bounds inside of the wall here, and if we jump, then then the boomerang will be over void. So we get that long jump again, and just like that, we skip the mailman trigger, which was like in between there. And heading over into Elden Province, which is a big reset point, as you have that. Uh, with this route, you have the frame perfect glitch uh, or trick, uh, Gorge Void. So after defeating the Shadow Beasts in uh, in the Twilight here, there is one frame where you can do a jump attack, and you will jump into the void that's right in front of you because the bridge is missing. And if that happens, you'll respawn uh, at the start, like you see right now where Link is spawning. Uh, but if you miss Gorge Void, uh, you will Midnight will force warp you away, and you have to select a warp point, uh, which will be South Pharaon. Yeah, and so, the force warp is important. We will need to hit it eventually because that'll give us map warping, <clears throat> which is important for warping the Sky Cannon to get the city in the sky later. But it'll be just much more convenient for routing. Let's do this. Um, if I don't hit it right now, I want to get across the gorge first and basically open up a portal so I can warp back easily. I was late, so I am going to be forced to warp away. Shut up. So now we have map warping. So we did need to do this anyway, like Beast just said. So now we can, like we have the properties uh, needed for warping the cannon. Um, if we had gotten Gorge Void, we could have just ran back here after getting the portal to Kekriko. So Gorge Void just skips backtracking. Uh, it's roughly a minute lost, like give or take. It depends on like who you ask, essentially, but around a minute is lost. So we'll need to escape the forest again.
There is all, all the routes you can use. You can do something called the back in time equipped route, which gets to Kakariko using the back in time equipped glitch instead of um, uh, instead of the Gorge Void method that we just saw. And we often tell people that if your consistency with Gorge Void is good, then feel free to use this route. But if you just really uh, aren't hitting it, then uh, you might want to do um, uh, back in time equipped instead. As it's much more like consistent. The only thing being that you do have to fight King Boblin, and getting a bad RNG in that fight can still lose your lose your time. Um, but yeah, it's uh, and that route point. is theoretically slower as well. Yeah, so it's actually quite interesting cool. how the like three four routes for TP are very close to each other. They yeah. have differences are at this point in the game. And more later, but um, it's very interesting that the world record route, world record route, isn't like substantially faster than the alternatives. There's actually quite a lot to pick and choose from. So if you go to zealouspeedruns.com/tp, you can look on the left side. You can see routes, and you'll see a bunch. And at the top, there will be some information about why X is faster or slower than Y. So Beast opting to go back to Elden Province. Um, it's like pick and choose pretty much if you want to do this trick now or later. So he's now going to dig up a rupee here and do something called rupee roll. I'll be quiet as he as he does it, it's a bit precise. So bring this rupee onto the fence. After closing that text box, you have a six frame window to roll. So you can get past the fence. Very nice. Yeah, so some nice side hops there to get around the fence and then a quite a big uh, LGA with a boomerang to cross that huge gap to make your way into Kakariko. We'll get to do something that looks really stupid now. Um, after this gate, I'm going to run right around the perimeter of the area instead of just going to the, straight to the load zone. Because there is another load zone, an invisible one right there. I mean, most of them are invisible, but... <clears throat> Uh, that you wouldn't expect. And that's where you're normally supposed to hit the King Boblin one fight trigger. Uh, when you're... Uh, do you normally hit that when you're leaving Kakariko or entering? I can't remember. Uh, leaving. Oh, wait, no, ent entering. Ent entering from bow, right? Yes, after yeah. doing the Iron Boots. Yep. Um, and I don't want to fight King Boblin. There's really no reason for me to, so I just ran around the trigger. Yeah, and that trigger exists because of... Um back in time that we did at the beginning, because the game states things that we have tamed the Pona after clearing the Twilight here and got into Bo's house, uh, received the Iron Boots, and we're on, we're on our way back here. So that's why the trigger is there. So now I'm actually getting started on the next thing on our grocery list, beating Elden Twilight. Um, this will start off with a glitch. That is a bit of a sequence break, kind of, within Elden Twilight. Um, I'm going to transform into human and just go down underneath this, what looks like collision here. Just going to clip right in. Uh, or I'm going to kill a key, so then clip right in. Um, which is a little bit faster than entering the other side as wolf. Yeah, the intended method of going into the sanctuary and uh, having a little cutscene that you can skip, luckily, but it's a little bit lengthier. So the reason why, we didn't talk about this earlier, but the reason why Beast was able to skip Pharaon Twilight is because um, we will spawn a Golden Wolf later and you uh, need to uh, get one hidden skill, the first one, which is Ending Blow to defeat Ganondorf. If you make it to the end and you don't have the hidden skill Ending Blow, you can't beat the game. And after clearing Pharaon Twilight, there will be a Golden Wolf spawned outside of Forest Temple. This is the first one, that's like the intended one to get. So if you skip Pharaon Twilight, then there won't be a Golden Wolf there. Uh, but we can spawn it ourselves by howling at a howling stone later. So that allows us to skip the, the twilight, so we can just um, do that instead. But this one we do need to complete. This one I'm linear, like we mentioned earlier. This one is often regarded as the most fun twilight. <clears throat> it is a bit uh, shorter, linear being uh, roughly twice the length. 
think fair and twilight is the most interesting route wise just because all the different routes or all the different categories that do complete fair and twilight for various reasons um do it slightly differently from each other skipping some bugs skipping some tears leaving them for later doing ems twice yeah yeah for the category goron binds rta you want to do ems twice and uh if you just get bad swings from uh, the shadow piece then that can be a bit of a pain if you collect this rupee oh yeah you already did the, um right so the depending on like the routing you do you could have a rupee text to, to get there uh since beast already had a yellow rupee collected when he did the rupee roll trick earlier uh there was no rupee text to get you only get it the first time upon loading your save file but if you were to save the game reset and then reload then you would the rupee text would reappear this is not the case for twelve it's hd so it's only a one-time thing And we're collecting some some additional money like that, and also in this house, he'll break some boxes, and if he's lucky, he'll get a... I believe he can spawn a yellow one. He can get blue and yellow. He only got greens. Because uh, we need to repair the sky cannon for later, and there are very convenient rupees to get in the route uh, anyway, but it's nice to get the little... We need some, like, some change, basically, on the way. Also an uh, enemy LJ here, uh, might not seem like it, but since it, it is higher ground, we will get a long jump right here. And now coming up is the probably most interesting part of this Twilight visually. Um, you, you actually, you take this one, I have to do it. Yeah, yeah, so this is a pretty hard trick. This is called uh, Bomb House Skip. We, uh, Beast is probably going to do it Wolf Bomb House Skip. Yep. So with a very precise setup here, you can get onto the railing and then align yourself correctly, jump across here, and then kill this bug before it enters the house. And the game is like, okay, if the bug is dead, then this cutscene where the house explodes uh, must have played, so I'll render the house destroyed. So that saves a lot of time, actually. There's a big cut, like a long cutscene in that place where you would normally go into the house um, and then light the, uh, light the bug on fire, or like the furnace on fire, the bug would go out of the furnace, the whole bomb house would get caught on fire lots of explosives big cutscene um but yeah since the bug gets killed before um it manages to enter the house then you can just instantly collect the tier and the, the transition for the house happens right away so beast had not collected a blue rupee before so he collected it mid-air there to avoid the text trigger very nice But yeah, uh, Bomb House Keep, you can use uh, the Gale Boomerang as well, so you can turn human, but you need to go back into Wolf, so it is faster to stay Wolf, so that's why it's called Wolf Bomb House Keep. Uh, something like five, six seconds faster, roughly. Yeah, uh, something like that. Much more difficult. Certain categories um, require you to do the Wolf method. So, for instance, Goromine's RTA, again, doesn't have Boomerang optimally, so you, you can't use the Boomerang to... Um, you wouldn't have the boomerang to use, so you need to uh, do that as Wolf. Quick climb here again. He also did a quick climb earlier uh, during the Master Sword sequence. So if you just kind of nudge yourself into some corners when you're climbing, you can get a quick quick climb by, on certain le uh, ledges. Yeah, so here's a Howling Stone. Um, this is uh, not the one we're going to get. <laughs> nice. Uh, Howling what? here would spawn a wolf in, I believe it's the Ordon... Uh, Hard on spring? Yeah. Yeah. So the first uh, golden wolf that you get will always give you the first skill, depending on... Like, it doesn't matter which uh, sort of location you find the wolf in, the first will always be... Like, the, the skills will go in order, but uh, the difference is, like, which one you spawn. So spawning that one would have spawned the wolf at Ordon spring. And the one later we're going to use is one... In Upper Zora's River, which will spawn a wolf outside of Castletown. Which is much more convenient uh, for us to get later. Yeah, other than that, we would have no reason to go back to Orden later, so better avoid it. And the final bug. He has invincibility right away, so you do want to wait a little bit before I attack him. Where am I going? And the car grog oh, no. can be a bit of an annoyance here, but here we go. 
sub seven Elden Fire. Very good. Not too shabby. So there's our Elden requirement. Um, as I said before, the reason that we were going to Elden in the first place. Wait, where am I going? Oh yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Was so that we could open up and begin the Lanayru Twilight. And I need to go to Lanayru to do that. So I'm going to go to Lanayru now. And because I missed, well. Actually, regardless, I'm going to have to warp back to South Farron and escape the forest one last time. Um, just get to show off that cool Farron escape. Yeah. Uh, so normally you're supposed to enter Lanayru Twilight or the Lanayru province from the north. Um, but we can actually enter it from the south using a trick known as um, Gate Clip. And back in the day you used to use Epona to clip to the gate. But then we realized that you can actually do it as wolf, and it's way easier and way faster. And you need early Master Sword for early Lanayru province, because at the north you would turn into a wolf, like the game would, would do that for you. But if you enter it, um, like, if you enter Lanayru early without having early Master Sword, um, it can mess up your progress, so you definitely want early Master Sword. I didn't know that. Yeah, so if you were to clip with Epona, then you would be human, and then there would be no like event that turns you into wolf, so you wouldn't really be able to, to do much. Oh, Since yeah. Since we have the Master Sword, we can transform at will. But we're already wolf here to do the, the fast method of doing this. Uh, Nobody does the Pona method anymore, and that's for good reason. <laughs> so bonk the gate to make it swing, and then side up into it with a bit of an angle, and you just clip through. Now Beast is going to get into Lake Bed Temple early. Uh, this is only... well, it is possible in multiple ways, but it's conveniently possible here because the water level is much lower in Lake Kalia than it is later in the game. So he was able to sink down using the iron boots that he got um, to clip behind a pillar uh, by... Well, I'll get to that bit in a bit. But clip behind a pillar and then swim into the loading zone and he'll just make it in time. There's a lot of things in TP that just barely works and this is one of them. And there's a method where we call Midna and we wait for a float up. Uh, if we, uh, unless we call her at the just the right time, we can get an insta clip. So if you look at midnight, she just pops up there. So putting on the iron boots there forces you to, like it pops you through the wall as you were close to the pillar there, kind of pushes you through, and you can just barely make it into the loading zone there. And the loading zone actually extends a little bit outside of the physical uh, location of the what looks to be the loading zone. <coughs> So you tap swim by just holding control stick, control stick towards the where you want to go, and then just uh, put iron boots on and off to like have a, a level swimming forward. Because putting iron boots on, you sink, take them off, you float up. So you just kind of want to tap, putting them on and off. And because we had have early master sword, if we save, uh, we'll respawn at the end of this sequence. And that is because you can revisit lake bed uh, at later point and. Uh, having Master Sword means that, oh, you definitely beat in this dungeon already, so it just skip past the whole tunnel sequence there. If that wasn't the case, then this wouldn't be possible, because that water tunnel at the start is actually quite long, and we don't have the Zora armor, so we would drown. So here he is uh, skipping, uh, shooting down stalactites. Normally you would use the bow, uh, bomb arrows, but with just some nice LGAs with the boomerang we can... Uh, just b barely make it up, uh, little by little. The big main Our goal in coming to Lake Bed early is to, one, get the claw shot, which will be useful in some other places, and two, to prepare to come back and kill Morphia later, as I said, that um, like beating Lake Bed is going to be required for beating the rest of the game. <clears throat> but we can't beat Morphia while we're here right now, because I have no method of breathing underwater. And if I were to go into the Morpheal fight, I would just drown. So I'm going to need to get some means of breathing underwater what? before I beat the dungeon. Um, however, as I said, 
Uh, we can't easily get back into the dungeon when the water is high, which, you know, I'll be raising the water uh, when I start Linearu Twilight. So I'm getting Uku, Uku, which I can totally pronounce, so that I can come back later easily, just warp. Yeah, so this is the equivalent to, um, oh gosh, uh, Ferrari's Wind, I believe, from Ocarina of Time. That allows yeah. you to uh, trans like go back and forth between dungeons without having to go through the whole dungeon again. You can just set your war point. And Sky also mentioned earlier that we were going to see some more effects of the boss flag that we set in Forest Temple a little bit later. This is where we see them. Uh, for the Deku Toad fight, what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to enter from the bottom by blowing up a rock and then swimming in. And once you enter, a little cutscene plays, and then you can look up at the ceiling. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. To start the fight. But as I mentioned before, having that boss flag set means that intro cutscenes for boss sequences are cleared. So I didn't need to watch that cutscene. I could just look up at the ceiling from anywhere in the room to start the fight. And that meant I could enter from the backside, which... Uh, save me from having to get through the bottom, which I can't do right now. So Beast is aiming for a one cycle here by timing his slashes. Very nice. So if you had the bomb arrow, like if you had uh, bow and uh, bow and bombs, you could just shoot the tongue, uh, slash the tongue a bit, and then shoot it again. There are very various ways you can do this. If you had the ball and chain earlier, this fight would be. Even easier, you can just swing the ball and chain a few times to instantly kill it. But if you do, like, with the things that we have in the game at this point, slashing the tongue twice, uh, ten times, <laughs> with uh, like doing two hits at a time being the best, allows you to one cycle, and uh, it's fairly tight. But with some practice, it's uh, it's not too bad. So that's the claw shot. We need to save warp because we can't use the uku in a mini boss room or a boss room. So now at the beginning of the dungeon, now we can use uku to leave the dungeon. And that will just conveniently place us place us outside of Lake Bed, uh, well, outside of the the spring in Lake Hylia. So we can continue on with uh, Lanier Twilight. Quite a disturbing creature, uh, the Uku, a man chicken for Frankerface enthusiasts. Here you see, having the Master Sword early is very convenient. You can just transform into Wolf and just continue on with the Twilight. Uh, approaching it from the opposite side, but uh, no issue, saving us plenty of time. As the north part of Hyrule Field is just a bunch of uh, traveling without anything really happening. This character, so, but... <laughs> this character is useful later when we, uh, when we get to sit in the sky. So Beast is dashing towards the Zoras here so that he can manipulate the, the fight a little bit so that uh, Kargorok starts to fly sooner. Oh boy. And the flying pattern you get is randomized. He will attempt to drown the Kargorok Rider. The Kargorok reaches for Link. Um, Link dodges. I... Ooh, close. No! Close, but I no it far enough in. That's an unusual one. If enemies touch water, like a lot of enemies touching water, uh, excluding some enemies, of course, like Morphil, they instantly die. So the goal here is to have the Kargorok dip underwater and the rider being on its back, there we touches go. the water and then dies. If you get grabbed by the Kargorok while the Kargorok rider is dead, the game will crash. And the way to save that is to instantly reset your console, because you can reset before the crash happens. Uh, luckily, you had just previously saved warp. Uh, after Lake Bed. But it's still a big time loss. About a minute or yeah, so. Yeah, about a minute and a half. Beast will now attempt to clip out of bounds here by having a particular flying sequence. Very nice. So that just skips a little bit of um, you know moving left and right in this sequence. You can just aim straight for the loading zone at the end. And funnily enough, the the Kargrag kind of wants to go back in bounds. He will like go towards the right a little bit, like even if he's not holding any inputs on the control stick. Uh, the car will kind of want to... It wants to go back in bounds. So you got to fight it a little bit, but it's not too bad. So another example of TP having a bunch of, like, um, 
high risk, low reward time saves, like that one saving about 6 seconds, uh, failing it costing something like maybe 25 to 30 seconds. And the drowning the car grog rider, uh, the failing it, meaning the game will crash, costing you, depending on how, like if you don't reset in time and you need to reboot your Wii, yeah, from, from runner to runner it can take a long time to reboot the game depending on how you have the your Wii set up, so it can be quite a big time loss. Very nice tech skip there, the same thing that we saw at the rooftops. So Midna had a text box after that those two cutscenes, but with that one, the frame perfect jump attack, you can skip it. Yeah, so yeah, drowning the Karg Rock Rider that they did earlier saves uh, just a few seconds, but failing it loses a lot. So TP does have that. Uh, Quite a lot of those the time saves, unfortunately. But it looks really cool. A uh, lot, lot of the time saves are really cool visually, so... And it's cool to save time. Yeah. Using some Minna jumps to traverse up the waterfall here, and we will get the Zora's Domain Warp Portal, which will be used very shortly. The order of targeting the Shadow Beast there matters, so uh, if he were to target those last two in the opposite order, he would have bonked the, the barrier. And so now that I've opened up Lanayru, I've opened up this warp portal, I can warp back to Death Mountain and warp the meteor, or hot rock, or whatever you want to call it, um, to melt the ice and thus raise the water and begin the twilight. So let's see if I can go get them into call. Ah, too late. I, I try to get it so the meteor is right on the screen and you can see it. There's also a funny clip of Adam there where he, he dies from a meteor and then it breaks the rocks next to him and he gets a heart from the rocks so he instantly revives himself. Oh yeah! Like he gets the heart midair. Yeah, so a bit reminiscent of uh, Zombie Hovering in Wind Waker, how you can like sort of save yourself with uh, landing on a heart. Best part being him having like no reaction to it, uh, the whole thing. Frame, per frame perfect side up here to save a midnight text. Didn't get it. But the cool thing about not getting it, if you will, is that you can just hold the control stick straight down for this jump here. This is a bit nice. Thanks for making me feel better. And then Beast not doing waterfall side up here. <laughs> oh, not yet. It's, it's quite funny when you go past areas twice, you'll see like every now and then some runners will just forget where they are in the run and they'll just do the sequence ahead of time. So same yeah, with escaping um, Faron, um, yeah. es escaping Faron without having the boomerang. Be impressive if someone managed to pull it off. For sure. So here is the last twilight section. Um, Lanayru twilight being something like 11 minutes. It's, it covers a much uh, bigger area than the last two Twilights, especially Elden, which is one thing that makes it a bit longer. But after this Twilight has been cleared, we have uh, a lot of the game opened up. And then in the task, you can see... Uh, pushing the bug like super far. It's very hard to do in uh, RTA, but Taz can push it like all the way up to the start of the bridge there. It's quite funny. It's very entertaining. Sniff my queen. Yeah, there's Zora in Zora's domain. If you talk to it as wolf during the twilight, it says, Sniff my queen. Like it wants you to sniff its queen. You know, like you do. Disgusting. <laughs> Sorry, was that not family friendly enough? This is a children's game! Uh, actually, this one's rated T for teen. This is a slightly older children's game. True. So, a bunch of dash cancelling from Beast here. Being uh, cautious to when he uh, does a dash near the edge. 
that I can do what he mentioned earlier, being like, uh, making sure that he jumps off the, off the ledge within a 10, 10 frame window to regain his dash. Oh, we didn't mention earlier that I left this area as human last time under the water so that I would skip a cutscene uh, with a blinking fish talking to me. And I'm going to leave the area as human underwater again for the exact same reason. That scene takes a little while. Oops. Yeah, because you're normally not supposed to be able to go below the water here. But having Iron Boots makes that really easy uh, with uh, early Master Sword as well. Now we'll see a uh, waterfall side up. There is a three frame window for you to do a side up right there. Very nice. Just some, um, like some routing for like the movement here to uh, get to the next bug faster. Uh, if you input the side up on the first three possible frames, you'll land on the lower ledge. You can claw shot the vines to get back up. Um, mm. And the next three frames are the ones that work that we just saw. Now this is very fun, Lily Pipe oh. Bugs. I wanted to target the other one. So how these guys, uh, you know, that was very good. That was very relatively quickly. Uh, you can get very unlucky here, depending on like where in what sort of position they are when you jump down here. Uh, famously, unfortunately, now that I'm saying it, but SVA's PB has uh, was very unlucky here, so he lost a lot of time to that. So that's an example of seeing like, how wrong it can go. Yeah, so the tears can't be instantly collected as they can in Twilight Princess HD, so in that instance he was able to get some additional rupees while waiting for the tear to be collectible. And we'll see that again in just a moment. Luckily, most unskippable cutscenes like that one uh, is very short. I did document all of the unskippable cutscenes in the 100% uh, speedrun of the route that Beast is doing, and I believe it's 19 minutes and 20 something seconds. That's not bad. Not at all. <laughs> Though, load zones take a while, too. That's true. And this map coming up is uh, probably the biggest reason why people don't find this Twilight to be the most fun <laughs> out, of the, out of the three Twilights. Because the whole goal at this point is just to get to uh, Castletown. And we just got to go all the way north around. And it's just running in a straight line. Let's see if Beast can do it. Holding that up notch. Thank goodness I'm not playing the HD version. Yeah, the HD, uh, uh, like the, the Wii U controllers don't have notches on them. So it makes some things really difficult, like Wolf Bomb Out Skip. You wouldn't see that because uh, it is very important to hold a straight direction when doing that trick. So like theoretically possible, but falling down loses a minute. So yeah. And Beast is using C down here to pan his camera, get a bit of an overview so that he reduces lag. Um, this part of the game has a little bit of lag, not too much, but a little bit. Uh, later during the uh, minutes per hour, uh, it is not laggy. It's just during the twilight here, you get a bit of a frame drop. Yeah, and it really doesn't make that that big a difference. There are some areas that are laggy where I don't do any kind of lag reduction. It's because I have to be doing other stuff and it's kind of hard to see when I pan the camera down like that. But in this area, here I'm just like running straight the entire time. Not even like I'm I'm literally holding up notch the entire time until I start the portal fight. So there's no reason not to. This warp portal is actually quite useful later, as uh, after Pals of Twilight we can just warp here and just go straight to Hyrule Castle. So it is a very important portal to get. Um, but yeah, so in this moment, at this part of the game, is just to get this one bug. And Beast is now doing, he's dashing and then instantly pressing B to do an attack. So he's dash cancelling again and again because uh, your movement speed is quite slow here. Otherwise, if you were just to be dashing, it depends on what area of the game you're in. Wolfling can be either really fast or pretty slow. So doing continu continuously dash cancelling here uh, gives the best speed. <laughs> and 
And by bonking it on that corner, it forces the bug to move out of the box to the left, which makes it uh, vulnerable much quicker. Because it needs to go down from that ledge before you can attack it. You may notice that I'm also waiting a little bit to do things, like go through load zones or warp after I've collected the tiers, because until Link turns blue and the tier appears in the vessel on the HUD on the right side of the screen, Link hasn't officially collected the tier. If I had warped away between like touching the tier and it actually forming in the vessel, then I would not have gotten it and I would have needed to go all the way back there in order to get it. Be a ridiculous we have seen that a few times and uh, it's quite devastating. Yeah. Oops. It's very easy to do in the Elden Twilight uh, in the um, Watchtower house because you're yeah. digging right after getting the tier and the big spot is like right there. There's this flying sequence where you can charge ahead of the, the bug, the first bug here and uh, it'll have like a rubber banding effect so it will catch up to you later and it saves a few seconds but it requires you to have a little bit better flying than if you were to sort of do it intentionally one bug at a time. Very nice. This part of my PB I lost a lot of time because I missed one of the last bugs here and I had to wait for it to catch up and oh, they man. instantly uh, catch up to you all the time. Like sometimes they, they're a bit slow. So we are bonking here to restart the flying sequence and then telling Midna that no, we do not want to try again. And this will place us at a very convenient location for the second to last bug. So right at the shore at the north of uh, Lake Hylia here, there's a bug right, right away which we can instantly jump attack and it might, if we're lucky, uh, he, he, so he can be pretty close to the ground and you can just instantly kill him. Yeah, that is unfortunately RNG. <clears throat> the way most enemies work in this game, in fact, I think all enemies except like bosses, um, is that they load when you start loading a sequence. So like when you open a door, or sorry, when you start loading a room. So when you start opening the door to a room or when the game starts fading into this area, for example. And they always start, they always spawn in the exact same place, but as soon as they spawn, they can move in a random direction. So the bug will always be kind of close to the same place, but not exactly. Um, and now for the boss bug, the final bug in the game, actually. This is the last of the Twilights. Uh, I'm just going to be keeping it on camera the whole time. Because it will only start charging when it's on camera. If you keep it off camera all the time, it'll never start charging. It'll just go all the way to the bottom of Lake Hylia, which is very funny. Um, and I'm going to be doing position setups... Where is it going? Okay. So that I can try to bonk it as it's attacking and prevent it from flying past me. And by doing that, I can finish the fight pretty quickly. And there's an animation that plays here where you attack all the tentacles here, but if you hit the water or bonk the bug, you can instantly cancel that cutscene. Because all you need is to like initiate the midna charge on one of the tentacles, and the game is like, okay, you've hit this flag. And that's the final uh, tier of light that we'll see. That was another little bit of lag reduction there when I turned the camera at the end. Uh, Lake Hylia is a large and laggy area, and having the camera facing the direction I was swimming would have been a little bit laggier than having it facing the direction I turned it to. So now having beaten Lake Bed Temple, um, the next most direct goals for story progression are to get bombs and then beat Lake Bed Temple. Whoops. Um, we're going to need bombs to beat Lake Bed Temple because that'll be our method of breathing underwater, which we'll explain in a little bit. Um, but there is actually going to be one little tangent we go on before getting to Lake Bed. The first thing, though, is to get bombs. And there are three bomb bags in this game that you can get. You can get one from Iza after finishing her minigame. You can get one from the Goron and Zoro's domain that's underwater and you can get one from Barnes after beating uh, Goron Mines. As I mentioned before this run does not complete Goron Mines so we're not going to get Barnes bomb bag for sure and we don't really want to do Iza's mini game, but we don't have a way of getting the Goron bomb bag because we don't we, uh, bombs are required to get it so it's, it can't be your first bomb bag normally. <clears throat> what we can do however 
is Remember the Howling Stone song, yes. Um, is Steal a Bomb Bag from Iza. We're going to be dirty little thieves. And use that bomb bag to get the Goron's bomb bag. Um, I just want to add, as an aside here, I'm howling at the stone for the reason Sky mentioned earlier. Um, we do need to get Ending Blow to finish the game, and I need to spawn a Golden Wolf to do that. So the method for stealing the bomb bag is pretty simple. There are actually two similar but different methods of doing it. Uh, I'm going to get this warp portal, and then Iza will invite me inside and ask me to help her um, to clear the rocks blocking the river. And to do that, she will give me bombs in a temporary bag. If I were to just leave via the door, she would take the bomb bag back, and I wouldn't have a bomb bag. But if I use Uku to escape from Iza's house, or cabin, I guess, then I'm going to still have the bomb bag. It doesn't get cleared until uh, we enter, or we, until we see a save prompt. Um, so all I have to do is escape Iza's house without seeing a save prompt and get all the way to the Goron bomb bag uh, to get that with the bombs that I'm getting. The method I'm going to be using to get out of Iza's house is not actually that. Instead of uh, using Uku, I'm going to do a frame-perfect map press, which is actually pretty easy because it's on the same frame as another input. And uh, that'll open the map between the dialogue and the forced item wheel open. And on that frame, the game doesn't check whether you can actually warp away or not, so it'll let me even though you normally can't warp from Iza's cabin. And it's easy because you can unplug, right? I'm, I'm not going to. You're not going to, okay. Uh, pff, I almost said yes. Uh, whoops. Hello? I didn't get it. There we go. Okay, so... Uh, here, I'm actually just going to mute. You go ahead with this one. Sorry, I meant to explain this earlier. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so he's going to save the Goron in Zora's Domain, which will give him a, bomb, a real bomb bag. And a lot of runners will use water bombs because you can use them underwater. But it is possible to actually use normal bombs underwater with a glitch called, you guessed it, normal bombs underwater. And the bomb can just barely reach the Goron. He's going to pull out a bomb just before it hits the water, and then have a cutscene play, and the cutscene will stall the bomb timer, and the bomb will continuously go down, and it will blow up the rock. It will be just enough to reach the rock. Very nice. This is... It depends on the setup used. It can be frame Hello? perfect to... Wait, I can't talk things, to you. I believe. Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> Panicked. So, there is the, the real bomb bag that we will keep for the rest of the run. Uh, so, yeah, the, the easier method would be to... Um, steal Isa's bomb bag, work back to Lake Bed Temple, empty the bomb bag, because it has no normal bombs in them, and then pick up a chest with, with water bombs, and then work back here, and then use water bombs to blow it up as you're supposed to if you want to get this bomb bag. But with that very precise uh, trick, you can have normal bombs persist underwater, and the cutscene of the chest spawning there to delay the bomb timer, as the bomb, the bomb will still float, uh, it will still go down to the bottom, but the timer is paused. A little bit of movement trick here to pull three bombs and then roll without taking damage. Very nice. And then here we have map glitch. So this time Beast will uh, unplug from the Wii. And then hold down D-pad right and Z. Replug the controller and that will have two things happen at the same time. It will call Midna and open the map. And he will then say, yes, I want to warp to whichever direct a a location he wants to. Pick picks the closest warp portal. But then Midna will interrupt right afterwards, saying like, what do you want to do? Because you talk to Midna. So all the loading zones are now disabled, but uh, talking to Midna interrupts the warp, and he just cancels out of, ca cancels out of the Midna, um, like speaking to Midna, and now he's able to just continue on uh, without any of the void out triggers that would normally be here because he doesn't have the reek fish sent. So at this point in the game, you're supposed to use the fishing rod to fish up a reek, uh, a reek fish, learn the scent, and then follow the trail. And there are a bunch of void-out triggers that prevent you from climbing this mountain. Like, you need to follow that specific path. But uh, not having the fishing rod makes him like makes it not possible to do that. So, because of the back-in-time glitch that we performed at the very beginning of the game. So, a lot of things uh, like, uh, come, comes down to this. But luckily, we have map glitch to uh, 
to solve this issue. But with loading, sound, loading zones now disabled, if he were to dig at the cave up top here, he would soft lock the game because the game is not able to uh, uh, get to the next loading zone, not able to uh, yeah, load the next area. But fortunately, there is a howling stone at the top here, and going howling at a howling stone is a different kind of trigger than a normal loading zone. So now he gets placed into this um, howling stone sequence at the like this part of the the map, and then. He can loading zones are now back, and he can leave this area because he doesn't. There's actually a loading zone to just say like, actually, I don't don't want this. Uh, I don't want to spawn spawn this golden wolf. I changed my mind, so he just leaves, and everything is back to normal. And now he can dig without soft locking. It is worth noting though that dying would also be a soft lock, much as the one Sky was just describing. And later on in the run, I am going to use map glitch again, and there is actually a risk that I'm going to die. I need to be careful that time. This cave is notorious for uh, being quite annoying with the keys there. Oops. Nice. So uh, you can get instantly attacked by one of the the ice keys there, and uh, doesn't you know uh, doesn't damage you all that much, but it makes the uh, getting out of the cave a lot harder. Here, uh, uh, everything's going so fast in this part of the game. There's a boomerang launch yeah. attack again to <laughs> void out further forward than you're supposed to. So. Uh, you can skip the whole Shadow Beast sequence here, because normally there will be a Shadow Beast fight here where you unlock the warp portal. But we're never going to go back to the top of Snow Peak here, so we just skip the whole fight by voiding out further uh, forward here, and then we can progress normally with uh, talking to Yeddo and uh, snowboarding our way down. One unfortunate ramification of this, though, is that, as you can see, the fog doesn't clear from the mountain unless you beat the warp portal. So I'm going to have to do what we call blind snowboarding down to the mansion and blind snowboarding is, is quite interesting it saves a bit of time like it saves doing the fight um, but it also makes it so rupees haven't spawned um, on the way down to the mansion because you could actually get a lot of rupees um, if you could collect them all on during your, your down to the, the mansion uh, the mansion here but there are other rupees we can get which are very convenient so it doesn't really matter but yeah not being able to see uh, quite far ahead of you is a bit problematic for a shortcut coming up. Uh, hopefully it goes well, but uh, it can be quite tricky. And if he avoids out, then he'll have to start at the top and snowboard again. But fingers crossed that it goes all all goes well. He has an alignment that he will make a visual cue right here. Very nice. Still not over, but the hardest part is over. Uh, on the HD version, uh, if you do the same sort of thing, um, you will uh, the rupees will have spawned, so you can get the benefit of both, both worlds. It is possible to skip this midna text, but it doesn't really save time because you can uh, go so far with the snowboard that you know it's a very quick dialogue. I don't think we've mentioned yet why we're going to Snow Peak in the first place said before we didn't have to beat this dungeon. What are we doing here? Yeah, so we need the ball and chain for one phase of uh, Zant later on. That's the only reason why we're here, to get the ball and chain for one cycle in a boss fight later. And Snow Peak is very broken. Uh, LGA found by ZFG. Thank you, ZFG. Uh, clipped through the floor there by claw shotting a target uh, <laughs> on the next floor. The floor there uh, has weird collision. You can just jump through it. Push this block, and now we're going to do a pretty new trick. It was one of the recent discoveries here. Uh, it is a uh, final... F uh, well, it's what's, what's, the, what's the name now again? Uh, it's last uh, freezer cancel. Or ladder freezer cancel, I mean. So it's a frame-perfect trick where he drops down from the ladder here. And it can be a bit iffy to get at first, but... He's basically manipulating the enemy here. Did I fail it? did. I've never failed that before. So he wants to drop down from the ladder on one specific frame. And then later on at the top of the ladder also drop down, but that second drop being uh, a lot more lenient. Uh, 
There we go, very nice. Normally he will never stop uh, breathing. What? Hello? <laughs> I'm so I confused. Guess, I guess maybe you just gotta walk a bit away from that spot, yeah. Wow, interesting uh, troubleshooting going on here. I've never seen that before. <laughs> Here is a um, freezer skip, so you can hop into the space between uh, the wall and the freezer there to click through and then open the door from behind. And opening the door is the sequence that allows you to get into this next uh, this next room. So we can fight uh, this miniboss, so we can get the ball and chain. He's going to place a bomb behind the miniboss and then drop some bombs. He's already dropped quite a few bombs. And then he will toss the ball and chain towards us and then have the tail be targetable. The bomb goes off, deals lots of damage, and then do an auto spin, which is a jump attack quick spin, to one cycle the boss. Yeah, now I with the ball and chain of... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I wonder whether that text was related to me failing that, because I'd never done... I never failed it that way, and I had never gotten the text before. I think it's being too close to the freezer, like right after going off the ladder. I think there's like a story I, I thing. Us but I usually transform right away. Interesting. I'm not too yeah, familiar I, with this uh, myself, actually, because it's quite new. Yeah. So now we're going to break down this uh, armor, f not uh, being like super close to it. Okay, it <laughs> you can be close to it if you have a, like a certain angle when pulling it. Um, but it's possible to destroy that armor so quickly that you don't give uh, the bubble, like the enemy, a chance to spawn. Because attack, like. Starting to break down that armor will spawn a bubble, and killing that bubble will give you 100 rupees. But it is possible to just obliterate the armor so quickly that the enemy doesn't have a chance to spawn. Um, most notably known as, oh no, the rupee goes out of bounds, which it might be able to do that as well. But I think the most logical thing is that oh, the enemy doesn't, doesn't spawn. So two 100 rupees grabbed pretty quickly here, uh, which will help a lot for repairing the cannon later. Now we're going back to lake bed. And now we can defeat Morpheal. And he has emptied out his bomb bag, so now he will get water bombs from this chest. So we don't have Zora armor, but we need to defeat Morpheal. And how are we going to do that? Well, there's actually a glitch that allows us to swim with water bombs. It's quite funny because the text that you just saw, it says, you've got some water bombs. You can use them underwater. You can't swim with them, though. Except you can. So if you pull out a water bomb and then unequip iron boots, because you need iron boots to be grounded underwater, you can then swim with water bombs. And for whatever reason, the game thinks you resurface if you then press A. So you refill your air. And you can resurface if you do it really quickly, which is another glitch called Rocket Link. But Beast will not perform a boss key skip. So you can, you can clip into the bridge here. Uh, skipping the need to obtain the, the boss key for this dungeon. And this is the only boss key skip we'll see. Because usually, for, for most dungeons here, it is the action of opening the boss door that will transition you into the boss room. But here it's actually a door and then you go inside this little room and then you drop down here. So this is the only place where it's uh, possible to do a, a boss key skip. It all happens very quickly, but it was very nice showcase of clipping into the bridge and then clipping into that little room. And more feel without Zora Armor, it is very another thing that's very difficult to learn. He's going to use the air refill glitch, which is swimming with water bombs and then pressing A to uh, to resurface. Like the game thinks he resurfaces, although he doesn't, so he just refills his air. Oh, okay. Oof, almost didn't make it. <laughs> I, so, I think I was gonna hit. So that skips um like doing that, dealing so much damage that I either with a jump attack or a quick spin allows you to instantly go into the next phase. If you only do like one stab or something, then uh, it will be like a small cutscene where Morpheal spawns bombs and then. Yeah, and without zero armor, attack. that's just awful. Very difficult to deal with that. Yeah. So he's now floating up. He unequipped Iron Boots during this cutscene. So he's floating up and he's hover holding a bomb. If he tries to swim with it right now, he will drop it. So he's just going to stay still, and then he's going to use Iron Boots to take them on and off to regulate his height. He's going to watch where Morpheal is swimming. And he's going to press A to drop the bomb, refilling his air, claw shotting onto Morpheal. This does have potential for one bomb, which I'm not sure if he's going to go for. I'm going <laughs> to... Yeah, so attack it four times. He does go for it, that's very nice. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, 
Excellent, excellent, wow. One bomb. That is very difficult and it's very RNG dependent. So basically, if you have Iron Boots on when you claw shot onto Morphil, you can deal the hits that you need, and then as soon as you've dealt the fourth hit, you can force unequip the Iron Boots by equipping an item over the Iron Boots slot, and that just instantly makes it so you let go of Morphil, and then you can equip Iron Boots again, put them on again, claw shot her again, all in a very quick succession, and repeat that. And then for the last hit, you only need to claw shot onto her, you don't need to put on Iron Boots again. And if the RNG is good, and if her head is in the right position, you can re-grab her so quickly that you don't need to go back down to uh, use the, the air refill glitch again. So it's very tight on air, but it just barely works, and getting that in a, in a marathon or a race or anything like that is quite crazy. Nicely done. Do I have a bit of time now to sneak in a quick donation? Absolutely. Wonderful! We've got one here from uh, Mini Mini 352 who kicked off our relay today with Wind Waker. He says, one dollar for every minute I spent in the Puppet Ganon room. Oh, Mini, we, we were with you every step of the way. It was RNG hell in there. Oh, he says, good luck, Beast, and everyone else. Let's get that world record. And for those of you who have been on our Tiltify page, you can see our goal for today is $200, and we are $5 off. So please, we are supporting Planned Parenthood today, so... If you can spare it, please, please get your donations in. Just me, um, you know, saying that you're amazing at the game for doing a one bomb in a marathon run. Aww. And Minnie wished you good luck too. Thanks, Minnie. Thanks, H. So a lot of things happen from entering Snow Peak up until now. So there's a lot of talking, a lot of things going on. So this is the first little part of the game where you can, <laughs> where yeah, donations are a lot easier to read and you can talk a bit more like slowly around what the ne the next part of the run, what's coming up. Yeah, until you were talking a mile a minute, I didn't realize how much stuff was going on between Norgor and uh, Lakebed. That is a yeah. very dense section of the run. Yeah, sword and shield skip and morefield being like two of the the big points in the run that can easily kill your run uh, in the back like most back in time equipped most people who use the back in time equipped route uh, would also use zora armor well i guess 50 50 i guess but uh there are four routes you can use um and a, a common one to recommend to new players is uh, back in time equipped with zora armor so you don't need to learn that really hard fight right off the bat you can choose to do it later if you wish unfortunately Gives you some freedom unfortunately without a bunch of other workarounds getting the zora armor requires a frame perfect trick that costs uh, like a minute and a half to fail um so arguably it's harder yeah the uh, opponent slide over the gorge not being really yeah. friendly either so it's kind of pick your poison with uh, with this game oops <laughs> beast, beast attempting a um, uh, a glitch there where the camera gets set into a weird weird spot, which ends up saving time during the sequence. Saves uh, a few seconds. But... It was one point seven seconds, but I didn't save that just now. <laughs> it saves so little that you can't really like set it up. You just kind of gotta go for it. Yeah. Hopefully you get it. And it's at dashing speed. It is frame perfect. But it's yeah, it's not worth setting up. So this is like the halfway point of the run, but um, and even though there are more difficult things coming up, uh, getting past this point is uh, quite uh, relieving, quite rewarding. Uh, can like have a little bit of breather. It will be a little a little while before we get the same sort of like high risk uh, situation, uh, sort of high intensity. Here is the first Poe, this one we must defeat and get the Poe soul from. Well, we get the Poe soul when you defeat him, which will uh, just advance this room, opening up this chest and allowing us to continue. 
uh, so a minimum of uh, four Poe Souls we'll get. This being the first one, and then three in Arborist Grounds. There are four, well, we can do Poe One Skip. You say minimum. Well, if you want to be fast, it's minimum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is possible to skip all the Poe's in Arborist Grounds by doing something that I alluded to earlier, pick up slide, which is picking up, like Link being in the get item state. And when he is in that state, if you, if you did like the setup correctly, like if, if your angle was good and whatnot, then you will move very, very slowly um, and add a few hours to that and you will have actually moved uh, enough distance to be able to go like pass through walls and whatnot. Because when you are in that state, you don't have collisions. So we can sort of like have Link's back go closer and closer to a wall you want to clip through or a door you want to clip through, allowing you to skip all the posts in Arborist Grounds, which is what low percent does, as that is one of the... It tries to collect as few things as possible, and collecting posts is definitely a thing. Some uh, enemy uh, manip there to have him back off and then fall into the water. If you don't kill that archer, then it is very likely that he will hit you with an arrow later on. But all of the other ones you can uh, ignore, as they all have clubs. They're all uh, short range. There are some tricks you can do on the ropes here. If you do a jump attack at the right time, you can skip the last part of the uh, the rope sequence. It'll happen a couple of places. You can also jump over here. So jump attack, you can get, an, you get a... Since he was on a higher ground than you, then you get a long jump attack. I never even thought about that, that that's an LJA. You're right. Yeah, technically. So bridge will and bridge will beast will try to make uh, early <laughs> here. <laughs> but bridge the beast. Um, so you can just barely make the cycle if your movement is good. The cycle starts like right away at the beginning of this area. You just gotta keep your dashes. Uh, gotta monitor your dashes. So your dash cancel at the right times, and just like that, you get the make the 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 first win cycle. Very nice. Now we're back to Zelda again. We saw at the start of the at the start of the game. This time she will heal Midna, who has been sick all this time, since after uh, defeating Lakebed. And after this is where you would normally go and get the Master Sword. But since we already did that, we can just progress with uh, the story and go next to Arbiter's Grounds. But we did spawn a Golden Wolf here, uh, and this this is the reason why we chose this Howling Stone because the Golden Wolf spawns here. It's very convenient to get this right after Midna's per hour. And after you have learned the first hidden skill, you will get placed in North Faron because that's where you're supposed to be after learning the first hidden skill, as the wolf will be outside of Forest Temple. Uh, and since we need to warp to Lake Hylia anyway, it's best to just get this one, and you get warped to... Like, after the sequence, you'll be in outside of Forest Temple, but you're warping anyway, so it doesn't matter. If we have picked other Howling Stones, that could have screwed us up a little bit. So Link actually turns around there, even though the the guy is right in front of him. It's a bit of a glitch state. This uh, since you're not supposed to, uh, you know, get get this wolf as the first one. It's a little bit of a glitchy intro. But here's ending blow. The required skill to beat the game. There are a select number of people who have <laughs> completed the hundred percent run. Uh, well, up until the very end, and then reach Ganondorf, and then realize they didn't have ending blow. Uh, Venic, myself. And I believe TGD said he also did it at one time. I thought one or two other people had done it too. Oh, interesting. I have not done it yet. And I'm glad today is not going to be the first time. Well, <laughs> it's still possible. If I manage to die to King Boldland 3 and have to reload my save before Lake Bed, then uh, I could forget it. For the sake of the other participants in this relay, I really hope that doesn't happen. Uh, it's, it shouldn't happen. Beast having really good awareness will just... If the fight goes ill, he'll just back up and wait for King Bolden to swing and then approach him again. Yeah. I, if, if the fight's going badly, I might just save. That, that too, yeah. So when you're transforming with Midna on your back, it is slightly faster to enter first-person view and then call Midna. Um, 
I don't remember exactly how many frames it saves, but a handful of frames and it adds up over time, of course. So he's going to do that again here. He's going to approach the ladder and then hit C stick up to enter first person view. Wait a tiny bit and then press Z. And that will speed up the, the camera pan, which will make it so he can transform sooner. Do a nice little effect with the camera here as you're climbing this very long ladder. Yep. Not much else to do here. These text boxes are pretty comfortable to go through, in my opinion. Roger mentioning at one point that it was like his favorite text boxes to match through. Mm. Mine are eases. Those are also very good, yeah. Very satisfying. So here's the memo. We're going to show this to fire at the cannon there, and he will give us entry to the desert. So I Why not? <laughs> what happened? Uh, I'm sorry, I saw him in this comment. Yeah, why not use the hookshot? <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have the hook shot in this game, and the claw shot does not let you climb ladders. I uh, I got a YouTube comment once that just said, it was like, fun fact, you can use the hook shot to get up the ladders quicker, smiley face. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. That is possible in Ocarina of Time, yes. But unfortunately not in this game. Even though the claw shot, you know, it would be able to claw onto the, the ladder, like it should be, but it's not. Yeah, so gaining like getting access to the desert is like a big routing thing for this game. If we somehow manage to get here uh, without all the events leading up to this, this could be huge. Also, the cutscene that just we just skipped um, has like it displays Palace of Twilight for a brief moment, and this, there was a theory where if you die when it, the scene is at Palace of Twilight, you would respawn in Palace of Twilight. So with cheats, it was able somebody was able to pull that off, but. Um, yeah, because when, whenever we see, like, there are no movie files being played, it's always, like, rendered in-game. So if we, if we are for a brief moment in Palace of Twilight during a cutscene, then we are technically there, just we're on that on that map, so. But TP is pretty hard to break, unfortunately. Yeah, speaking of the Golden Wolf warping us back to Farron, which is where, where we were supposed to have gotten that skill, that's something called a Golden Wolf Wrong Warp, and it can be applied to other wolves, too. You might think that that would get us into Hyrule Castle, castle early because there's a wolf right there in front of the castle, but it doesn't actually work. Kind of tantalizing. Whoops. Nice. Oops. So here I'm going to skip uh, knocking down a Bulblin Rider and getting a boar by just clipping past this fence instead. Quite a bit faster. And now comes the second instance of map glitch in the run. Uh, I'm going to unplug my controller to get it again, uh, exact same way that I got it earlier. And in this, t uh, in this instance, I'm going to use it to get to the King Bulblin fight, which is like the like demi-boss of this area. Um, a little bit faster than I'd be able to if I did it the casual way, going around and getting the small key. There's actually quite a few methods you can get to this fight uh, without like, glitches. Uh, like, not an like, unintentional method of doing it. You can also like get on top of the hut and just kind of roll up on the roof. And uh, the, the cutscene extends infinitely, or probably infinitely, I don't know, uh, up and down. So these will you know go below the map here using map glitch. The game will not void him out because the loading zones are disabled, but it will hit this cutscene trigger far below the map, and another one coming up, and it will be warped up. Just wanted to scare you a little bit. Yeah, missing one quick spin there is totally fine. But if you miss multiple, then yeah, gotta be cautious because he deals a lot of damage there, so quite easy to die. Yeah, and again, yeah. dying there would soft lock because we have map glitch, and that would cost about 20 minutes. Yeah, and you might think, well, map glitch, just like last time, there's a lot, like, we're soft locked, we can't progress to the next loading zone. But luckily, again, just like the howling at the top of Snow Peak, uh, the sequence of getting out of the boar and breaking this, uh, this, this, like, breaking out of here, plays a cutscene that then loads the next area in a different way than a normal loading zone would. So conveniently, it's not like a traditional loading zone. So that disables map glitch. Otherwise, this wouldn't be possible. Yeah. This is a much smaller sequence break than getting up to Snow Peak early, though. So less important. But yeah, it is very convenient.
so st <laughs> story-wise, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a pile of dungeons to finish in order to get to the final boss. And I'm entering the first of the last, uh, I guess, four dungeons that you could consider kind of a dungeon rush. And there is some very interesting stuff to do in this dungeon. Yeah, so Arbiter's Grounds has some of the hardest tricks in the game by far. Uh, used to not have them, but uh, we decided that, you know, this task only trick, we should try doing it in real time. And uh, <laughs> it started with Death Sword Skip, which was difficult, but with enough practice, not too bad. But Stalor Skip, on the other hand, same thing in theory, not too bad with practice, but much, much harder. Um, so still no way of like skipping this dungeon, but just doing things inside of it much quicker. The, the required lantern check in this run is coming up in this next room, so unfortunately this is the room that makes it so we need a lantern. We could do some other stuff in Hyrule Castle to avoid using a lantern, but this one is a hard check. And the cutscene coming up is the, the Poe door cutscene, and this is where low percent would um, clip through this, uh, this door after sliding for uh, 15 hours, I believe. Yeah, I think it's nine hours for this slide. Oh, right, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we're not going to do that. That would take a while. Um, we yeah, will... A little over but... <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, we will be skipping a lot of uh, fights, though. This is essentially a pacifist dungeon. The shtick of this dungeon is to get past this door, you have to get the four Poe Souls, but the game doesn't actually check for the first one because the first one is supposed to be required to get the second one, but we have a method of skipping the first one, which I will demonstrate shortly. So we're going to skip killing the first one, and then I will ideally skip killing both the mini-boss and the boss. Yeah, so that is known as a Poe 1 skip, skipping the first Poe, by taking a different route here. Long jump attack with a boomerang, and then getting a warp up on that uh, that little um, uh, pillar, and then long jump attacking over here. Very nice. So. The old method was to backflip onto the pillar and then with a very precise angle slide and jump off and grab the ledge much more precise. But that up warp was discovered um, quite a while ago, I think it was 2018, maybe 2017 or something, uh, making it much more, much easier to do pull one skip, which is now such a standardized thing that it's even recommended to beginners to do it. Yeah, it's really not that bad. It saves uh, a little bit under a minute, if I remember correctly. So normally this is the, the last uh, Poe fight, but we do it as the first one due to this uh, reroute. Yeah, Poe 1 skip saves so much time that 100%, which has to get Poe one soul because 100%, still does Poe 1 skip afterwards. Which I find very funny. It's quite, quite amusing, yeah some RNG to this fight. Uh, it starts off with a uh, consistency and then which poet is here is random. But it is possible to manipulate so by getting that one you're supposed to go back on land and then um, be try to go for an instant jump there. Like if that would have been the Poe that, uh, that, that it went for then it would have saved time by you know instantly attacking that one. But that one was random. But the first Poe lighting up um, the strat for that is to get back on land and instantly jump attack and it will make the Poe spin again right away. And there is like, so there are four different things depending on which Poe it is, so that four um, sequences of moves you can use to force them to spin again. So luckily that has been figured out, but not the final bit, which Poe it's going to be at the end there. So B's getting the scent from, from that Poe fight instead of the first one. Pushing this block four times, it does not go into its slot, but pushing it four times will make it so it remembers the, the, the position. If you push it three times, then the next time you go back here, it will still not have been pushed. So it's important to push it at least four times. Getting some money, because we still need a little bit more money to fix the cannon later. Uh, he gets the rupee text from, it, from that chest, which is quite nice, because later on he can uh, collect red rupees without having to worry about the text slowing him down in the middle of a sequence. And having the scent here is what makes it so you can dig there and pull that chain. If you don't have the scent, then it, digging there does nothing. So there's a re dead here, you can kill him uh, a couple of different ways you can kill him, uh, but very quickly. Uh, he doesn't stand a chance to, like, he doesn't get a chance to uh, um, uh, stun Link. Yes, he does, apparently. <laughs> Usually doesn't. 
tiny bit too far away from the bowling chain. The bowling chain deals a lot of damage. It's very convenient to just hold the button for it, so I'd sw swing above Link's head. Um, if Beast were to fight uh, Death Sword, the mini boss, then using the bowling chain would be very beneficial because it deals a lot of damage and speed up the fight quite a bit. But since it is possible to skip it, he will try to do that instead, which saves something like 15 seconds, if I remember correctly. A jump attacking pose makes it so they will attack you sooner. Because uh, usually it's like a startup animation thing where they kind of scream at you, and then after that scream, some idling animation, and then they it will attack you and, and turn purple. But if you jump attack Poe, then you skip that scream start. And normally when I'm getting Poe souls, I'll position Link so that the little backflip he does after getting the Poe soul will move him closer to the door that I'm going to, but there was a heart there and I just want to play it a little bit safe, so went to get that in the corner instead. He will try with an enemy manip here, so he will push this and hopefully the rat will... Excellent, yeah. So the rat, the rat taking damage from the rat there uh, makes it so you cancel the animation of, of pushing that thing. And as long as, as long as you start the sequence, that's enough for it to carry on on its, uh, on its own. So you can just leave the area a bit quicker. Uh, this would have been a soft lock for Glitchless, I believe. Because the room hasn't yeah. fully uh, finished its transition. But for us, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so I mentioned before... Pushed, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, that, that was the block I pushed earlier, and I have to come back here to get this new Poe. Um, I had to get the small key over on the other side first. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, as I was saying before, the Forest Temple had that humongous sequence break where uh, we just didn't do any of the dungeon. We got the monkeys via a glitch. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey, give me one sec. So sorry. Um, I said that we weren't going to do the last four dungeons really in the intended way for the most part, but it wasn't going to be quite as sequence broken as that. Um, and th this dungeon is a good example of that. We haven't done any like crazy glitches in this dungeon yet, or sequence breaks, but um, we've pretty much done the dungeon in like reverse order or kind of a mixed up order. And then there's going to be a very big sequence break after I bring this post hole back to the main room and get to the second half. Sorry, I was Hydrate getting water. Chat. Yeah, hydrating is important. So normally in this room, you're supposed to get the small key from the chest here, and that spawns a bunch of rats. But since we uh, did this in a different order, we can just we already used the small key on this door from another room. We can just leave without having to deal with the rats, which is quite nice. So only three of these torches now have the, the souls, but the game is like, yeah, that's fine. We don't need all four. Yep. And what Beast was just saying earlier, um, in this next room, we can do a sequence break that allows us to get the boss key early. And it's actually quite simple to do. We can do it with uh, Wolf by doing a B-hop in the sand to like go in between the wall and the pillar. But you can also, as human, do a roll and then... Um. You don't... <laughs> Or you can do that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Right. Sorry, go oh, on, did. Sky? I didn't mean to yeah. interrupt. <laughs> so a bee hop there to uh, go in between the wall and the pillar, and they just climb up as wolf. But as human, you can also do a... With a like, semi-precise angle, you can just hop across, roll in the sand, and then do a roll stab. The roll stab isn't always needed. Yeah, either, but you can just cross it like that and then turn wolf and climb up. Here he will attempt some human movement where he will do a one frame side hop. Very nice. And then... Oh, it's not one frame. Oh, it's, it's two frames. I don't know a frame window for it, but if you just keep holding forward and L, then um, the window stays open. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, so staying human for this bit is a little bit faster than going and transforming into wolf, but this is the hard bit where you want to have a very precise, like relatively precise... Uh, angle as you jump off there and then doing a brake slide which is holding like the ESS range uh, ESS standing uh, stands for extended super slide uh, coined from like Ocarina of Time and Jorah's Mask uh, even though you don't do ex uh, pretty sure Ocarina of Time was like where was first uh, no sorry I was saying really to my mistake <laughs> okay work okay 
Um, so you don't do extended super slides in this game, but just ESS is just colloquial term for like holding outside of the, the dead zone of the control stick. And by holding that position and then uh, using using target, uh, locking the camera, you can get that slide in sand and on snow. And so you can sort of, you don't prevent uh, drowning in the sand, but you, uh, you can slide across it at a much higher speed than you're supposed to. And it's used actually quite a bit more in Skyward Sword speedrunning. You can cross entire rooms that are filled with sand really easily with a brake slide. And since Beast needed to equip items anyway, he buffered it on the item wheel section. So nah, he's very low on HP, but uh, it's no big deal because if he, like after the save warp Peter, he will have full health. Well, I'm also going to break a pot while doing Death Sword Skip, so it's going to have a heart in it. That's true. <clears throat> So first phase is over very quick. Now second phase, we're not gonna fight him, but we're gonna use him to super jump like we saw with early Master Sword. And this is pretty precise. Hopefully it goes well. Very nice, very nice. So the same sort of technique as we saw with the early Master Sword, just having an enemy be, be target, targeted by Midna and then having a, a big distance between you and the enemy and just go flying as far as you can and you can just barely make it over there. So the fight is still happening but we're just gonna save and reload and take us back to the start of the dungeon. No need to kill many bosses. Just leave nope. them. Similar um, to uh, Wind Waker. Even though we didn't see the dungeon in the previous run, uh, Earth Temple you could... Um, you know, Oh yeah, that one's really cool. Yeah, that one's really, really cool. Using the, the leaf to uh, pump your way over to just get to the chest, even though the mini boss fight is still happening. Do you want to explain uh, uh, Stallard Skip? Yeah, yeah. So there's a big trick coming up called Stallard Skip. This one was only recently made RTA viable. It was considered TAS only for a few years. And the goal is to skip Stallard. Um, <clears throat> there are kind of three tricks in one with this one. And they're all kind of difficult. So first what I'm going to do is something called Claw Shot Actor Displacement. I'm going to position myself very, very carefully so that I can slide off of a ledge and... Um, what am I doing? And uh, latch the Claw Shot onto a stall troop, one of the little skeleton dudes in Stallard's room, uh, at the exact same time. And that will make it so that instead of Link flying towards the stall troop, uh, the stall troop will fly towards him. And with the proper setup, we can get the stall troop into a corner on phase two of the trick, I will stand in a very specific position again and use that salt troop to clip into a wall. And then in phase three, I will um, stand in a very specific spe uh, position again, or position, to just, you know, for brevity, um, and use a bomb to boost out of bounds uh, with the stall troop there. All of this is very precise, and uh, overall it can save up to about a minute 40 over just fighting Stallard but it is quite difficult. So I will be muting for the duration of the trick. I'm going to need a metronome for this. Um, enjoy. Feel free to talk. I'll have audio off. I think I'll just let the gameplay speak for itself during this bit. Oh, and by the way, if I fail it, I'm going to void and try again. So if you see me voiding, that's why.
saying it is an incredibly precise trick is an understatement. And there are very, like, a lot of things that can affect Link's angle, like Link uh, turning around like that. You can see him doing a bunch of 180s. will just slightly affect the angle that he has. Might not look like it, but it will. I can second in my very limited experience, but we did try and do it 2P1C last week, and I didn't even understand what was going on, and I was pressing the buttons. It's crazy. <laughs> Almost got the cad. Well, got the cad, but not having him fall in the right position. Very close. You know, normally the claw shot, you pull yourself towards entities. But in this example, it's the other way around with the, the claw shot active replacement being the exact opposite. You pull entities towards yourself. Being low on health there, just to decided to just get some hearts and void and set it up again. It's a bit awkward being on one health because Link has that sort of animation where he pants, then pants. Everything is harder in a relay, I suppose. I'll get it eventually, probably. There we go. Very nice. First part of the trick. That was the cat, now it's the claw shot uh, L slide. Now the third phase, final part of the trick, the bomb boost. Very nice, excellent. I would clap, but it was going to mess with my microphone. Well. It still saves so much time that failing it a few times is not that big of a deal if you get it. Yeah, that was a pretty strange fail case. That fail case is um, related to having a bad notch angle, and I don't have one of those, so... Yeah, there is quite a detailed uh, description of the trick on ZSR that uh, ours truly wrote um, 
and it's really good for debugging what goes wrong with the trick. Because, yeah, there can be a lot of things that can go wrong. But really cool to get it in, you know, especially like a marathon or a race setting, like just showing showing it off, it's quite the yeah, amazing trick. You know, being Having a trick deemed TAS only and then suddenly being uh, RTA viable, it's quite crazy, to say the least. Have we got time to sneak in a little celebratory donation there? Yes, sure. Wonderful. So this one comes from Renegade Boss and it's for a massive $60. Um, so that takes us over our objective for today. So Renegade says, not paying the Poe one toll? I got you. No big deal. So if you don't perform a Stellar Skip, then um, you would have to zoom in all the way on the map to warp if you choose to skip Racing the Mirror. Uh, you skip Racing the Mirror anyway. Right here, this is Temple of Time Skip, and just like that, it's it's so trivial. Uh, it's not hard to do. As long as you know what to do, then it's one of the easiest tricks to learn in the run, but it saves so much time. Uh, it's funny how trivial it is to, to perform and to do, like, it doesn't look super flashy, but that does skip a whole dungeon and, and some more. But yes, after Arbutus Grounds, there's the mirror that we can race to get the mirror shard, but uh, as long as we have the warp there, that's fine in terms of progression. So, but skipping racing the mirror means that you, if you want to warp, you need to zoom all the way in and then press Z to enable warps. Because otherwise Midnight would say, hey, you can't warp, you gotta raise the mirror. But they just didn't have a check for you zooming in all the way to the map and then pressing Z to enable warping. But performing Stellar Skip uh, makes it so you don't need to do that, so you can just warp normally. It's quite an interesting side effect. And this is where the 300 rupees that we've been collecting steadily over the run comes into play. Fire will fix this cannon so we can gain access to the city in the sky. So yeah, he transformed into Wolf to clip um, in between the statue and the wall in the Sanctuary to just skip past it. Normally you would use the Dominion Rod, uh, the powered up Dominion Rod after a little bit of a quest to uh, to move it out of the way. Also Shad, a character in, in there, would, uh, uh, would play a part as well. And it's just quite a lengthy part of uh, gaining access to, um, to City in the Sky normally. But just a simple clip and you skip all of that, it's very convenient. City in the Sky is a very flashy dungeon. Uh, there's a lot of void planes, so you'll see uh, boomerang long jump attacks all over the place. It's also very cool to see fast aiming, uh, like latching onto claw shot grates. Um, everything will be very smooth and fast, and it's very a very satisfying dungeon to watch and play. There is a water bomb chest in this pool, so if you are low on water bombs from a bad Morphield fight, you could replenish here. Because you do I need mean, it later when we fight Zant. But Beast only used one bomb, so he's very good on that. Yeah, that's one thing I've got going for me at this point. I've got plenty of bombs. Oh, well, yeah, you use one for Stellar Skip as well. But yeah. yeah. One, two for the Stalfos. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> I'm just complete Commentator just completely blanking in the booth here. So the wind there can blow instantly, uh, or it can blow after a while, so that's just RNG, what kind of cycle you get. And that cycle will sort of persist through the dungeon, so the next time you're outside, it will continue where it left off. So here is a void, so we can just throw the boomerang over this void. To get a long jump attack, skipping using the Uku, uh, and or claw shot in this part. Can also do some precise jump attacks. Okay, so right here Beast will turn into Wolf and then interact with this door from as far away as possible. And the reason why he does that is because he won't hit a trigger if he opens the door this way. That would normally uh, cause the fans at the ceiling of this room to spin. Uh, it has something to do with Wolfling's Collision, how it's 
at the back of Wolflink and not at the front. So Human Link wouldn't be able to do it, but Wolflink can open that door from as far away as possible and avoid the trigger. So the fans don't spin, they stay off, so we can claw shot some vines later to gain access to that part of the dungeon much earlier than we're supposed to. Known as Early Boss Key, which saves, I believe, something like two and a half minutes. It was quite, quite a big discovery when it was found in... Gosh, I think it was 2015-ish, around that time. It was still a while ago, but uh, quite a big discovery of, uh, after having all discovered such things as Temple of Time Skip and Early Master Sword. And it made it a lot easier to learn this dungeon because you would skip a lot of rooms. So if you started learning this game like roughly 10 years ago, you would have to learn the second half of City that you would see um, the category, categories such as 100% do because there are things you gotta collect in those uh, rooms. And it's like right at this point, you can, after getting the double claw shot, you can go below here and keep going with a lot of claw shotting. And there's just much more to learn, but that glitch uh, skips all of that. So, Beast got a small key, and there's a cutscene here on the bridge where Argorak destroys the whole bridge, but it's possible to skip that cutscene with some precise movement. There's a couple of ways you can do it. He's probably going to go for the side hop method and then running along the edge, which is a little bit faster than using the P hat to aid him. And, oh, that can happen very easily as the wind, like the, the camera changes, uh, and uh, the wind can, the wind cycle also the, plays a part in this trick. Yeah, he's going to play it safe and just wait here for the wind to blow. A smart move. So he wants to side up onto that little broken piece of the wall there, and then just shimmy his way around here, avoiding the trigger. That would normally be in front of the, roughly in front of the door. But the game really wants you to watch, watch that cutscene. So if you save warp uh, and load the file again, you will be placed back at the room where he just got the small key. Because the game wants you to be able to hit that trigger. And normally, like, it, it, they they didn't think it was possible to skip it in the way Beast just did, so you would hit it normally. So it allows for a faster sort of... Because, like, save warping saves time in general. It saves backtracking. But save warping to that location is also faster than uh, a very nice Beast killing it with a spinner. That is uh, something I see the task to. Uh, I learned that one from Simi for ILs. That one is, it's a much more difficult than just using the sword, but it looks really cool and saves a bit of time. Yeah, so he, when he save warps later, he will spawn back at that chest, which will just make, make, make the backtracking a bit better. But the, the trigger will then be gone, actually, so he doesn't have to avoid it the second time. And it is technically possible to skip the small key by <laughs> doing something called sit in the sky small key skip, which Beast has done one variant of uh, quite kind of recently for ILs, which is just crazy. Um, but yeah, both methods being crazy, but the the one that has currently has a bounty by gymnast uh, being just incredibly difficult. Nobody has done it yet. So if you want, I I think it is a hundred dollars up for grabs if you get it. Might be more. I don't remember. So, plenty of ways to do this room. Uh, Beast doing it the fastest because, you know, we like to go fast. But you can use the boomerang uh, a lot more instead of jumping over those gaps and doing a jump slash if you want to. One frame roll. And then he's going to use the claw shot to scare the enemies there so they raise their shield up, which will make them fall as they're right on the edge. This dungeon is also very, like, action packed, sort of like Snow Peak, but there are some cutscenes like this that give you a little bit of a breather. It's also a bit longer. So the next room has a trick called Uku Jump, and it allows you to skip turning on uh, like a switch that you pull from the ceiling. If you jump off with an Uku um, with a certain angle, and by holding target when you jump off, you increase your the leniency for the jump by a whole lot. So Wright is going to tap target, and just that target press makes it so he can jump off with a much wider range of angles. Uh, back in the day, we didn't know that that was a thing, so we had to get a pretty precise angle for the jump off there. But the target makes it a lot more lenient, which is very nice. Unfortunately, I would usually jump straight down to our Alphos without <clears throat> without using the Yuku, but I don't have enough health, as I avoided out earlier. Yeah, I was just about to say, Beast likes to do that jump slash strat, which was actually used a lot more back in the day. But then, at one point, we just kind of switched to using the Yuku. 
I guess that because we skip, uh, we started to skip more and more hard containers, like Lake Bud uh, and um, Arbiter's Grounds hard containers. So here is nice one frame uh, drop off there to fall during the cutscene. Saves a little bit of time. Beast will do Arialfo skip, which is a very precise trick that um, involves using a certain setup to get into position and then targeting the the, the target, claw shot target. And then that was fast. Oh wow. Very nice. That usually takes a bit longer, but hopefully it's still within before the miniboss attacks him. But that was super fast. So you can just uh, claw shot the target there and just skip the fight entirely. And the fight is actually lengthier than... Uh, like It does have a, a nice length to it, so it, skipping it does save a, a nice amount of time. So save warping, because he still didn't hit the Argorok cutscene there uh, by the bridge, he will spawn by the chest where he got the first small key. And it makes it so you can get back to the main room much quicker. Or a little bit quicker. But this time, the the cutscene trigger is gone. So he doesn't have to avoid it this time. He can just follow the main path and then claw shot up onto the vines in the top right there. And I believe the reason being that having double claw shots here means that you can use the P-hats to get across, so I guess the game doesn't force you to... There's no point in playing the cutscene there. And then Leroy can hit him. Oh, there's an enemy that charges at him there, but... Beast not doing the, 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 the Bewilder Beast and uh, going back down the vines uh, repeatedly. Very nice. I figure I've lost enough time this run. <laughs> Here is a precise claw shot onto the vines, so you can uh, keep really? a pretty big portion of this uh, outside area, actually. You're supposed to use the ropes there as wolf to uh, go all the way around, but there's like... A party can claw shot on the vines there that skips it. it skips pretty much Are you kidding me? <laughs> I got the dinosaur. Oh, hitting! That's really good, though. I hope that didn't get the other one involved. I don't wow, think this sucks. Not. Where am I? Yeah, so Dynalphos having armor makes them a bit tougher to kill than normal Lizalphos. Um, best way to kill them being seven slashes and then uh, a quick spin. But if you if you knock them over, they will just instantly get back up, as opposed to most enemies. Doing a long jump attack there by having the boomerang be above the platform, and the platform being higher ground makes it so you do get the long jump. This area is very laggy, but as soon as you open the, the chest, you're fine. Like after getting the key. Uh, I'm used to ILs. I would normally equip spinner there. Oh yeah, I also forgot. I mentioned it before it happened, but uh, you know that fan not spinning that he just went through. So he was able to claw shot that in the main room after double claw shots, and that was because he avoided that trigger at the start. So if the fan was spinning, he would have to take a different, a whole different route through the dungeon to get to that part where the big key was. Now, normally these fans are supposed to spin, but by claw shotting it uh, at the top here, you can actually climb up onto the fan, and then using, you guessed it, boomerang long jump attacks, you can do a cool double LGA. And you don't need to do double, but it's fast and cool. Ah, oh, unfortunate. Yeah, it, it, you land like, you can either land right on the railing, or just slightly past it, uh, or, or you can just, just miss it like we saw now. But no big deal, we'll just retry. Uh, it's very flashy you skip skipping turning on these fans. The Wii version cannot do this uh, this way because the uh, boomerang long jump attacks don't work quite the same way. Uh, you, you just don't get the property of that long jump. There we go, very nice. So that skips turning on the fans and just having the whole sequence where you stay out, claw shot onto a fan and just waiting for them to spin around and claw shot the next one and the next one and the next one. So flashy and fast. And in this room, there's a cycle that, you know, some fans are spinning, some are not. You will activate this fan right now. You can see some fans in the background are spinning. And ideally, you want to sort of be on the, the earliest cycle possible. Well, <laughs> there is one that is possible and seen sometimes in ILs and definitely in the task, but, you know, reasonably fast. Uh, re reasonably early cycle. Which requires a lot of precise claw shot aims. And you'll see him do instant aim, which is to 
hold the control stick direction, press the button for a claw shot, and then tap target. And that will make it so you instantly aim it to first person. Very nice, you just barely made that. Uh, oh, and the blind claw shot onto the, the, the switch as well, very nice. Yeah, so making it onto that fan is the, the hard part there. And got the, the thing where it link looks towards the door, very nice. If you like claw shot uh, early on onto that target, you can make it so Link is facing the door, otherwise he will be not facing it, and you can just instantly roll towards it. You saw Link's shield there for one frame. Beast was holding target, trying to get a target roll in that one frame window. Yeah, in between the two cutscenes. This is Rob shot. Very nice Rob shot. Uh, Beast will go over to one of the pillars here, and he will manipulate Argrox so he does not do his uh, claw attack. If you stand in the middle, he will charge at you with its claws, but you want him to just kind of go into the middle with uh, without an attack, so you can see so will idle and you can claw shot its tail. If you do a frame perfect claw onto his tail, he will soft lock the game. So <laughs> I'm glad that first one missed because <laughs> it was looking kind of close in that sense. After this cutscene, Beast will turn around and then instantly aim with the claw shot, getting onto a pillar, which will give him some height, and then he will quickly aim again so he can re-grab the tail before Argrak flies away. Very nice. It's like a quick cycle. And this cutscene is actually longer than the Argrak death cutscene. So if there are any donations or anything, then this will be a nice time to read them. So, a lot of years ago, uh, a, a fun little moment of TP history when SVA was running this game, missed those days, he found some quite some useful stuff. He found that if you void out at the beginning of this second phase, um, the fight will just be a little bit quicker. Argorak will get into the position he's supposed to. Like when you reload this area, he will be a lot lower. Saving just a few seconds, but it's just small things like that are pretty cool. He's purposely jumping off the arena to save some time. And in this fight, we'll see Flame Skip. So, Flame Skip is. So we'll see it right here. I'm gonna wait for the sound of Argrok breathing. And then putting on Iron Boots, we're falling down with the P hat. And then the distance there, being like low and then closer to the next one, makes it so Argrok just stops breathing fire, cancel his flame attack, and he just stays there uh, in a vulnerable state. So, you can quickly attack him. And we'll see that for cycle one and two being exactly the same. But on the third cycle, we'll see a slight variant of it, because Argrok will uh, do the attack a little bit differently. Like, he will do the first one, and then he will uh, juke you and turn around and do it on the other side of the arena. But we will account for that. So once more, we have Flame Skip, bringing the Piat down with Iron Boots, Claw Shotting, and then that instantly cancels the flame. Just a few more Piats to Claw Shot so we can go around him and target onto his back. The claw shot there, I was actually quite far away from the the target, but it's kind of it's quite lenient. If you just look at if you look really closely to where the claw shot is going onto its back, it should miss, but it does snap onto its back. Luckily, it's actually possible to be too fast here, uh, so you don't want to be like get to this position uh, too too quickly. Otherwise, you will. He will do a preemptive, uh, like he will do the flame attack much earlier than he's supposed to. So as soon as the flame passes that P hat, it's gonna put on iron boots, it's gonna sink down. Argrek will do the turnaround, the juke, and then if it takes off iron boots, it will cancel the flame, and then claw shot onto his back. Very nice fight.
appears to be some buffers on the stream. Hopefully it fixes itself soon. Seems to be on Twitch's end. So, City in the Sky um, being the last dungeon of the mirror quest, um, the game only checks for this mirror shard when it comes to uh, letting you gain ac access into Palace of Twilight. So we don't have any other mirror shards. We um, haven't even raised the mirror after Arbor's Grounds. We just have the warp portal there. But as far as the game's concerned, it only checks for this because it believes that you're not supposed to be able to get the last one of these mirror shards without having the previous ones. So it's very fortunate for us because we can just get this one from City and then go straight back to the mirror chamber and gain access, uh, gain access to Palace of Twilight. Uh, it, you take a lot of damage in Palace of Twilight uh, intentionally as well, so you definitely want to grab this heart container. There's also quite a big fall coming after leaving this dungeon. If you have Iron Boots equipped, when you leave City in the Sky, you will fall much faster. So you can do a jump slash to land onto the bridge. And that will deal some damage, but it will save you a lot of time, because otherwise you would have fallen into the water in Lake Hylia. Just gonna take on Iron Boots, claw shot here, skip the cutscene. And then he has a, I believe this is a four frame window to do a jump slash. And the first possible frame is quite nice to get because then you don't hit the fence. That was the first frame, very nice. And so you can just instantly warp to the mirror chamber. Had he not, had he jump slashed on frame five or later or not had iron boots on, he would have landed in the water there and then had to swim to the surface. So that saves a nice chunk of time. So here, the mirror will just magically appear, as if we had raised the uh, the mirror, which we skipped. And skipping some cutscenes, and now we have access to Palace of Twilight. Because the game is like, well, you have the last mirror shard. Sure, let's say you have all of them. You must have all of them. Here you go, here's your access. And Palace of Twilight isn't really all that uh, glitchy, like not that many sequence breaks or anything. It's very pretty linear. Uh, but there are still lots of cool tricks. Um, each room has something unique to it. Uh, Beast might even go for uh, the key super jump at the second half, just for trying it once for for the fans. Uh, it is faster, but very difficult to do. I'll or, consider it. I consider lost like a, a minute and a half to trying it yesterday. Dang. Very RNG heavy. Yeah. As and it only saved earlier. a maximum of like two seconds. Yeah, that's the unfortunate thing. Very nice. You can hit that mask twice by uh, releasing a midnight charge being really close to the mask and the animation being so long that it, like your, your hurt box is out and you hit him twice as you're like doing that, that sort of straight jump up as you're so close to him. And there are like three different ways you can kill that mask, but that was the fastest way. Lots of small things, like putting on the iron boots after releasing that um, that claw shot target to fall faster, turn into wolf, gotta go be wolf anyway. Mask spawned pretty far away, but that's no big deal. Nice, he makes it to the chest um, before the cutscene plays, so you can just press A to open right away. Depending on where that mask spawns, you can be further away from the chest and have to like make it to the chest sort of blindly because the camera you get here will be on the side as you can see right now. But since he was already right there, you can just press A to open. And fixing that, uh, not super easy, but um, C up and C down can be a quick way to fix a, a camera that's like delayed like that. Now the miniboss in this dungeon is split into two. So Phantom Zant 1 and Phantom Zant 2. Um, there is, there are consistent ways to to do the fight. First discovered was the four cycle, but then it was discovered a three cycle. That's consistent, which beast will go, will will go, will do. Uh, attacking him once with just a small damage hit, and then doing some quick spins. A couple of quick spins. Second cycle and the last cycle, he will do one additional quick spin. Very nice. So in this fight, he could teleport around. He could spawn enemies. He could attack. It could be quite of an annoying fight. So it's really nice to be able to 
reach him before he's able to do any of the, his attacks. And um, having a consistent cycle like that is very nice when the fight is otherwise so annoying. Throwing the soul into that hole during the cutscene, it keeps rolling in the cutscene. There's a sound effect you just heard. Uh, the stairs are now activated. The monsters have gone down the stairs. It's like it's all very planned. It might not look like a lot was happening, but there's a lot of small things like that in Palace that a lot of thought going into each room, even though it doesn't look like always super flashy. And Palace is why they're being famous for being like a noob killer. If you don't, if you are new to the game and you don't really pal uh, practice Palace, then the game will sure to punish you for that. Yeah, there's a lot of time you can lose in this dungeon. And it's tempting for new runners to not really worry about it because you're kind of just playing the dungeon as intended, partially. But there are just so many opportunities to die and otherwise lose time. That l slide right there prevents the enemies from spawning. There will be a bunch of Twilight Vermins that spawn from the ceiling, and uh, doing an l slide there just bypasses it. It's very nice. Because they can hit you and hit the... Like, if you take damage, you lose the ball. And, uh, it can be very difficult to pick up the ball while there are a bunch of vermins around, so you kill them, pick it up again, and accept the 5 second time loss. But that L slide just prevents them from spawning, so quite, quite nice keeping annoying enemies like that. So we need two of these souls to be placed into these slots uh, for the first part of Palace. As you can see, the soul restores the... Like it kind of lifts the curse on the Twilight people. The Twilight. He's going to go for an LJ on the platform here. Saves so saving a little bit of time over being just on the edge normally. Because you can jump right away and you just barely land on the edge. This is a uh, coined stupid room. Uh, a lot of things can go wrong here. <laughs> so hopefully all goes well, but there are like... Like, instantly, the keys here can hit you while you're claw-shutting onto the target. So it can, it can be a bad room right away if he's unlucky. And then you have this Zant Mask here. And he's going to delay jumping onto this platform on purpose so that the, uh, the Zant Mask spawns late, aligning with the platforms better. Goes for an auto-spin. The first one didn't hit, but he still has enough time to do a second quick spin. Very nice. If you don't kill that mask in time, he will teleport and at a random spot in the room. And uh, if you're just sort of hopping back on the platforms, predicting where it's going to be, he could just spawn instantly as you're hopping in between two platforms and just make you fall down. And falling down this that the fog you see right in front of you right there that is also in the previous room, which forces you into Wolf Link, which we'll see right now. So it, it's, it's quite a lot of stuff that can go wrong in the previous room. Throwing the Gale Boom right there to stun the Shadow Beasts so they line up nicely. And then killing all of these three masks in one continuous minute charge. We'll get the last one, but one quick attack at 10 will finish him off. Claw shutting onto this target before the cutscene plays. Very nice. Now he will do instant aim again, which was control stick, the button for the claw, and then target, which makes it so you can quickly aim. And the blind shot that he almost got would've been cool. Getting a small key so he can progress to the next room. And then you can either claw shot the, um, the target there, or you can do an LGA, which is a little bit faster. But if, the, if you mess up that LGA, you land in the fog, get turned into wolf. So lots of like small, annoying time losses like that if things go wrong. I.e. practicing palace is a good idea, especially if you're new. So this fight is just the same as last time, um, except I believe in, in the first one he spawns enemies, but this one he will do an attack instead. I think he still can spawn enemies, but it's not his default attack. But as far as the consistent 3 cycle goes, it's uh, exactly the same. And whether you do a clockwise or a counterclockwise quick spin doesn't matter. Gotta do some kind of quick spin though. Oh nice, then he spawned in the middle too. Yeah, so the amount of health that he has, um, the, the reason why we do it in such a specific way using like the specific attacks is so that his health doesn't go into a pool where we don't want it 
to be. Otherwise, you would just teleport around randomly if your health is too low. So be messing up one quick spin there, but just having that awareness of just doing a regular slash to, to not uh, take too much health off of him. And then also fortunately getting the center spawn, which is very nice. Yeah, so this time you want to drop it and then roll during the cutscene and then even do a roll stab to go a little bit further. Pressing B during a roll. So roll stab. Adds a little bit more distance to your roll at the end of it. Only really beneficial if you can't immediately roll again, like if there's something holding you up, like a cutscene. This is pretty hard, he needs to hold forward. Let's see if he can do it. Whew. Nice, good job. I practiced that one for hours. <laughs> also on the L slide here. Setting a little bit of time. Getting closer to the door, closer to the door as you're um, claw shotting the soul. Stupid room on the way back is uh, much, much easier. One more time. Um, <laughs> it's still possible to fall off, though. Oh, nice. You didn't get a um, hop in between those two platforms. That was nice. It's going off at just the right time. Yeah, these keys can uh, can also hit you, so usually we'll see runners try to target them or like, stun them with a the boomerang. Just to keep them occupied. Uh, that's what's called a commentator's curse. There's a one frame input where Beast can either use the boomerang, use the claw shot, or like put it in his hand, or throw the soul, or draw his sword. It's like four different possible things. He might mash all buttons or just L and A. So right there, like in between those two cutscenes, basically, to so drop the soul so you can just roll to this platform and then grab it later with the claw shot, just saving a little bit of extra time. And then he will jump off the map, <laughs> but the cutscene brings him back in, so... This will power up the Master Sword so we can defeat Ganon with it. Or defeat... I guess Zant is not possible to be defeated without this. Lore-wise. Yeah, commonly known as the Butter Sword, as it, uh, it's very yellow and bright. Very shiny. Beast might attempt key super jump just once for the fans, otherwise... Okay, alright. I can take a hint. <laughs> Reverse psychology working as intended. Just Succumbing to the peer pressure. Nice. This is why we don't go for key super jump. There we go. <laughs> this is why we don't go for key oh, super jump. Oh, so close. So close. But you saw what he was uh, attempting to do there. Skipping this, this little puzzle by just using the keys to super jump up to that platform. Very flashy, barely saves time. Classic TPKs. Oh, rolls that might have been needed. Yep. <laughs> no big deal. This room also has an LJ that I absolutely hate. It is not this one. This one is very chill. But the one on the uh, going to the next part of the of the room. Can uh, sometimes not work depending on like how the boomerang is out of bounds. Um... So right there, he uh, did a spin attack onto those souls, and then immediately left the platform so that it would stay lit. So the next time he goes there, it's ready for him to uh, for the platform to rise up. Yeah, some LJs in this game aren't as consistent as others. This one being one of them, where. You know, it's it's not too bad, but it, it could go wrong if uh, the boomerang doesn't behave the way you want it to. So you see Beast uh, using the item wheel there to buffer it, which is sometimes... What you see sometimes for when people do 
LJs that aren't like 100% consistent, basically. Now there are two routes for this outside area. You could either go here right away or you can <laughs> go and get the big key, the boss key. Uh, this is a little bit faster and looks a lot cooler as well. So speed points and swag points. It's a long uh, platform right over to this uh, Zant mask over here. We need to defeat all the Zant masks in the area to spawn a chest with a small key. This one is all out here by itself. Cheeky little LGA right here to uh, save a little bit of time, just approaching the mask a bit quicker. And then voiding out here to... Um... <laughs> We're doing a frame-perfect drop so you yeah. get back on the, on the ledge. It is possible to uh, do that without voiding out. But it is a very, very precise LJ that barely saves time. You could see it in ILs, maybe, but not even that most of the time. So some fast claw shots here to get the boss key. And now he's going to... As long as you either slash once or roll right before going into this uh, Fog of Shadow, then you won't turn into Wolf. Then do a cool uh, auto spin right there. Almost dying, but no big deal, we're, we're alive. Killing those ant masks, getting a lot of uh, hit lag, hitting a bunch of enemies. And he might have gotten some hearts to spawn by one of those cargo rocks or the ant mask, we'll see in a second. Nope, just nope, rupees. Just, just a green rupee. Yeah, rupees are no longer needed at this point in the run, it was just to get the seed in the sky. So any rupees obtained after uh, fixing, the canning, fixing the cannon is just for show. Unfortunately, entering this room on half a heart means that my life is in the mercy of the Baba. Right, yes. Oh boy. So um, there is a Deku Baba up on the platform here that can hit him, even though his aim can uh, be... <laughs> what? Oh, nice. <laughs> the Shadow Beast hitting you into the barrier. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> Never done that one before. Oh, nice. There is a cycle here that he was trying to make before that, whatever that was. <laughs> that never happens, but um, yeah, early platform is what the cycle is, is called. Hey, the Baba decided not to kill me. How nice. Nice. If you roll off an edge in this game uh, and then release all inputs, Link will grab the edge. So that's a safe way of grabbing the edge that even though you have a lot of speed going onto the the edge, then you'll be fine. As long as the ledge is crabable. Drop down auto spin. Find the other way to, to kill the mask efficiently while staying like having a good angle with this. And then he's gonna make this cycle just fine. <laughs> Well, commentator's curse. Press the A button, like, probably one frame too early to let go of the target on the wall. Maybe I should just say, oh, Beast is gonna fail this. So he gets a first try. That's the thing. A couple of different LJs you can do here. Either try getting there or a little bit further right. Doesn't really matter as long as the boomerang is... Uh, over those stairs there, which will be higher ground, so you get the LJ. Just saving a little bit of time on the platform ride. So Beast is very low on health, but it's no big deal because there's a lot of Shadow Beasts that will fall from the ceiling now, and they they mostly drop hearts. Like they, they It's rare for them to not drop hearts. just had to say something, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Alright, so, uh, Beast will fail the upcoming uh, one <laughs> cycle for uh, Gorm Gormine's uh, Zant phase.
So here we have Usurper Zanto, or Zant in English. And it's basically a boss rush sort of thing where you revisit places you've been before. Some places where we haven't been. This is the, the, the this is the Diababa boss fight, which we never faced, but we did go into the Forest Temple. Zant's health is very interesting. Um, for the most part, you just want the end hit of a combo attack to hit him, as that will advance him into the next cycle or phase, depending on what it is. But here we have the Dangoro fight, which is the mini boss of Goro Mines, a dungeon we didn't even visit. Dang, unfortunate. That, that was an attempt of a one cycle, which is very precise. Uh, saves just that last little bit here where he jumps around and teleports. That was an additional teleport, that's unfortunate. And now we have a underwater section with a, a repeat of more fuel. So this is why we still need to have water bombs since we don't have the Zora armor and we need we need a way to refill our air. And he's also dancing. a very important trick here, the uh, Link suit dance. Very important. Nope. In this case, not the fish suit dance, but the uh, hero's clothes mm. dance. You attack very slowly underwater. But Beast did a um, he did a left, right, up and down, or he might have actually done right, left, up, down, didn't pay full attention, but that sequence of attacks which will make it so that he gets to an end combo attack sooner than just pressing B normally or just doing stabs, because uh, he wants the animation to finish as soon as possible. Here Zant will always spawn in the one that's furthest away from you, which is why he went over there and started swimming towards the, uh, the Zant Marine if you will, um, at the time that he did, so he will slash in side to side directions and then up and down so he can have that combo end as soon as possible. But it depends on the camera angle that you have, so having a bit of a side camera angle there made that a bit awkward. The Uk miniboss fight, we did see this. So a big hit being a jump attack and then a combo, and now I can just do an auto spin to finish him off. The ball and chain can be used instead of bonking the, the pillars to knock him down. And now we have the Blizzetta phase. This is the boss of Snow Peak Ruins, which we did not see, but this is the sole reason why we got the ball and chain. Because there's no way to stun Zant right there, except using the ball and chain. That we know of. Should probably be a bounty on this, to be honest. Uh, if you're a glitch hunter and are bored, then this one is highly requested. There might be a bounty, actually. There is one TP bounty. And there was, at least. I don't know if it was this one. Yeah, Zant is invulnerable at the start of this, but once he gets tiny enough, you can hit him. And now, finally, we have the last phase, which is outside of Hyrule Castle. Shoutouts to SVA for an amazing strategy for this fight. Again, just prioritizing end hit of combo attacks as they advance into the next cycle. Awesome, textbook. Nicely done. That fight can be very difficult, especially if you're new to the game. Uh, this is where you where you see people struggle if they haven't practiced it, because it is quite a difficult fight casually. He uh, attacks very rapidly, and uh, it can get very chaotic very quickly. The sole nature of the character being very chaotic, and it really shows in this fight. And that is Palace of Twilight. So now all we have to do is go to Hyrule Castle and beat the game. It is slightly faster to turn wolf, uh, you're, like to do it yourself. Well, well, you don't, you, you don't get tur uh, forced turned into a wolf, but turning wolf there makes it so Midna can instantly talk to you as she's on your back. If she wasn't on your back, like if you were a human link, she would pop out from your shadow, which has an animation to it. So, and since you warp anyway, this is where the anyway part comes in. Since you warp anyway to Castle Town, and you'll be transformed into a wolf when you warp, and that's why it's faster to turn into a wolf right away after leaving, at the beginning of leaving Palace.
This is the second and final mailman skip. So the mailman still really wants to deliver, deliver letters to us, but we're not too interested in reading them. So we're going to do an LGA with a boomerang here, and it skips the <laughs> Or with the ball and chain, either one. Or with the ball and chain. He's very close to the trigger. The ball and chain moved him a little bit there, but still fine. On the Wii version, I believe Wii 1.0, might be wrong about that, but the trigger is much, much smaller, so you can just do a regular jump attack with target and A to jump over it. So that's very convenient, considering that the Wii version can't make use of the boomerang long jump attacks. Beast will now attempt the most important trick in the whole run, which is bonking into the loading zone here for a bunch of style points. The style points are just off the charts on this one. Excellent, excellent. This is a almost two minute cutscene, 152 if I remember correctly. So if there are any don donations, then this would be a perfect time to read them. Or if anyone has any potatoes to bake, this would be the perfect time for that as well. That too. Even better than a baked potato. I have a donation from Starlord, like actual Starlord himself. And wow. he sent $20. And do you know what he said to you, Beast? What do you say? He's been really kind. He said, thank you for sparing my life. Boots. <laughs> Sweet, sweet of him to thank me for that. Yeah. So, you know, the attempts paid off. He really appreciated it. Thanks, buddy. I promise I won't kill you again until my next hundo run. <laughs> I'll pass it on. I'll pass it on. I'll make sure he gets the message. But I can also say that the Rejects and Friends main stage is coming back this summer in 2023. We thought we'd only be around maybe one or two events just for a bit of fun, but thanks to all you amazing viewers and donators, we're proud to say future events are coming and that we're here to stay at least for a while, as long as you'll have us. So just wanted to say very quick thank you for supporting us. We're having a blast providing all this content for you and obviously raising so much money for such a great cause. So massive pat on the back team. Thank you very much. Back to you, Beast and Sky. I, I'm finished. <laughs> Thanks, H. <laughs> Hope everybody is stretched, maybe hydrated during that cutscene. Mm. All smart things to do. I'm hydrating now. So that was the barrier being broken by Midna. Um, the Wind Waker having barrier skip in both the, the original and HD remake. Uh, Twilight Princess not having barrier skip yet. Um, it has been theorized and we have seen it done with cheats, um, but there's no feasible way of, of doing it. It's like a certain, I believe, actor you need to corrupt and just getting that is um, getting to that act actor is um, the tricky part. Um, this is where I would normally say this is the standstill and do nothing strat, the best Christmas present uh, from Fino in 2013, but Beast decided to actually move during that very rudely. Um, Sorry. You can just pull out a water bomb and just stand still and uh, the fight is over just like that. So the barriers here, they don't spawn instantly, so if you skip the cutscene and just roll away then you can avoid it just like that. Very convenient. Otherwise it will be... Uh, like a big horde of enemies got to fight for all and of Everyone them. thinks TP doesn't have barrier skip. Yeah, exactly. There you go. And it is possible to skip the first one there where he used the water bomb, but it is another case of something that is really difficult, uh, precise, uh, barely saves time. One cycle there being possible, both with and without Great Spin. Uh, much easier with the Great Spin, but it is just so precise that, and again, barely saving time that you just you, st you step away, allow King Boblin to swing once and then go at him again. And it being important to use counterclockwise quick spin on King Boblin as he takes an additional hit versus clockwise quick spins. That's a really difference in this game. Beast will attempt a backflip, one frame input to skip a midna text. This is called sick flip, or meme flip also. Fortunately, didn't get it. Uh, save warping here still is, you know, it, it is faster to backtrack by like a second maybe, but it's like I don't think 
I don't know if anyone's done like proper testing on it. It's just like, I, I did time it for myself and it was exactly equal. It yeah. was like a frame or two apart and it's not possible to fail save warping. Exactly. Well, <laughs> I've, I've, I have failed save warping and going to lake by myself, so... Oh, it no. It's possible to do the reset combo before you actually hit A to save. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's, you know, you're right. I should have thought before I spoke. So here's another barrier skip. Uh, not the one we would ideally want to skip in the grand scheme of things, but nonetheless, quite a long fight uh, otherwise. And also a big thing is that if you defeat all the enemies in this room, the lights turn on and... This being a GameCube game, it makes the frame rate uh, drop a little bit. Additionally, too, of course, being slower than just skipping it. I saw him equip the ball and chain there. We're going to use the ball and chain to um, defeat this uh, Dark Knight really quickly after his armor is off. Another example of the ball and chain being very beneficial for combat, dealing lots of damage. Or most things. Very nice. And then just aiming somewhere over in this direction, it's actually quite lenient where you aim. Uh, you're just setting yourself up for an instant boomerang throw out this cutscene, so you just spam the button for it and then just roll over here and do some equips and uh, you've uh, extinguished the flame on the torch there. Here's the final use of the lantern. Yep, being too far away there is actually not that good. Uh, so missing once is fine, but missing twice it will actually make the first torch uh, go out, which would happen in my last DSR race. So, oh, oh no. Yeah. <clears throat> so bombs being very effective to take out certain enemies like the Nalfos here. So it's going to lure them over. They, they're not sure if it's a bomb or not. They're not quite sure. They need to examine it further, but they don't have enough time before the bomb explodes and they die. So it's quite a funny exchange there where you see them go like, huh, wait, is that a bomb? No, it's not, that's not a bomb. That's a bomb. No, it, and then and they die. What a way to go. Ball and chain again for a quick fight here. Four hits and a swing. Excellent. The final small key of the run used to open up the, the door up up on this uh, up the slope, uh, which we can do right right away, but it would be a big time loss because we still need the boss key, which is right over here on top of this last wing. And here is another cutscene that is a little bit lengthy, showing some characters that we we have met some of them, but not all of them. Uh, some of them have showed up in cutscenes that we've just skipped. Saving Link from his his doom right there. Yep, that would have been the end of the game, which would have been yeah. faster. So yeah, actually, it's quite rude of them. What are you on about? You're lucky they were there. You could have ended your run right there. That's what I'm saying. We've gotten two fifty four. <laughs> Hello, strangers that we haven't really seen. I'm sure they'll play a big part in uh, the final fight, uh, dealing lots of additional damage to uh, the bosses, I'm sure. Surely. That's what friends are for, right? Yeah, if you're not, like, chipping lots of health uh, off of a boss, then what kind of friend are you? Beast will attempt to not bonk and void here, which can happen quite easily, in fact, as he will turn this corner. Uh, the blocks will fall. There are some blocks that are solid. Uh, there's like a path where the ghosts here show you which way to go if you turn on senses as wolf, but as long as you just keep going and keep rolling, then you'll be fine. The blocks uh, fall slowly enough that it's not necessary to follow the intended path. 
two slashes and a quick spin, which is the recipe for uh, defeating the, the Zalpos there. Or most other friends and foes, if you wish. And then here we have an excellent skip that was found super late by DF Dracon. Simply claw shutting the grate here. It pulls you towards it, you skip the cutscene. Not instantly, otherwise the barrier would hit you uh, and you'll get pushed back into the fight uh, the fight ring. But you just delayed skipping it a little bit and then you skip that whole fight. Uh, nobody tested that from 2006 to 2000. 16, I think it was. And that whole area is pretty laggy as well, so it saves more than just like a fight. It, it prevents a lot of... Uh, it prevents a laggy fight. There is one frame here we can crash the game, which is fun to do sometimes in races if uh, you don't care about finishing the run, but we do care about finishing the run this time, so we're not going to go for it. It's that when that text pops up that says uh, Ganon's uh, Puppet Zelda. If you were to bring up the item wheel on a specific frame, uh, same time as that text pops up, then uh, you'll oh, get a loud... No. Yeah, so ideally <clears throat> you want a 7 cycle from this boss. Uh, so far that's 2 attacks. Uh, you want to see a triangle... Uh, not triangle. <laughs> you definitely don't want to see a triangle. You want to see an electric ball on the first hit. That's the best way to start the fight off. So that attack right there. But unfortunately, we only saw it now on the third one. So, bad RNG. Uh, the record for the worst RNG, I believe, is 17 cycles. Yep. By a Wicked Clyde. It's pretty impressive. My worst is 12. I think that's my worst, too. Oh, well. So I think at least a 10 this time. It's the fifth, I believe. This is my, where you might see Twitch chat counting. Um, not all uh, cooperating, like some might be counting completely wrong. Yeah, it's a very tame fight. Um, her attacks aren't really dangerous at all. You just kind of dodge them very easily, like right here. And you look down onto the down to the floor because that attack that attack lags the game a little bit. That effect of the triangle spawning. So you don't want to look at it ideally. It's not a big uh, time loss, but if you roll back into the triangle at the very end, you can avoid damage, but still get the the menacing laugh that uh, from Gan. Oh, I didn't know that. Without taking damage, which piece we could attempt right here. Roll back. No. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I wasn't thinking. Yeah, because because if you take damage from it, then you will get that laugh from from the boss. Yeah, but yeah. It's possible to <laughs> get the laugh without taking damage if you. I think that, that was an play. 11? Yeah, not, not ideal. First part of the final boss fight over. Next is uh, Beast Ganon. Beast will... Uh, not Beast Ganon, but the Bewildered Beast will do a side mm -hmm. hop to dodge... Uh, and then throw out a ball and chain to dodge this attack. Stunning him in the process. Pulling out his sword and then doing a bunch of attacks. So a big hit and then four hits, and then a combo. And we're being very specific about the damage we deal, uh, for the same reason as with uh, Phantom Zant. So we want a three cycle here, and we want the last hit, the last cycle to be over with just a quick wolf attack. So you're safe in this corner. So you can just throw the ball and chain, stun him, he doesn't get you. And then same process, one big hit, four hits, and then a combo attack. A uh, big hit being either jump attack, uh, spin attack, uh, which goes a quick spin of course, a quickly charged spin attack, same thing, uh, or a roll stab also gives you quote unquote big damage. And that will make it so he will go, he will uh, appear out of the first por portal here. Otherwise it would be random which portal it comes out of, it would like be a, a sequence of portals that show up and eventually one portal will turn blue. But he just, in his health is so low that he just instantly goes out of the first one. And then using Midna to toss him aside, and one attack as Wolf Link will finish him off. 
and then you turn into human during this cutscene. Horseback Ganon being uh, uh, simple in theory, but every now and then you will get knocked off the horse if you're not careful, and it can mess up the, quite, uh, the fight quite badly. Hopefully it all goes well by dodging his attack here first. Here. You want him to swing his sword and then miss, so that he can be vulnerable, so that you can like chase after him. If he hasn't done his attack, then he will keep chasing you and um, be really annoying. The last hit of the quick spin uh, or spin attack, yeah, getting him there. Missing one arrow, but no big deal. And that's it. Three uh, spin attacks, and he's down. About so one we're, we're being done. Yeah, we're coming up on time shortly. There will be um, one final fight with uh, with Ganondorf here, and it's supposed to be this uh, this grand epic final fight, but because of a technique called. Uh, commonly referred to as auto-spin, which is doing a jump attack and then spinning the control stick while you're mid-air so that as soon as you touch the ground, you do a quick spin. You will instantly knock him over, advancing him to the next cycle. So there are three cycles, and uh, if all goes well, getting all three auto-spins right away, then the fight is like 11 seconds long. So uh, in these last few seconds, I want to apologize to my fellow relay racers. This is one of the most abysmal runs I've done in a while. Uh... And uh, please bring it back. <laughs> Hope you guys do better than I do. I think we've just cursed RAF forever now. We've done so much TP chaos. It just thinks that's what we do now. <laughs> Alright, time coming up right now. Time. It's TP. TP Thanks for having me. Please. Good luck on the rest. Good luck. So moving very swiftly on to Dope's Majora's Mask Run. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Alrighty, where to start? Well, welcome to Majora's Mask. Congrats, Beast. I'm sorry run didn't go as planned, but relay, you know, the curse. But uh, yeah, let's talk about all dungeons restricted. The f one one out of two category or game runs in this uh, relay that aren't any percent. And the main uh, thing is that when we originally did this with ZSR a while ago, all the mods kind of like had a meeting. It was kind of like a community decision to decide that any percent isn't really content worthy enough to um, you know, just showcase for relay. So ADR provides um. A much better contrast um, has a lot more content, a lot cooler tricks versus just what we now have is Ace and First Cycle and just getting three items and warping to the moon and killing Majora. Yeah, plus Ace any percent is a little bit uh, R RNG, like a lot RNG, so it doesn't make for a good showcase run at all because of the frequency of run succession. It's like the chance of a run succeeding is probably like 50% or lower. Which doesn't make for a good relay run. But so anyway, here might... we are. Yeah. All dungeons restricted. Maybe we should go over the restrictions for this category. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Um, so basically the restrictions for this category... Uh, this category was initially made to be a um, legacy category. And we put a few restrictions in place to uh, help with that uh, old school Majora's Mask gameplay. So uh, a few of the restrictions are um, no SRM, no Hidden Owl, and obviously no Acer SRM. Um, so you will see us going around the map, hitting all the owl statues uh, so that we can sort them at different points throughout the run. And no, Eclipse Slot means that we can't duplicate the eggs, so we will be traveling to uh, Pirate's Fortress and uh, Pinnacle Rock to get all seven eggs. More content for you guys. Yes, very exciting egg gameplay is to be had. One recent vote that we actually did have on this category was to 
um, either allow Gim, RE, or ban them both. Um, the vote ended up coming out to banning Gim, but allowing RE. So uh, this is one of the few categories now that use a new trick called Remains Escape, or RE for short. Um, we will be doing two of them in this run. This route only had one at the beginning, but uh, me and Zippo the other night actually spent like five hours routing this to uh, include one more, which saves approximately 54 seconds. So that'll be pretty awesome to showcase. But just like any other run, gotta go through the intro. So if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to post them in the comments. I'll be watching the chat frequently to see if uh, I can answer any of them. Just while we've got a little bit of time, um, did you, do you want to introduce yourselves? We kind of switched over really quickly and I realized you didn't get a chance to say who you were and everything. So by all means, feel free. Yeah, so uh, my name is Dope or Dope Zero. I've been speedrunning this game for like four and a half years now. I mainly run 100%, but got asked to do this for the relay, so I'm switching over for a little bit. And I'm Zippo. Um, I've been running this game since about 2017. I've ran multiple categories and experienced many changes throughout MM's life from SRM to debug menu to... Uh, Banning and unbanning major glitches. It's been a ride. Definitely. But has. I'm happy to be here still. Yeah, we will um, have a lot of cutscenes during this first, uh, like the first like 22-ish minutes. Um, so if there are any donations that pop up, just feel free to interrupt us. <laughs> not a whole lot's going to be going on for those 22 minutes. We only have really one. Im we have like. Okay, we have a few objectives we have to meet, but only one real important trick I have to worry about. So I'll bear that in mind. Got a question from Jess in chat. How long has Zipo been running glitchless? Uh, that's a meme between friends. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say I don't run glitchless for the meme. <laughs> Never ran glitchless in my life. <clears throat> So now we're in Deku Scrub. How'd that happen? Go kid is a bully. Mean. Mean kid. So yeah, like any object of... Except for any percent now. The object... Well, even in any percent. The object is to not be Deku, because Deku is absolutely garbage. Can't do anything. Can't do anything for himself. Because, uh... These runs rely mainly on explosive tricks to get around the overworld, and the only way you could do that is by being human Link, since none of the other forms can use explosives. We don't get Goron in any categories except for all masks and uh, 100%. And Glitchless, I guess. But I don't run Glitchless, so... Yeah, deck is very limited in what he can use. Um... You literally can't really do much. The only use we have found for him in first cycle um, is to do arbitrary code execution. Yeah, finding Ace, <laughs> finding Ace with just Deku is like huge. Yeah, before it gets too late, do you want to explain the trick coming up? Oh yeah, sure. So first, what he's going to be doing is uh, trying to skip a little cutscene um, in this flower, and then after that, we're going to be skipping a huge cutscene. So he skipped the title text in the flower, which is nice. Saves like a second. But now we're going to be pausing frame by frame to skip Happy Mess Salesman, which, uh, if you didn't know, these cutscenes in this game take two frames to load because it, it tries to find Link where he is if he is in a cutscene, and then the next frame it activates it. So if you pause frame by frame, it just has to keep checking where Link is. So it never starts the cutscene. So I will be quiet for that now. Nice. Actually, fantastic. 
Yeah, I only had one extra pause there, so... Pretty good. So there we skip talking to the Happy Mask, which saves like 45 seconds. Yeah, that's a big cutscene skip right there. Most people... Obviously, that's a big reset point if you miss it. Yeah, that's an insta reset if your grinding runs. Do you get Goron and AFR? Do we? I haven't run AFR in so long. We need oh, you do. We could technically skip Goron, but we need it for one switch in Snowhead for a fairy. Oh, <laughs> that's actually sad. Yeah. Back when I ran AFR, we were doing, like, side hop, mega flip, turn, key skip, so... That was, like, so long ago. Alright, would you like to explain our objective while we're in first cycle? Yeah, so first cycle, like I said, it's pretty much always the same. It's to get the ocarina so we can become human again. So the fastest way to do that is to talk to grandma and fall asleep oh, for two days. I read her, the story wrong. <laughs> but he read the wrong stories, which is fine. He just needs to read the bottom story again twice. Which we'll put it at day three. And then if we go dance with the scarecrow in West Clocktown to the trading post shop, uh, it'll become night three. And we still have some time to kill, so uh, we utilize that time between when the clock, town op the clock tower opens uh, to gather some rupees for explosives. So in this route, actually, we're gaining money um, for milk later because we use milk for a skip, which I will explain when the time comes. It's one of my favorite tricks in the game now. It was discovered, I think, like a year and a half ago, or maybe a year ago. So let's go dance with the Scarecrow. Yeah, it's basically make it night three as quick as possible. Get the fairy for magic, get rupees, deposit them, and get up to the clock tower. Which is all really doable in this route. Some routes are like super tight. But uh, in this route, it's pretty easy to do all of it before midnight. Now, we could be slow and get a chest in the uh, stockpot in that's in Andrew's room. But what we're going to do is, after I get the fairy here, we're going to walk past a guard who is not very good at his job. Yeah, because this guard is located on a slope, uh, we can just back walk past him, which makes him the worst guard ever in a Zelda game. Maybe not in a Zelda game. Someone has to... Someone in the chat, if you could tell me a worse guard than that guard in a Zelda game. So yeah, normally you're not supposed to be out here during first cycle because the guards will let you leave while you're Deku. Um, but that actually adds an interesting thing here. So normally there are enemies uh, all around Tournament of Field, but this is actually a completely separate map where they didn't bother placing any enemies to begin with, so we can just spin around freely here. And they did, however, place convenient uh, bush patches for us to get some rupees. And the reason why this is faster than getting the uh, in rupees from the stock button is because um, this burns up in-game time, otherwise we'd be waiting around forever for the uh, clock tower to open. Yeah, so our goal for these rupees in this route is 50, but getting 90 is more optimal because it's one squirrel for the banker as opposed to five. He's definitely on pace for 90, but hopefully I don't jinx it. That doesn't matter now, he can just, even if he doesn't get any rupees in the last two, he gets Keaton bushes and he's good. The guy in Milk Road chomping the rock. <laughs> I mean, come on. It's Princess Zelda's letter. I mean, come on. So I did gloss over some rupees there, but it's fine. I can just grab two from the key bushes. Doesn't lose any time. Yeah, by the time you get North Clocktown, if it's still before 1045 when you enter, you have so much extra time. 1045 is like the latest you can be in North Clocktown. 
Yeah, even though I got all the bushes, like, I'm still gonna be early. We now receive our magic. Yes, take... Take this gift, I... I just... Oh my god, I'm forgetting the word. <laughs> Alrighty. So now we're going to go deposit rupees into the bank. Wow, I really am trying to figure out a word right now in my head, and I can't think of it. It's a D word. That means, like, to give. I was about to say it, and it just never came out. But anyway, on to the run. Yeah, so here he'll just have to flick left and down. Since he has 90. Boom. Maybe the ones at the dungeon of the castle links all the captive links the paths were fit. Yeah, I mean the guards were never good in these games, were they? But that guard in particular, like even just regularly, he's like, You're a child, you're holding a sword, that's fine, you can go outside and fight all these monsters. No dope. The forbidden tech. <laughs> <laughs> so if you grab a ledge and then walk into a heart piece, you can't pick it up. As long as you keep holding target there, you get something called collection delay, and until you let go of target, you won't be able to pick up any standstill items like that heart piece. We use collection delay in 100% to, um, to manipulate the banker into giving us an, a different item. Giving us the big bomb bag. Or, I mean, the big wallet, adult wallet. I don't know why I said bomb bag. Usually, he'll give you the first reward, which is what? It's like a rupee? 200? Or like 100 rupees? Yeah, so basically, you can do Oceanside or depositing uh, to the banker in any order. It doesn't really matter. But you have to deposit uh, 200 rupees or more to get the uh, reward from the banker. And then you have to complete the Oceanside Spider House for the reward. But we're able to... Uh, this isn't really a part of the category, but... A uh, fun way how that works is um, we actually, because uh, you can get both wallets in, com in I guess, on different files. I don't know if you can get it on the same one, Song of Time, because I think that flag is permanently set. But what we do is we can get the uh, first wallet by getting collection delay, depositing the rupees, and then making our A button busy, and then that'll give us the wallet. And then um, the banker won't talk us to talk to us again, and that's the text box that will um, initiate the flag being set. So if we never allow that text box to come up, uh, we can get both wallets from the banker. Fun fact about Hundo. Yeah, just while we're waiting to become human, just some fun facts. Yeah, cause but we're almost done. We have about uh, yeah, like five more minutes. So Zelda's going to teach us Song of Time from a flashback. And we're going to use that to go all the way back to first cycle. And then we can really get things going. It'll be useful for two instances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Usually we use this song to, uh, we store this song and then use it to skip cutscenes later in the run, which you'll see. But since we're doing a new route, we only will utilize this twice. Back to first cycle. You know what I mean. Back to the beginning of the cycle. Back to first day. <laughs> My apologies. Yes, we will accidentally save and reset too early and have to do first cycle all over again. Don't do that, though. Yeah, I'll play it very <laughs> safe, as I always do. Also, what's up, Mini Mini? I haven't seen you in a while. 
I think since the relay we did. Hope you're doing well. If we do have a bit of downtime, could I just hop in and say a little thank you to our tech team? Yeah, sure. Wonderful. Uh, just to shout out very quickly that the RAF Event Horizon main stage, all the Sub-Zero events would not be possible without our amazing tech team. Massive shout out to Jason, Angry Doom and Noises for their restreaming efforts. So everything you've seen today is their hard work and they are going away behind the scenes, just making sure everything goes super smoothly and it's just incredible. And also massive thank you to Ghost Likely as well for their awesome work on the layouts and the visuals. I'm sure you all agree the stream looks incredible. So massive claps to the behind the scenes team, please. Back to you, team. Alrighty. So we're getting taught Song of Healing right now, which will allow us to take off Deku Mask. And rip the face off of rip. a poor fish man. <laughs> yeah, which we'll be doing next. We're going to go steal somebody's face, which happens to be Zora Mask. We're going to go hover into Great Bay after buying explosives, and uh, yeah, we'll hess over it to him. We'll do some cool movement tech, and then yeah, we'll rip his we, face off. Once we get out of the clock tower here, we'll have a few more text boxes, and then the run where we start to pick up. Uh, that's where we see a lot of the bomb tricks coming into play. We'll still need to get uh, East Clock Time Rupees because we uh, our Rupees in the first cycle were meant for something later in the run. So we'll go get that. It'll give us 99 Rupees. And then we'll go buy explosives with that. Yeah, we'll be getting that chest twice in this run. It's a very convenient source of money for buying explosives uh, when you need them for dungeons, etc. And... Um, you can only use it once per cycle, but with RE, that's one of the challenges we have to face is that that chest for buying explosives uh, is no longer available. So we have to either use our explosives very carefully and come up with strats that, you know, save bomb juice or bombs, or we need to find um, ways to route in rupees that don't lose much time. Yeah, so the usual way yeah. to skip Giants cutscenes, we would save and quit. Like, we'd save and then reset the console while we're picking up the remains. And it would give us the remains, but it would reset our bomb count and everything. So we'd have to go buy more explosives. <clears throat> but by using Remains Escape, we don't have to reset to day one and lose everything. We could just keep what we have, but that chest doesn't become available to us. So we'd have to find rupees or just, like, manage explosives better. Yeah, and we could, we could use, um, or we can't, but um, in other runs, they use Eclipse Swap to preserve their bombs or bomb shoes throughout cycles, so you can use them over multiple cycles and still keep the same uh, ammo count. But uh, since Eclipse Swap is banned, we cannot do that, so... Yeah, this category is kind of special in that way, where we can't use Eclipse Swap. <clears throat> your uh, your explosives only update if in your menu there's like the counter like available that number in your menu. So if you overwrite it with a bottle, it just lets you keep all your chews as long as they're equipped or your bombs. It's really nice, but in this category, we don't get that. Uh, we don't get that convenient convenient strat. All right, this is where I like to say that we're officially out of first cycle. Yay! And now the actual speedrun will start. <laughs> the best Zelda speedrun will start now. Yeah, so we do a little movement here, a little movement tech to get to this chest. Nothing notable. Just some overworld movement. Now we're gonna go hit the owl because in this category we banned index warping. So we have to manually hit all the owls that we need 
or that we uh, want to travel back to, and since we're using Remains Escape, we're going to need this owl to come back to Clocktown. Because saving and quitting puts us back at Clocktown right away, but with Remains Escape, uh, we would have to soar back to Clocktown if we want to buy more explosives. Or do other things, which I'll explain later. So Dope's just buying Bomb Bag and Choose for uh, this cycle. And now we will... This guard's a little bit better. You can skip him with the deal. bomb recoil, but if you fail, you can just talk to him. He lets you go for free because you have a sword now. A child with a sharp pointy thing? Go right ahead. Alright, so we're doing a super slide. Anybody that's not familiar with a super slide, uh, if you roll into an item, a pick up, like an item you can pick up, and then uh, if you roll on a certain frame, you'll try to pick up the item on the same frame it explodes, and it'll push you back and lock you into the cut, like that cutscene animation of picking up the bomb. I guess not cutscene, but the animation of picking up a bomb, and you'll maintain all your movement speed. And here he's going to be doing a Hess, which is similar, but not exactly the same. You're going to roll on that same type of frame, but instead of picking up the bomb, you're going to do Shuffle Step, which is like slightly left or right or down on your control stick. And then it'll allow you to maintain your movement as well. He uses invincibility frames so you don't take damage on the bomb. There's like two frames where you're invulnerable uh, during the end of your roll. And we utilize them in order to super slide Hess, do things like Mega Flip. And now here's another trick, <laughs> bomb time stop. So if you pull a bomb and you back walk with it, when the fuse gas goes off, like the little smoke coming off of the fuse, when it disappears after you're like, you backwalk with it. Because Link's putting his hands above his head, you can get an Ocarina items for some reason. So if you hit, like, Karina and Shield at the same time, you can get a time stop off of it. It locks you in, like, pulling... Uh, it locks you in a cutscene animation, which overrides the uh, Zora mask walking to the short cutscene. Time stop's extremely useful in like a couple instances. In this category, I think it's only this one, but if I see any more, I'll point it out. But by uh, locking yourself in a cutscene, you can just freely move around in. You can override like a bunch of cutscenes in this game. Or you could lock platforms into like place and then go on them and then cancel it with C up. And then, uh, let the platform take you back towards something else. It's, it's a nice trick. Pretty cool. <laughs> so now Except we're this stealing will be the only other transformation mask we get. We will not be getting Goron because we'll be doing all by skip later on. Goron is fast and slow. Getting Goron is just so out of the way for a lot of categories. They don't do it. Yeah. It might be fast movement-wise, but just the time it takes to go get blends and do the seam walk and watch the cutscene, etc. Just doesn't warrant enough time save. If there is a way to get Goron without lens, we probably would get Goron in a lot of categories. Other categories, but... Lens is just very, very slow. Yeah, right. After we get Zora Mask here, this is going to be a very action-packed uh, segment. There's going to be a lot going on, so I will most likely remain quiet. Let people explain everything. Yeah, so he's going to go hit Grey Bay Owl. Um... 
because again, in this category, we need owls for if we want to come back to places, and Great Bay is like the spot to be later in the run. So we're just gonna go hit the owl. And then make our way over to Zora Cape. Because we're gonna do our first alternate exit of the category. Alternate exits are like, uh, I'll just explain this quickly. The way they program maps in this game, like Grottos and Fairy Fountains, they're all linked together in one map. So you can drop into an unloaded one. Oh yeah, cool zest by the way. I'll explain that later. <laughs> Fairy fountains. So you can drop, clip out of bounds in a fairy fountain and then drop into another one because they're all programmed on the same map. So using explosive hovers and um, mega flips to get to the other one and then exiting out of that one's entrance that's there loaded even though it's an unloaded zone. So we're also going to hit this owl. This is just convenient in this category because we want to come back here uh, later for uh, Great Bay Temple. Uh, he was going for a trick there. There's uh, two frames where if you let go of... Oh my god, this fucking fish. Yeah, the fish is annoying. There's two frames there where if you let go of A, Zora will come out of the water and be, like, so high he can grab onto the ledge. Which is called Zora High Ledge Grab. Yeah, this is really laggy. Oh my, okay, I'm just gonna buffer it. <laughs> This mega flip is the bane of everyone's existence. It's so bad. And then he'll just blow up the boulders and use a recoil flip at the same time. All right, I'm going to stay quiet. I'll explain this after. This is a trick. Okay, so this is the alternate exit. Now we're in Icona Fairy Fountain, and we can exit out of the entrance. And now we're in Icona, and we'll go hit the owl. So he used he used bomb hovering to get over the wall, and then used two mega flips, stopping himself with a chew each time, so he could do another one in order to get to the other uh, the other area. And now he'll pull a bomb. He's gonna recoil off of it and then do a super swim. So in water, you can maintain your movement speed by f flicking B and A to, to uh, surface. And then once you hit the surface, you can either hold forward and target and then like adjust your angle with the stick. Or you can like flick the stick in the, di the direction you, the opposite direction you want to go. So now we're hessing through the woods because we want to go get, uh, we want to go talk to Kume to get the bottle. But we have to see the injured uh, witch in the woods first. Well, this is Kume, right? And then we gotta go get a bottle. Yeah, fairy fountains are awesome. And then bottle's important just because later we need to get the eggs. And if we have one bottle, we can actually duplicate that bottle over our item slots, as long as the item can make a sound where you can't use it. So what we do is we get stick and nuts, and then uh, we make it so we have zero stick and nuts, and that will give you that error sound like you have none, and then we'll be able to uh, duplicate Duplicate our ball over it. So 
So we're doing another Hess here through the uh, swamp. We want to make it all the way to the Octo. Ah, that's fine. I got stuck in the corner there and it turned me off. Yeah, it's actually, that has is kind of annoying just because you have to not target the sign and also not get in that corner at the same time. Okay, so now we're making our way over to Palace. We're gonna back walk through the poison water, back flip onto this, and no crit health, that's good. Turning around is a little hard. Turning around is hard. Alright, so these guards are pretty bad too, actually. What you can do is Azora jump slash cancel, and you'll just phase through them. Then you'll get ISG off of the sign. Ooh, that sign broke. Hover over the logs. Then you'll equip Ocarina Deku. You'll do Zora Deku. This is important. Zora to Deku will skip the first cutscene animation. Like, when you put on a mask for the first, first time in this game, it gives you a long cutscene where you, like, oh, uh, you experience the pain of the death of that mask or whatever of that person who the mask is from. But in order to skip that, you can just put on a mask you've already put on, and then it'll just stop that cutscene from ever happening for the rest of the time. Like, you'll never get that cutscene from that mask. Yeah, that only happens from human to a transformation mask for the first time, but if you do transformation to transformation, it'll just... Yeah. So now we're getting Sonata for Woodfall Temple. We just hard this song's hard required. Nui Bossa Nova and Sonata are hard required in this category, but uh, Lullaby is not. Play those trumpets, boy. Oh, we got a sussy scrub. I like yeah, how they're if you look at those four staring. scrubs. <laughs> yeah, they're, they'll, they'll be staring at you, and sometimes their eyes will be squinted and watch out. Like the calm <laughs> sussy scrubs. Lucky squinting. Yeah, he's like right on the camera too. <laughs> yeah. And then we're just gonna leave the monkey. Alright, bye monkey, sorry. Have fun being tortured by the scrubs. They're like wondering where Deku Princess is, and they're torturing the monkey because they think the monkey has her. Who knows where she is? But I think it's funny to think about like the Dark Knight when Batman's beating beating up Joker and going like, Where is she? <laughs> I think they're doing that to the monkey. Now just a little movement over to Song of Soaring Stone so we can soar to the other owls. We do this in like every category, except for any percent. Do you want to explain pop-up? Pop-up? Yeah. Am I am I dumb? Are you the rising? Pop-up to the thing from the lily pad. Oh yeah, long jump? Log jump? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, there's like a if you like jump off that lily pad is where you can easily make it up to the to that like boulder rock thing. But um there's some categories do it as human, which is a little bit harder. So now we're just gonna make our way into Woodfall Temple. And we're gonna do something we're gonna do something here which we don't usually do in other categories. We're going to actually skip Woodfall Rising cutscene because we're not going to beat Woodfall right now. We're going to hit the owl to come back later uh, because we want hookshot. So we're going to raise Woodfall and then sword a Great Bay during the um, before the cutscene ever starts. We're going to try. It's a one frame trick. Just like uh, later, there's another one-frame trick. 
So we'll play Sonata and we'll try to pause on the first frame possible. But first, we're gonna do something called dupes. Dupes are pretty cool. So we're gonna hit the owl statue. We're gonna grab stick from the pot so we can dupe over stick as well. Like I told you, your item needs to have zero, a zero quantity, so it gives you that error sound. So we're gonna break stick. We're gonna drink potion. We're gonna catch this fairy here, and if you're holding the bottle in your hand with an item, you can release the item and press another item right away, like bottle nut. As long as the nut has zero, it'll turn into a bottle. You just have to be shuffle stepping, holding an item that you can release, and then pressing bottle and then the other item. So Dope got both, because he's awesome. And he got them really fast. And here comes the cutscene skip. I will just shut up now. Free, free, free. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to sort of great bay using the owl statues. Whew. All right. Now we got some downtime. That was action packed, right? Isn't that cool, guys? Now we're just going to do some light swimming. So now that we have uh, three bottles, we're going to go to Pinnacle Rock. There's three eggs we need in Pinnacle Rock. And again, because we don't do equip swap in this run, because it's banned uh, or restricted, we will just manually go get the eggs in Pirate's Fortress and Pinnacle Rock. We do PR first so that it's night by the time we get to Pirate's Fortress. Because then at nighttime on JP, the pirates are so blind, you can walk into the hookshot room and just like do box movement and they will never see you. As long as you're side hopping, rolling frame perfectly, the guards can't see you on JP. So we'll use that in two instances to just completely go around them. The guards in, in Zelda games are just so good guys, aren't they? So kill the eels. We already know where the eggs are because we're speedrunners and we're smart. Yes, you must understand the Japanese language in order to speedrun this version. <laughs> Dope has actually been speedrun it, speed reading where these eggs were earlier in the run. You just never noticed. Oh, he did the turnaround. He did the Zippo movement. Yeah, a little tech there. Uh, while you're killing the eel, um, when it sh you hit it the first time, and it'll shoot out again, and you can turn around and barrier it. Yeah, you can sink. Uh, backwalking is actually faster than swimming. So if you're backwalking... Uh, well, I guess it's not sure. It's like similar speed. But the time save is actually sinking to the bottom, so you don't have to sink to the bottom. If you're sinking to the bottom while waiting for the eel to come back out, you're saving time over sinking to the bottom before you're grabbing the egg. And yeah, what I just did there was called OI or Ocarina items. So if you have a bottled item in your hand, and then after you close the text box, if you're holding the ESS position, if you hit the bottled item and then the B button, uh, you'll be able to pull out Ocarina underwater there. Which is, and then you can actually pull it out normally in MM3D, but in this game that doesn't exist, so we have to do OI to be able to soar away there. Otherwise, we'd have to like swim all the way back to the lab. Back to the lab again. Whoa. <laughs> While you're dumping eggs, is now a good time to hop in quickly? Yep. Yeah, this is fine. Brill, um, just to really quickly say, um, my time with you is finished. Um, I've had a wonderful time hosting you all. Hope the rest of the relay goes well. Good luck, Dope. I am going to hand over to the wonderful A Variety Pack, who will be looking after you for the rest of the session. Um, and all that's left to really say is um, keep the donations coming, team. It's such an important cause that we're supporting today, and it's been incredible that we've even raised this much. So 
Thank you so much for that and um, keep it up. Have a wonderful time. I will hopefully see you all soon. Over thank to you, Brian. All right, thank you very much, H, for the introduction. And thank you again for your wonderful help hosting for the event. I was unfortunately had to do some teaching today. So um, thankfully H stepped in last minute and was able to take over um, a little bit of time. So I will turn it back to the runners and keep you updated on, on uh, donations. Yeah, guys, if you have a dollar or two dollars or any amount of money you guys want to donate, um, it's much appreciated. Like, it doesn't take much to uh, support like charities. Even a, like just a little bit goes a long way. Um, so here we're going to be doing a little bit of a hover into Pirate's Fortress, where it just takes two. Um, Nice up buffer. Okay. All right, fancy boy. It just takes two uh, two bomb hovers and a mega flip. And then now we're going to be doing a Hess. Are you doing the Hess? Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing a Hess into hookshot room. So we're just going to walk over here, pull bomb. Do a little Hess. Wow, nice angle. Wow. What a god. And here's another trick called PF Long Jump. So Pirate's Fortress Long Jump, you place a bomb down, like you walk forward and place, while you're walking forward, you place the bomb down on the barrels. And then you quickly shield it, climb up as Zora, do a tap side hop, and then if you see up and look left, bomb will just shoot you over to the tank, completely dodging the vision of the uh, the pirate guards. We shoot the beehive, they run out of the room, we get the egg, we get the hook shot. Everything's great, everything is awesome. Dope's that doing was actually pretty good fantastic. Segment. Yeah, you're doing really, that was really good. Is that a gold? Yep. <laughs> Yay, it has gold! <laughs> All right, now we're going to go get second egg and fish, because now that we're in Pirate's Fortress, there's actually four eggs here. And if you remember from earlier, we only have three bottles. So we're actually going to dupe over bombs. And since we have more than three bombs and we can't run it to zero, uh, the game actually... Like, remember when I said earlier, the game has to give you an error message saying that you have too many... Like, you, you have no uh, items. Well, bombs actually give you an error mesh, an error-like sound if there's three of them out. So if you actually place three bombs, and then you can dupe over them before they explode. But there has to be three out in the uh, world to give you that um, error sound. I don't know if I explained that well. <laughs> yeah, you basically have to have an empty ammo counter for it to dupe the bottle over it. Yeah, but for bombs, if there's three out, it'll give you that empty... Yep. That empty sound. So, boom. And now, we'll try to drop the fish during this cutscene, which Dope does perfectly. Saves a little bit of time. Let's see how Pirate Fight goes. She can be really annoying. Yep, she can be Average. pretty annoying. In this deck. Go. Oh. You didn't fall in the water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alright, so that's the third egg, and there's one more on the other side of Pirate's Fortress. Nice. <laughs> the last second fish attack. 
<laughs> Do si side hops up the uh, stairs are so so fast. Side hopping up any slope is the fastest way to get up a slope. We'll do a little jump slash recoil here to get to this uh, alcove for this room. And we'll do another ocarina items to pull the ocarina, yeah, pull the ocarina out while we're underwater, because again in this game it doesn't let you do it normally. And then we'll just soar back to Great Bay. To put the eggs in the cage, the aquarium. Yep, so that's the last of our egg collecting. Uh, and then we'll be moving on to dungeons, finally. So while we're here, since we're here uh, anyway, we're gonna get Nui Bossa Nova and just soar over to to um, Great Bay to do guy work first. If you remember earlier, we hit the Zora Cape Owl so we can soar directly to uh, guy work. And since uh, since we're like, you think like, oh, it's fast to just like walk out of the aquarium right and go swim but since we're doing a cutscene skip here called Nui Bossa Nova cutscene skip which requires pulling out Ocarina to skip yet another cutscene we can just um, soar after pulling the Ocarina well we need to soar away from this area so it's convenient that we can just soar directly to Zorki Is there a cutscene skip for Great Bay Temple, like Woodfall Temple? Yeah, so there is. We will be right after this trick. Nice, you got the pause list. Do you go for pause list? I mash both start and Ocarina. Oh, nice. So pause list there, you have one frame. You have two frames for pause, I think, and one frame for Ocarina. So he got pause list, which means he pulled Ocarina on the first, on the, the perfect frame. So here we're going to be setting up a cutscene skip. Usually you talk to the turtle for an entire minute, but you can set you can set yourself up here, play the song, and side hop into this loading zone before the cutscene starts. Perfect. So that skips the turtle cutscene. Like I said earlier, it takes two frames to start a cutscene. So if you pause on the first frame, you're able to just pause buffer into a loading zone. So next we're going to be doing pirate cutscene skip. There's a cutscene on the turtle when you get on it for the first time where the pirates get sucked up by a vortex. You can actually skip this cutscene too. All you need to do, hook shot up to the turtle and do bomb time. Uh. That's not going to oh, work. No. I gotta show you my setup. I think it's more consistent. I get it pretty consistently. I just... I think I didn't shoot. I shot too early, I think. That's fine. The pirate's cutscene skip only saves, like, a little bit of time. Turtle cutscene skip is the big one. Yeah, that's only, like, a 20-second time loss. It's not a huge deal. I'd rather fail it there than when I'm by the loading zone. Failing it by the loading zone loses you more time because you've already set the trick up. All right, so uh, I just want to explain this real quick. Uh, we're going to be doing a boss key skip like right now where we clip out of bounds and then use a bomb recoil to shoot ourselves to the loading zone. We literally skip the entire temple. We don't have to do anything in this temple. And then we will fight Gyorg. Man, 
No, yeah. I messed up my angle a little bit, so I tried to readjust it, and then I got a bad recoil. That's fine, though. I'll just do it this way. Nice. Alright, so now we're gonna fight... We're gonna fight Gyrg, and there's gonna be like a 30 second cutscene here. That we have to watch with Gyrg coming out of the water. This is a pretty a chill fight. Yeah, pretty we do have time for donations for this cutscene. Sure thing, we have a $20 donation from Kuroshi, who says, Yay, Zelda. A $20... We have a twenty dollar edition from Coco, who says no comment. <laughs> Let's go, Coco. <laughs> and a five dollar donation from Happy Bear, who says, "I hope you all like like this donation." <laughs> uh, oh man, I slay myself. Barely. His name's Bear. Get it? She said that verbatim. <laughs> All right, so Gyrg's pretty easy. Um, Gyrg, you just have to follow Gyrg up and down. Whee. And then there is a way to... <laughs> there is a way to get Gyrg to charge you quickly. If you hold down here and time an A press, you'll instantly grab ledge, and then Gyrg will instantly charge you. Makes for a quicker fight. Saves about... I think it's like four to eight seconds, because sometimes... Guy just does whatever he wants if you don't do that. It swims around forever. Alright, cool. We did our first dungeon. We're, we are moving right along. Kiss ass consent before slapping the knees of others. Is yeah, that, that like happy. a. What was that? That happy. She's a, she's a trickster. <laughs> That sounded like a um that com that uh comment sounded like a um an ad. You know when at the end of ads when it's like it gives you like a this is an actual this is an actual blah 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 it does something really fast. Like please ask the consent of others before slapping the D's. <laughs> I don't know how to describe. <laughs> Can you slap my knees? So, yeah, one of the nuances about um, this category is we can't actually skip all of the Giants cutscenes with uh, Song Storage and Remains Escape. We do have to watch one of the cutscenes in order to get out of the water because that is required to take us up to the moon without us around. Nice, I nailed one of the hardest songs. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's the hardest? I think Dude, I've awesome been failing it so much, I don't know why. You gotta play it like I play it. I play it so weird. I play it like thumb, right thumb, right, right trigger, left thumb with on C stick. That is weird. Yeah, it works though. So yeah, we've already pretty much done all the prerequisites for doing the dungeons, so now it's pretty much just going to be a dungeon rush at this point going forward. So there's going to be one really hard trick coming up, but if I mess up, I lose like seven minutes, but I shouldn't because it's not really that hard, but it is a little scary to do. It won't lose that much time, just go get Bosky skip, or Bosky. Well yeah, Bosky loses seven minutes, but... Really? You just weird shot to it. Oh, that's right. I haven't. I fought the gecko the whole time like a dum dum. Because <laughs> I forget. You can do that. Yeah, you can weird shot and soar. It was faster. Well, that's why you have me. All right. So, like he said, we're dungeon rushing. So next is on our list is uh, Woodfall Temple. So we're just gonna go. 
Like I mentioned earlier, we're doing Remains Escape, but we're not doing it for this temple because we need explosives for the other two temples at the end of the game. So we're actually just going to store Song of Time in this temple and use it to um, quickly reset the game after picking up the Remains. And I do have enough bombs to do the temple, but I'm just going to grab an extra one before the torch, just so... In case I'm like in the middle of a mega hover, I don't need to do anything stupid. Because once I start burning up my chews, that's kind of a commitment right there that I have to make to getting the trick. I'll just grab a quick bomb drop down here. I normally wouldn't get this in runs, but for the safety of the relay. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice! <laughs> and then gets eaten. That is A-OK. -okay. Um, we're gonna do this. Oh, I'll just grab this very for heart. Alright. I mean that this torch is a little tricky. There we go. All right, so we're gonna really get the get the bow. We gotta fight lizard guy though. Lizard man. So how do you tell the difference between a Dinalphos and a Lizalphos? I don't. I think one of them is more green. Was that a legitimate oh, no. question or like a setup to a joke? Couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think in this game, like, technically there's like two of them, but they look the same for some reason. I don't know. All right, so we're going to equip Zora Mask because Zora is important for the next two things we do, which is uh, we can use Zora Fin's uh, jump slash cancel to phase through walls. We're gonna do that. We oh. have to have a perfect angle. Not perfect, but pretty good. And then if you hold B and mash Y, he actually just falls off the ledge with a uh, pulling ocarina. And you can store songs by voiding out before the song ends. So next time a text box comes up, Song of Time is gonna come up. Now I will be quiet for this trick. Cool. Oh no. Okay. No? Oh no. I know what I know what happens. Alright. Did you stop it too early? I think so. Oh no. Chat, you weren't quiet enough. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out was given to dope. No. Alright, so Boss key skip was a dud, but that's fine because we can get the boss key relatively quickly. We just need to go go over to the um, the room and do a weird shot. I will have to restore Song of Time because the key will bring up a text box. Not only that, you pulled Ocarina to sword, yeah. right? Yeah, so I guess it doesn't even matter. You're playing yeah. the piano. <laughs> this is unfortunately a big time loss, but the run is not over. Yeah, Woodfall Bosky Skip is that trick in this run. It's just kind of 
kind of annoying. Oh, he's, he's gonna mess you up. Here, I gotta lure him away. Yeah, you gotta lure him. Where are you beating up over there, dude? <laughs> Alright, so that's a weird shot, by the way. <laughs> if you um, if you use the iframes and hold a direction while pulling a uh, pulling hook shot, it displaces your camera and you're able to shoot around walls. I don't know if that door opens. No, it doesn't. You were right to store. <laughs> yeah, now you're gonna have to shoot the, the torch. You can do action swap. Do you have a stick? No, I don't. You could get one. Oh, you just do this then. This might take a minute. I just stand, like, right at the edge. Trying not to hit the switch. Higher. Yeah, the lighting of that torch is a little bit scuffed. <laughs> Stupid torch, you make me look bad. Alright, so before I proceed, I'm actually gonna do this. I need to restore Song of Time. As you can tell, this is a pretty lengthy backup because I have to do all this just to get over to the boss door. No! There we go. The hills are alive with the sound of women. All right, now we're going to drop down here. If you stand on this flower at a nice spot, you can just hookshot all the way up to the boss door. These dragonflies are really annoying. Please target. There you go. All right. Alrighty. Back on track. So it only just takes 10 crouch stabs uh, with stored jump slot so on JP uh, your power your uh, power crouch stab so your crouch stab just mimics whatever your last damage output was so if you jump slash it'll mimic jump slash if you jump slash with a like a Deku stick it'll mimic Deku jump slash and then we're gonna save and reset we save while we're picking up the remains, reset. We keep the remains. 
we don't have to watch the giant cutscene for the temple. Yep, so unfortunately a really big time loss in the run, but stuff happens. Closing in on Lady Skip. So there's that rupee chest we're talking about. It, since it reset after a song of time, we can just grab that. Now we get more explosives. We're gonna sort a woodfall. We're gonna do another fairy fountain alternate exit because fairy fountain. The Fairy Fountain at uh, Woodfall leads to Snowhead Fairy Fountain. And from that Fairy Fountain, we can just do Lullaby Skip and get into uh, Snowhead Temple that way. How dare you! He just bought 20 chews with 69 rupees because he's a cheater and he stole, he stole it. Oh yes. Here comes a route change, by the way. Here we're gonna withdraw rupees. This was a route change we made like a day and day and a half ago. We're gonna Hess here. We're gonna go all the way to Milk Road and buy milk. Milk is important, guys. I don't change the whole much. So we're gonna get arrow drop here for Snowhead. Because we need that for a trick called action swap. If we get arrows there, it becomes an RNG list strat where it originally was RNG to see if we got an arrow drop. Only drink Romani's milk, guys. It's the real deal. Romani's ranch milk is the only milk. Alright, so we're gonna get a stick for action swap too. As well as for uh, Wizburb fight later, because Deku sticks overpowered. Oh, da, da, da. Ooh, the bad nut. The bad nut omen. If you pick up that nut, um, wait, it doesn't ruin anything in this category, does it? It gets rid of our empty bottle, which we need for milk jug. Oh yeah. Oh wow, that's really bad. You have to dupe again. Okay, so another fairy fountain alternate exit. Here comes an RNG trick and an annoying trick. So we'll get ISG off a bomb. We're gonna go to a corner and we're gonna try to get a super slide. When the wind is doing like, when the wind like stops blowing. But we also want the wind to not blow for a long time after we super slide so we can get pretty far. Should be fine, yeah. Yeah, nice. First try. The RNG gods. Let's go. I am gonna wait this out right here. Those 
there's a snowball coming up. Let's go down a little bit. Yeah, if you get hit by a snowball, it's you have to do the entire trick over again, and it's huge time loss. And in there. Nice. Alright, so we're gonna do action swap now. Just gotta let it happen. So if you pull stick while you're holding hookshot on a frame, a text box comes up like that. It'll give you something called action swap. And if you're holding, so if you're holding, if you're holding those items in particular, like a bow or any handheld item like bow or hookshot, and you do stick, you'll get something called a charged arrow. It's not a fire arrow. It's actually an arrow charged by flames like you're shooting an arrow through a flame out of your stick. It's really weird. It's also really cool and very helpful. Nice. So Wizard of Fight's pretty easy, you do stick jump slash to store uh, to store it for power crouch stab, you get ISG after hitting him. And you just go run at him. And then you just stand in the right top right corner one. He dies. If he dies, he dies. And boom, fire arrows. You should do that thing I was talking about, by the way. Haha, <laughs> hello. I haven't practiced it. So we're gonna hook shot over here. We're just getting to the top of Snowhead now. We're just trying to get to the boss door. It's just a hover and some some other stuff. Super slide through here. ISG. ISG is infinite sword glitch. It's just if you interrupt your crouch step with any action, like reading a text box, or um, or like picking up an item, your sword will just infinitely be swinging. And that's what causes hovers to be able to uh, function properly, because when your sword is swinging, the game thinks you're on the ground. So when you shield damage, it checks if you're on the ground, and then... Uh, since your sword is swinging infinitely, it just goes, yeah, he's on the ground. Cool. Let's put him in a grounded state, and then all of a sudden you're floating in midair. Cool. Alright, so goat fight's pretty straightforward. You just shoot goat with arrows. You get a particular lineup so goat can't see you around the corner. So he just stands there waiting for you to charge him. And you just like, keep baiting him. You do some side hops to reset his, uh... Reset him. so that you can time uh, 
so you can time his charge so he dies right next to you. Then we'll perform RE for the first time in this run. Remains this gate, which requires hookshot. I'll just let it go first. So by pulling hookshot out, it'll delay you picking up the remains for long enough for you to play a song. And playing a song is a cutscene. So the cutscene for like Song of Double Time and Song of Invert Time actually override the cutscene starting for Giant's cutscene. It allows you to just like walk out of the cutscene. It just never starts. Great. It's good stuff. A cutscene to skip a cutscene. That's MM in a nutshell. Now let's go. Just like how Time Stop is technically a cutscene that skips a cutscene. Like when we did it for Zora Mask. And here comes one of my favorite glitches in the game. Hookshot jump. You can store hookshots hook shots with like drinking milk. So we do that. So we can hit two hookshots at the same time or one frame after another. Different properties for different frames. So like one after another or at the same time do different stuff. So what we're doing is I think one frame after another. Uh, Ace SRM equip swap index warp. Uh. Okay, never mind. Woo! That scared me for a second. <laughs> so the one hits, and then the next one hits, and it launches you up into the sky. And yeah, text overflow. The one thing that nobody remembers or cares to talk about anymore, because that's where I'm just overrided it. Text overflow was useful for like before SRM because we could bring up debug menu. The debug menu could just give you whatever you wanted. So we did a little clip. If you get a precise angle and then you get a like Hess speed, or you do like a, a recoil. If you do a Hess, basically, or just like, but you hold the direction instead, you'll clip through that wall. Was there any fast setups found for it? No, it was like so annoying, dude. It was, you had to play like 151 Song of Soarings and like four, like, Song of Times or something. Ooh, bomb drop. Really good RNG. Okay, so now we can just roll. It was 69 songs? <laughs> Are you kidding? That's hilarious. That's actually hilarious, Dio. Yeah, we used to... We used to get a value by putting our... Like, opening up the map and putting it on the the L button of the map, or the Z button, sorry, the Z button on the map, on the menu map. Map menu? Oh my god, I don't even know how to say that. Yeah, map menu. Putting the Z on the map menu and then just playing it over and over, and it would just keep affecting this one value until you got debug menu.
That's actually so funny, though. I didn't... What? No, you got trolled! I got trolled, dude. That's unlucky. That wasn't really my fault. So what happened there is the Garo Master was a little bit too far back to where my iframes ran out. And I was trying to set up for a death warp there and by taking um by intentionally taking damage and his positioning was just a little whack. Oh you know what? I didn't even realize I explained that clip like it was the Hess clip, but you do the you just do the uh, long jump clip. Thankfully it doesn't take too long to get back over here. In other categories, it's really bad because you don't have book shot. Yeah. Only thing is, do you want to get another bomb drop now? Yeah, I'm gonna get another bomb drop. Yes, Sage. Oh yeah, so I should also explain that weird shots have two different, like, I explained that it displaces your camera, but I didn't explain that. If you do, like, second frame of weird shot, it goes downward, third frame of weird shot goes forward, and those are the two useful ones, all the rest are bad. And on English, uh, you only want two frame, because third frame crashes. Which is scary. Like, it's so scary. <laughs> Alright, so Garo Master is dead. And now we will receive the light arrow. What are you doing? What? What's that bomb doing there, bro? Why did you pull a bomb? Dude, what are you doing? Oh my dude, god! Dude, I died, man! What the heck? You're a literal idiot, dude. What are you doing? Just kidding! Funny memes. We're back at the beginning of the temple. It's just what we wanted. Haha. Ha. Well. Oh, by the way, you can just shoot through this wall. <laughs> yeah, That's we do the a trick, trick called bow extension there. And as the name suggests, you extend your bow forwards and are able to uh, clip through the collision and just shoot straight to it. Remember, kids, always extend your bow to flip the temple. No one fell for that because Dope explained it earlier. I know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You guys forgot. Wink, wink. You you all got fooled either way. Um... <laughs> you got trolled. Haha. Uh -huh. All right. Um, we're gonna do Armos long jump. That was a little far away. Yeah, you were too low. Just kidding. Uh, now we're gonna do Armos long jump. I'm gonna get these hearts. <laughs> I don't want to die to Tunmold. Because Tunmold can be stupid. That's the last thing I need right now. True. true. I'll, I'll do the easier setup since I'm not from the start. Well, I haven't seen that in so long. Alright. So now, another boss key skip. Kind of like Woodfall, a little bit easier, I'd say. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, cool. We in there like swimwear. All right, and here's the last, the last remains we need for going to Clock Town. So the setup for this fight's pretty good. We have fire arrows, which do double damage to a uh, blue twin mold. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw a bomb down right. Or down left, I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. Don't know directions. And then we're gonna shoot a fire arrow. And then he just needs two more hits. Oh no. Oh nice, thread the needle, let's go. Twin Mold's my favorite boss, but don't tell anybody I said that because everybody hates <laughs> Twin Mold. <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, he landed on a thing? Wait, does he always do that? No. I think that was lucky. I think the run just got blessed. Zeepo shot, let's go. He almost got both. Ah, uh, bad cycle. That's all far away. Yeah. Watch out. You know, you could have got hit again and then did RE. Yeah. <laughs> That would have been funny. Alright, not a bad twin mold. So we'll do Remains Escape again. This one we're not gonna death warp on, just because twin mold's room you can void in. It's a little slower actually than death warping, but it's not too bad. Into victory. So yeah, the only way to get out of this room is either dying or um, hitting the uh, the void there in the sand. While we make our way back to Clock Town, would you mind if I read out a donation? Uh, we have a quick cover to do, and then we'll have a long cutscene for donations. Sure thing. Oh yeah, we'll have a whole five, six minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alright, so Clock Town Hover is straightforward. We have choose for it, so we don't even need the dog. Sad, sorry, Frank or Z. Just gonna get ISG. Do chew hovers. Oh, I don't know if I ever explained unlocking, but basically when you're hovering, you can target a chew and freely look around and switch your position. You just need to, like, uh, hold slightly up left or up right, and then you can flick a direction and it'll turn you. And with that said, Dope's gonna play Oath to Order. Variety, you can take it away. All right, fantastic. We have a $25 donation from Don't Thank Me, Please. And why we, while we would never thank Don't, I do, as opposed, as in addition to all the rest of us, have a great appreciation for Don't Thank Me, Please. So, I appreciate the $25. And I'd also like to say that um, RAF Events Horizons 3D Zelda Relay benefits Planned Parenthood. You can find the link by typing exclamation point donate in chat, or by scrolling down to the about section. You'll find a QR code there, a link, and an image that you can clink, clink, <laughs> click to see the Tiltify page. Um, while we, I did set the original donation uh, uh, estimate to be around $200, and while we have crushed that, um, thank you everyone except don't. 
Um, it is quite literally impossible <laughs> to uh, be to donate enough to uh, Planned Parenthood. So please keep those donations coming. And I can't wait to see Majora. Awesome, awesome. See, so yeah, a very long cutscene here. It's my favorite cutscene, personally. Yeah, you can do whatever you want during this cutscene. Yeah, people usually play the song of choice to, like, hype up chat or a funny song going to the moon. Because Majora is actually a rather difficult boss compared to a lot of the other Zelda games. Uh, there's three phases, uh, Mask Incarnation, Wrath. Um, I do only have three hearts because I did take a heart of damage going in that uh, Void Plane in Twin Mold's room. So there is a chance I can die. It's unlikely, but if anything's going to kill me, it's going to be the remains flying around. And they shoot orbs that do one heart of damage. So I only have like two chances to survive it before I'm dead. Yeah, you can get hit twice, and then everything gets really scary. <laughs> Very scary. And then Incarnation can always do, like, this really trolly thing where at the beginning of the beginning of Incarnation, you can usually trip trip Incarnation by using Zora, Zora armor, but sometimes Incarnation will run completely around you and then just start shooting lasers at you, and you'll just immediately take damage. It's really not fun. So yeah, it's RNG, it's scary. Yeah, when you're on record pace, this is definitely a very nerve-wracking fight. It's not a free win. Many, 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 many runs have died to Majora. It is very common for that to happen. Yeah, my I remember my first sub-120 in NMG, which back then was any percent. I was going to be like the fourth person to get sub-120, and I was like, oh... I had to stand up during this cutscene and literally go on a walk. It's so long, you can just you can just do that. But I needed to like I was shaking, like I was like I can't, I can't, I gotta breathe. Inhale. <gasps> yeah, this is your final breather before you get thrown into madness. I thought you said breathe in hell. No, <laughs> Which, I said <laughs> <laughs> from breathe what I'm hearing hell. sounds uh, pretty apt for how difficult this fight is. In the words of Frank Ocean, in hell, in hell there's heaven. And that's what this is. You're in hell, but like, you might PB. <laughs> yeah. Not this run, though. Yeah, no, this run is unfortunately going over estimate. I made a lot of big mistakes. Um, not really, didn't really go the way I wanted it to, but... Whatever. Yeah, it's just Woodfall BK, I guess. Yeah, it was Woodfall BK. If I didn't mess that up, I probably would have met Estimate. And I, I failed it in a way that I don't ever fail it. Um. But yeah, still glad to be able to do this run and support a good cause, as always. But with that said, we will do our last super slide of Destiny and probably do the hardest fight. Yep, so here's a super slide. Talk to the kid. He'll say you suck at the game because you have no masks. And then, and then we ball. Okay, also, if any of you are interested in learning this speedrun, um, there are lots of people willing to help in the MM Discord. The MM community is a very nice place to be right now. There's a lot of active moderators and players, so feel free to join if the speedrun piqued your interest at all. 
So Mask Phase takes uh, just two stuns by Zorfins and two Light Arrows, and then there's another phase for Mask. Oh, oh no, he's in. It's just in a bad spot. The wall was getting in the way. That's fine. Oh, uh, and then you get trolled. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna yep. say second phase uh, only needs a jump slash at the end, but I guess now it needs light arrows. So that's still fine. So two light arrow shots. And it's actually a good thing is Dope will be out of magic. Pretty much. Oh, will you be completely out though? Yeah, that sucks. Never mind. So, yep, so you I turn around there on purpose so I don't get hit. <laughs> Do you have a bomb for incarnation? I I have I might. Yeah. If incarnation starts doing a little trolly troll. You don't have Zora armor. Yeah, magic for is it? Uh -oh. I see an orb, dude. Yeah, I see an orb. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just gonna drop a bomb real quick. Yeah, for some reason Majora has a hitbox in the middle of the stage, or Incar our Incarnation has a hitbox in the middle of the stage. Uh, nobody knows why. Well, I think people know why. I don't know why. I think it's just funny. Can we all count down uh, crouch stabs for this last phase? Yeah, we can do yeah, that. Yeah, let's do it. It's 10, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I have normal arrows. Wait here. 10, 9, 8, okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> Come on. That's a good spot. Eight, 7, okay. 6, okay. Five, 5, 4, four three, 3, 2, 1. Oh, what? Good luck on Breath of the Wild. Seconds. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, thank you. Okay. GG's Majora's Mask that was a cool run. That was my first time actually seeing a MM run. It was pretty cool. All right. Yes, we have Senor Taper and the real Noman here for Breath of the Wilds. Hello, hello. Okay. So Breath of the Wild is a bit of an interesting game because the uh, the timing for this game actually starts when you gain control of Link unlike all the other Zelda games where it's on new game or on the file select. So, um, I'll be... As soon as I fade in from this cutscene and gain control, I think that's when the time will start. Um, with me on the commentary today, I have Senor Tapir. Um, I did not, I guess, take over. I'm going to try and focus on this first split. Okay. So we have a little bit of downtime once we gain control of Link because there's another cutscene. But Breath of the Wild has many glitches in the first like five minutes of the run that'll kind of overlap each other and it'll be hard to explain. So once we're going to get the Sheikah Slate and the Sheikah Slate kind of just controls all the abilities that we have for Link. It allows us to get use Bombs, Magnesis, Stasis, and Cryonis. And those will be the four shrines that we've been collecting in the run. Um... And also, uh, Breath of the Wild has a sort of tutorial section called the Great Plateau. And in order to leave the Great Plateau, we have to do those shrines. So even though you'll see us be like flying around and doing stuff, we won't be able to leave because we have to unlock the paraglider and complete the Great Plateau. So the first thing you'll see Noman doing is he's going to, there's a scope on the Sheikah Slate, and he's going to jump into a corner and then scope, and that'll allow Link to flick around in the 180 and clip outside. And then also another thing with Breath of the Wild is that the walls in this game are kind of like one-sided. They aren't like doubly walled. 
so once we get past like the thick wall, like on the inside, the outside walls, we can just like crouch and uncrouch to get out of in most places. So you just saw him do that there. And now we're going to be heading on over to the bomb shrine, which is where we will be getting our bombs. And that'll be our most important mode of transport due to two glitches that we'll be exploiting heavily throughout the run. But first, we're probably going to get some backup food and a shield, which is very, very important. And also a weapon as well here, which we'll be using for something, a couple of tricks on the Great Plateau. But the first trick that we're going to be doing is called a shield clip. And that's going to happen in about like 30 seconds or so. So what you're going to see Noman doing, he's going to run to the Temple of Time in front of him, do a shield jump onto a wall, and he's going to land his shield. And then once he gets that angle that kind of stores Link's position, and then whenever he does a shield jump next, he'll flick. So yeah, there he got the angle. Now he's going to do a shield jump into this, unequip his shield, and then his flick back allows him to clip through walls. And that's how we will be getting through all the shrines in the Great Plateau, is that mechanic right there. Now this next mechanic is pretty insane, I'll explain it a little bit later. We're going to be getting Link caught in the animation and jumping into something that allows us to basically just fly wherever we want. And then the final trick that we'll be doing here is a fall damage cancel, where if we throw a weapon and then re-equip or unequip a shield or a weapon, we won't take any damage. And that's the first two minutes, three minutes of Breath of the Wild. It's four or five major glitches, back to back to back to back, and it's it's a lot to explain. I think that's almost every single trick in the run in the very first split. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you saw him pick up a pot later or a pot earlier, and it's just like any small object we can do that flying glitch with. And thankfully for us, the bombs room is an object of that same size, so we can use that glitch wherever we want. The only requirement that we have to do to use the glitch is to have Link step up onto an object. And once he steps up onto an object while he's in that smuggled state, that's what allows us to get locked in an animation and fly around everywhere. So that's why the bomb zoom is very important. And there's also this glitch about to happen. It's called a wind bomb, where we abuse the bullet time mechanics. We'll place one bomb, and then in bullet time, we place the second bomb. And okay. then that allows the two bombs to... That is very unlucky. <laughs> I did not think I had to eat there, but I should have. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, typically, you don't die there, but... Like one in every twenty-five runs, you will die, and of course, it happens in a in a marathon or charity relay thing. It's so like here's fine, but yeah, we can. That used to be like the biggest thing in Breath of the Wild was using the bullet time mechanics because anything that happens to Link in bullet time, if you leave bullet time directly after it, Link speed will get multiplied by around twenty times the speed that he was in, and that's how most of the glitches were or most of the movement glitches were used. But now since we have BLSS, which is that bolus smuggle slide that you saw at the beginning of the run, we don't have to worry about bullet time mechanics as much anymore. But it's still very important for the wind bomb that we just did. <sighs> now we have a, a slight break. The old man cutscene coming up over here. Yeah, the the old man, uh, King Roem, I don't know, Boss Baramus. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. He's the one who has our paraglider, and he won't he won't give it to us early for whatever reason. We have to go through all of his trials. But thankfully, with the with us acquiring the bomb runes, the inside of the shrines will hopefully go a lot faster and a lot easier. At least some of them will go faster. Because with the with the bomb rooms, we can like skip using the Magnesis room most of the time. Oh no, we, we have to use it once actually. We can skip using the Cryonis rune entirely. Yeah. But now you'll see I'm doing another BLSS all the way over to Magnesis. And to gain speed with this trick, all you have to do is flick your stick back and forth at like a a straight line. 
You don't have to flick fast as long as you are flicking your stick. And you'll also see Nomen scanning amiibos here. This is not for backup food, but actually for an attack up potion. Because, and like someone mentioned in chat just now, we will have to be killing a bunch of bosses. Like the Blights and Calamity. And this is the most effective way to get our attack up food. There are other methods, but Amiibo is just, uh, just nicer. And a very, very nice shield clip into Magnesis. So thankfully the difference between Amiibo and Amiibo is actually only very slight. It's, at, uh, it's like about a 30 second detour if you're doing no Amiibo to get some Razor Shrooms for the attack up. Is this clip into the shrine unbuffered RTA bowl? Yes. Uh, the clip that you just saw Nomen do, that's... It depends on the walls that you're going through, but... The walls in most of the Great Plateau Shrines are thin enough where you can just unequip the shield and then he'll go through the wall. There are some walls that are thicker that you will have to like do an input for, but there's typically other ways around doing like a frame perfect uh, shield clip. Now this is one of the easier shrines. You can just it's not that slow at all to just run through it. There is a pretty hard strat we can use a wind bomb to kind of skip most of this, but it is very risky and not a lot of people go for it unless you're towards the top 10. Saves like, what, six seconds to go for that wind bomb anyways? Mm -hmm. And it is a very, very risky wind bomb. If you miss it, you just instantly die just because of how high you have to go. Now, no one will be doing the probably the hardest BLSS in the run. It's the one all the way over to Stasis. There are going to be a few things that he's going to have to look out for. Um, one of them is he's going to try to squeeze through a, a slight path under a bridge. And that will require some stamina to flick through. Because as he's, he's flicking the analog stick here. And that does somewhat get tiresome if you start doing it for like 15 or more seconds. Which he will be doing here. He gets through the bridge just nicely, and now he has to avoid all the trees and the rocks here, which is a pain sometimes, but he navigates that very, very cleanly. Now, on to our next wind bomb. This is to get us all the way up to the stasis shrine. It's gonna scale an entire mountain with this one wind bomb. Very well executed. Very, very nice. And one of the nice things about Skew is that it doesn't get lost unless you do another shield flip fully. So since he used the shield clip in Agnesis and didn't really do another shield flip like onto the shield again, he's able to save that Skew and then use the same Skew in the Stasis Shrine without having to re-get like, a Lynx Angle again on a wall. And now, stasis, there isn't really much as well here. There is a wind bomb that. Are you gonna do that, wind bomb? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go for the wind bomb. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this wind bomb isn't too hard. It's probably one of the more friendly, harder wind bombs. <laughs> <laughs> it just saves a lot of time. It's just, I mm -hmm. feel like it's worth doing. Also, mm -hmm. I do like a, a noob strat for this wind bomb, anyways. Maybe and even like... then, like the noob strat loses you, like half a second to a second. Uh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Should I go for it again? <laughs> you have the food, sure. Yeah, why not? Well, that's the... That's the hard thing about wind bombs, is that it really why did depends. I not oh, jeez. I'm just gonna run. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah, wind bombs really depend on where you place both of your bombs because the angles at which the bomb hit each other affects the angle that which Link goes in. It's a very, very big physics problem that you have to do in your head every time you want to do a wind bomb. 
but thankfully uh most of them aren't very tight like this wind bomb you're trying to land on the maybe a 10 meter ledge if that but most of them you kind of just going towards like a big area like the wind bomb that he went all the way up to the shrine like he had a massive area to go to that's kind of why some of the wind bombs in the shrines are very difficult and people tend to not go for if they're learning the game it's because it's a very narrow tight space that you're trying to enter i am disappointed i i practiced that wind bomb <laughs> i practiced that one right before but you know what it's okay <laughs> And now we're going to head over to Cryonis, the most useless rune in the run, because we legitimately don't use it. And this is going to be like another BLSS. It's going to be a, a bit more scarier because there is cold damage ticking while you're doing it. So you have to like kind of do this while also uh, clipping into the shrine while there's a timer on you. But it isn't too bad. But this is where you're, you're seeing him turning the BLSS a lot. And the way to turn it is you're just going to have to force Link to face the opposite direction in which you want to go. Because you're floating on like a frictionless... Uh, that's not what I meant to do. There you go. Okay, nice. I was a little bit right there. Because yeah. <laughs> that's one of those clips that I was mentioning earlier where that the doors of the shrines are actually thicker walls than the side than the walls of the shrines itself, which is pretty weird, but it's a thing that the developers did. And since the doors of the shrines are thicker, that's one of the sh clips where we have to equip the shield on a, the specific frame that Link flicks back, and that's like. I, I don't know how it specifically works, but I'm assuming it's because you're further into the wall in that frame. And then you have to equip the shield, which pushes Link through the wall and forces him through it. I Rather than, I don't know. That, that sounds right. I think so. Um, unfortunately, that's a frame-perfect trick in a game where you can only buffer two frames at a time. So. Mm -hmm. And just like that, we skip the entire shrine without using the Cryonis rune. One of the weird things that developers did, though, is they kind of foresaw this in a way. Because if you're able to get to the monk without collecting the pedestal and the rune, the monk will tell you to go back and get the pedestal for the rune, which is, I think, pretty unique. I don't know why that they would do that or why they would foresee that happening, but they did cut it in. They did add it. And that's why we have to lose 30 seconds getting the rune that we don't use. And now one more BLSS all the way to the Temple of Time, which you'll see. It's like that little building in the distance to get the paraglider. Hey. And you'll see Noman doing one more fall damage cancel where he'll be throwing. I think he'll be physically throwing the spear and then equipping his shield. And Link just won't take any damage because whenever you do that, it resets his grounded position for some reason very nice step up with how the physics work on the objects and stuff you, if you angle link in a specific way and have the ball or whatever you're holding in a specific manner okay that's fine i didn't want to scare you or anything but yeah if you can <laughs> get link to jump in like a specific way on a specific angle it's very hard to do, and there's not a lot of places to do it. But that one place is, Link will just get projected in like a specific angle. And that one is specifically towards the Temple of Time, and it gains you a little bit of speed. Or a lot of speed, but it's very cool to do. I was holding my breath for that fall damage cancel there. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was terrified. Because in practice, I did mess that up twice. And now we'll be skipping all the game's content and heading straight for Calamity and Hyrule Castle. 
in this BLSS. It will take us about a minute to do, but it's all worth it. So now this part of the run, it's a little bit intensive. There's a lot going on, but the main gist of it is, is that we're going to be killing enemies very fast, stealing their weapons so that way we can have the right amount of weapons, the least amount of weapons for the Calamity. Because one of the mechanics in Breath of the Wild is that there is weapon durability. And whenever a weapon does X amount of hits, then it'll be close to breaking. And when your weapon breaks, you won't have it anymore. So that's why we have to get a lot of weapons in this run. But we're trying to make that perfect and get as little weapons as we can. So we'll be getting, I believe, four weapons in Castle. Four weapons held by your hand and then one bow. And a few ancient arrows as well. Ooh. That was close. <laughs> that was very clutch. Yeah, Breath of the Wild has a problem with loading things in, especially when you're going long distances. So the Hyrule Castle wasn't loaded. That's how we were able to get into the Hyrule Castle, actually, because there's supposed to be a gate there. And we got there so fast that the gate wasn't loaded. But it is kind of RNG whether the gate is loaded or not. And I didn't really want to mention it because I don't want to catch it. You want to jinx it, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Exactly. So thankfully, we got the good RNG. And we're able to start stacking up on our weapons. Next weapon he's going to get is from a Zolfos from a Boomerang. That's specifically for the Thunderblight. I think that's the only reason why we would get this. And now we're going to be cooking our attack up meal, which is why he got those a fish and that Razor Shroom. It'll give us 3 minutes and 50 seconds of attack up. Oh, eight. You got a crit. Oh, wow. A crazy crit. Yeah. But really, all that we need in this run is about three minutes of attack up to defeat all the all four blights, calamity, and then Dark Beast is an auto scroller in this run, so we don't really have to worry about damaging him too much. Yeah, it's nice that you got the crit, even though it does nothing for us. There are other crits in this game that give you extra health and something else, but. If you're learning, a crit's very nice. It's just comforting. And now we'll be getting our strong bow. And the edge of duality. Very clean. And then one last wind bomb all the way up to up all the way up to Sanctum, and then we'll be performing a glitch called Windblight Skip, which takes a little, little bit of inspiration from like Ocarina of Time with the setup. We'll be forcing Link into a corner and then doing a few jumps to get Link in a per perfect position, aim at a specific spot, and then walk into the cutscene. And what this does is any object that's like in the air, when the cutscene loads, it's stuck in the air. So the arrow is specifically in a position where it's stuck in Windblight's head, and Windblight will be taking damage throughout the cutscene. With one arrow, we were able to kill Windblight. Now on to Waterblight. And there isn't too much RNG with these blinds. There is some, but for the most part, we're going to be choreographing these fights. Uh, this is a mechanic that I didn't mention earlier because well, we haven't done it yet, but it's called double hits. Where if you face Link away from the direction that you want to hit, there's a chance, or not a chance, but if you position yourself properly, the weapon will hit the object two times instead of one. So we're able to get two hits on Water Blight in like one of the locations on his body. We'll be abusing that for basically every polite. Nice. Good headshot. Clean. 
I didn't even think I was gonna hit that. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> A little bit sloppy there. That's okay. That's okay. Now on the fire blade. Nice. He got good RNG. On phase one. Yeah, the main gist of this is that we're just trying to hit these bites as much as we can with as little hits as we can. And there is a slight bit of RNG in each of these blights that'll just lose you time, but it won't like kill you for the most part. But if you do like mess up one thing and get yourself off rhythm, it is very scary. So don't be blowing up a bomb to knock Fire Blight down, hit him three times with his boomerang, and then try to get double hits here. Nice, clean. Now on the Thunder Blight, this bite's the probably the scariest one. More double hits, very clean. Nice, good clean phase one. If you mess up phase one a little bit, it will it will mess up phase two if you aren't careful. So I was just trying to give no man as much. Concentration as you can. Yeah, at the end of the right part of the cycle there. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this phase wouldn't go smoothly. But since he did phase one correctly, all he has to do is throw this boomerang, headshot Thunderblight, and he'll just fall down. And then next is Calamity. Calamity is probably one of the scariest ones. If, you, if something happens there, you'll be going straight back to the start. But we're going to be just shooting a bunch of arrows at Calamity on phase one. Nice. Got the fire rush, going to hit him with the boomerang. We're going to run over, get some bomb arrows. And then onto the headshots. Nice. Nice. <laughs> very, very, very clean. And it's just <laughs> one thing left. He has to get one last parry, and then we'll be on to the stun lock. Very, very nice. Now all that he has to do is get double hits on Calamity and then slam it at a specific time in his animation. Which is pretty lenient, but it's still very scary if you mess it up. And then Calamity will continuously just get knocked back down every time you slam. Very, very clean. Those are beautiful double hits. And one more cycle to go. Nice. And oh man, that was stressful. <laughs> that's the bomb stress. Yeah. The bomb stress is very scary. Some people have audio cues for the lasers. Some people have visual cues. I don't know what Nomen has. So I just try to let him go. <laughs> <laughs> I just use the audio cues that you came up with. Mm -hmm. But yeah. In the Calamity fight, there is, like, weapons around that we had to pick up in order to complete the fight. But there's only two things that we had to grab, and thankfully he was able to get those very smoothly. And now onto the two and a half minute auto-scroller. This, this part's like a victory lap. I like this part. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there are some audio cues here to try to optimize when you shoot the arrow. But... Oh, yeah. So he's able to shoot the arrow just right before it came out, and then he's able to kind of pre fire the shot. And if you pre fire it very nicely, Zelda won't speak, and like the arrow will hit the frame that those spawn. And then we call that speechless. 
This is very, very satisfying to get if you ever get it. Yeah, that's Breath of the Wild. Very, very jam packed run. There's some downtime between every shrine, but once you get off the plateau, it's just. It's just pedal to the metal. Oh. Oh, that's. That's a two second time loss. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be just two more phases of Dark Beast list. One of them is going to be shooting under the belly. The other one's going to be shooting the eye of Dark Beast, and then it'll be GG. Uh, any shoutouts, Snowman? Uh, shoutouts to um, literally everybody in the Breath of the Wild community. Um, Limp Cube's tutorial for teaching everybody uh, to appear on commentary. Um, my mom and dad. <laughs> 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 my brothers, my sisters, my cats and dogs. <laughs> my pet turtle, Jerry. Uh, yeah, this is a very clean run. As soon as this arrow connects, that's when the timing stops. For this one, at least. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you both. Move time. on to Ocarina of Time. All right, thank Good you. Luck. Orbs, are you muted? Hello. <laughs> oh. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I am the Corpse, <laughs> and I'm running GSR today in Ocarina of Time, and I have a commentary for the run. Thank you for saying that I was muted. I figured you were trying to talk, and you just weren't. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Claire Lindy. Uh, Corpser, do you want to introduce what we're watching here? Oh yeah, this is the <clears throat> the very beloved intro cutscene. Um, for this game, the intro cutscene uh, is not necessary for like the timing, but as you know, this is a relay, so it will be really hard to cut the intro time in the games that have uh, intro skip. Uh, comparing to like the past runs so we decided that it was like smart <laughs> to just not skip the cutscene so yeah we're gonna watch this beautiful three minutes and or what minutes. category is this oh yeah this is uh gsr the it means ganondorf source requirement and it means that we are going to have to fight Ganondorf. And we, in, to be able to fight Ganondorf, we have to get every single item that we will need uh, to actually uh, kill Ganondorf. Which is, well, there is a, a whole list. But it has also like some restrictions. Like we cannot manipulate our inventory. We cannot do uh, wrong warps or even cutscene skips on blue portals. So, like, the, all these restrictions are going to lead to a very interesting category and run where we're going to have to also beat two dungeons of this game. Only two dungeons are necessary to... Well, actually, <laughs> you can you can finish this game without, like, beating any two dungeons. Specifically to get certain items and to get the... The bridge uh, from Sirs. Okay, so uh, the beginning is gonna be very standard, very normal uh, for <laughs> the for OT. We're gonna try to West Escape and get ocarina because we're gonna need after it's not actually needed anymore but we are using like tricks that do need it yeah so the first thing he's gonna do is get sword and shield he gets the sword and shield so that way he can leave the forest 
Usually the requirement for Sword and Shield is to go to the Deku Tree, but we're not gonna go to the Deku Tree. Even though that is technically the way you're supposed to leave the forest, there are many ways to leave the forest, as this is Ocarina of Time after all. Um, so he's just gonna get 40 rupees. That's why he's doing all this weird movement, like, through the bushes and stuff, is to get 40 rupees. And he is going to get the sword. And once he collects 40 rupees, that's how much it costs to buy the shield. He'll buy the shield, and then he'll leave through the front of the forest. Yep. We're gonna, we're gonna see some fancy movement to get all the rupees. He needs the sword and shield, not really to leave the forest, but he needs it for a trick he's going to be doing later. You actually don't need sword or shield to leave the forest, but he will he will need it later for literally one trick. All he needs the shield for is one trick, and then he's never going to use it again. Yep, well, yeah. <laughs> well, the Deku shield, I mean... The Deku shield, yeah. <laughs> he will use the adult shields, but that's a little different. You do need yeah. the shield as adult. Well, you do need the shield. You need one shield as adult. You don't necessarily need the original, the starter shield, the Hylian shield. Mm -hmm. can even so here the... he's gonna attempt to do a trick called a Wes. You can jump slash into water. And if you come out of water before your speed is stopped, you will continue to be sliding as long as you're holding a position on the con control stick known as ESS position. If you hold the control stick just outside of the dead zone, Link will do a little shuffling animation. That animation does not set his movement speed, so he can actually preserve movement from other forms of getting speed with that uh, position on the control stick. And he actually failed it, but then he did a backup trick called Pokey Escape, where you clip into the guy guarding the tree stump, and from there you can just literally roll under him, uh, because he'll pop up on the lip of that tree stump. And now he's getting the ocarina. So now that he has the, has the ocarina, he's going to be going to Kakariko. Uh, Kakariko has a couple items that you need as child. One item that is very useful in this run, and then one item that is not necessarily required, but is faster to get. Sometimes going out of your way to get items in this game will make the overall speed run faster, even if you don't need to pick them up. So you'll see him pick up. I don't want to spoil what it is, but I, you probably know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want spoilers, but you're gonna gonna ask yourselves, yeah. why? <laughs> as, as if anyone doesn't really know what <laughs> what the Mine item is. that he's going to be getting in the speedrun is. Uh, <laughs> for that one person out in the crowd, I'm looking out for you, so you can be surprised. <laughs> as a fun fact, uh, I I thought. For like a lot of time, that that guard, like the Kukiri guard, was called Pokey because of the name. A lot Pokey. of people think it's called Pokey. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the what his name is. I don't know if he even has a name, but no, it's, it's definitely not Pokey. Doesn't. Apparently, Pokey was like the guy that found yeah, the trick. Yeah, Pokey is the guy and that they, found the trick. And they they called it Pokey Skip. So we are like, there's a lot of people confused because of that. <laughs> Because we, we thought, you know, the guard was called Pokey. I remember even looking looking it up, like... Hey, uh, I want, like, a picture of Pokey. <laughs> on the internet and that. Your corpse is doing another West. This West doesn't actually save time, even though this slide is faster than regular mo walking. The only reason it saves time is if you are in ESS position, you're considered to be busy, and so Link won't interact with the owl as he's going by it. Super now we're just going to do a little cuckoo collecting. You have to collect all the chickens around Kakariko and put them back in the pen. And if you do that, you get a sweet reward. 
What will that be? I wonder. Ow. And yeah, sometimes the cuckoo can be slippery. Their movement is totally RNG. <clears throat> they have like a spot where they don't move like too far away from it, but the movements are totally random. You also notice that he does a lot of walking backwards everywhere he goes. Walking backwards is generally faster than walking forwards in this game. Mm -hmm. Like, as a child, it's like the second fastest way to move uh, without glitches. Uh, only beaten by side hops. For some reason, as a child, side hops are like really fast compared to every other way of movement. And a saddle is basically the same, so it's not worth it. Yeah, side hops are like only faster if you can do them frame perfectly. And since they're, you know, a set direction that you're going, doing that and going frame perfectly, it generally is not faster to use side hops unless you have to go in a straight line and for a short distance. Usually it's better to just back walk or to use a combination of like back walks and rolls because rolls are also faster than just regular walking. Yep. Yo, that guy, <laughs> sometimes can talk to you even if you don't actually want to. Uh, these cuckoos were uh, a little bit of a disaster because of their position. And, yeah, let's see if we can still get the Navi dive. It's not, it's not too bad. Uh, to me, I didn't self lock there because <laughs> you can you can actually self lock in getting this precious item that we're gonna need later. All right, so now that we have the bottle, we're actually going to go to Bottom of the Well. Bottom of the Well is like an end game dungeon, but he does a trick here called a Navi Dive, which basically lets you fall off the ledge while talking to Navi. And if you're talking to someone while... Well, if you're talking to someone in general, a lot of actors won't interact with you. And one of those actors happens to be water. So if you're falling down and you're talking, you can just fall right through the water. Fair Corpse got a, another glitch <laughs> called Infinite Sword Glitch, and we usually refer to that as ISG, just for short. Infinite Sword Glitch uh, allows you to, if you shield damage in the air, you can kind of stick in the air like that. And then now Corpse is going to do an Ocarina Dive, which is simpler. To, it's similar to a Navi Dive in that it doesn't let actors interact with you. That load plane right there is an actor, so it allows him to go into the unloaded basement. And then another quirk of water in this game is it extends down infinitely. So even though the water is short or shallow in the main room, if you go down in an unloaded basement, you can actually swim up through the water, and then he used the water to get into this little area, and that allowed him to get bomb shoes. Bomb shoes are really, really useful this early in the game. Having explosives allows you to do a lot of glitches that you normally can only do with like enemies pretty much anywhere, and so having explosives this early is very convenient. Air Corps is going to get caught by the dead hand, and the dead hand is just going to bring him back to the beginning of the dungeon quicker. Technically, it's not quite faster, I think, to get voided that way. Uh, but we're, we need uh, to get to have, like, a certain amount of health. <laughs> so, yeah, health management is going to be um, something in this run. Like, you're going to see me like buffering health <laughs> in some spots here we're going to do a little setup to talk to the sign or target the sign that'll keep you from talking to the owl again since you're considered busy yet again and now all we have to do is make it to the castle before night what a polite owl Right here, he 
unloaded the chain and then walked onto it, that lets you... Basically, the chain won't update its actual position until you load it. Or you uncall it. And so, if you keep it cold and then walk next to it, you can get on top of it even though the drawbridge is technically supposed to be already up. You can even, like, wait for it to finish the movement and basically teleport all the way there. This owl can be skipped, but it doesn't save that much of the time. Because we actually, right now, we need to, like, pass. Uh, yeah, does. so talking to the owl right there doesn't waste that much time. It is slower than skipping the owl, but we have to wait for daytime anyways. And daytime starts moving again during that cutscene, so it's not that big of a deal to just talk to the owl. Here we're going to do a trick known as a seam walk. Basically, you can walk up slanted seams like this. And then there's collision up on top of this wall, so he can just walk all the way around and avoid the guards. Once again, this doesn't technically save time, but since we're waiting on day anyways, it is it does make it easier to make it before daytime. Here, we're doing a trick called a damage boost. I, I like lost my train of thought there. Doing a trick called a damage boost to get up onto that ledge and skip the block puzzle and also skip talking to Talon. And here we're going to get past the guards. The guards can be annoying and they can ruin many speedruns. We'll see how well this goes. Their vision is not great, but it's also amazing sometimes. Yeah, we're going to go save. Uh, sometimes I go like recklessly, <laughs> but the like the first side hops weren't promising, so I just you know. <laughs> that was I didn't target properly there, but <laughs> we still were able to get past it. Yeah, you can literally just get past them if you side hop frame perfectly. But yeah, the first high hops weren't looking promising, so yeah, it it wasn't worth it. And here we did another trick that's called <laughs> Sticky Situation. It's actually like a trick, because normally you will like retreat on the stick. <laughs> it's just something funny to do, like to make this cutscene bearable. <laughs> Also remember that uh, this event is for the cause of Planet Parenthood. Remember to get your donations going. Uh, we have had quite a lot, but we're still we're still on time to get more and more donations. So remember to hit to hit that um, admiration mark or exclamation mark um, donate. I think. Thank you for doing my job for me. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a cutscene. <laughs> I, I I was about to ask if we were supposed to be doing CTAs after I heard Corpser say that. Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to encourage. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh yeah, it was the name. So yeah, for those who are not aware of the lore of this game, well, we're basically sneaking, and well, Zelda tell us that Ganondorf looks like a bad guy, <laughs> and she doubts based on her dreams about his loyalty to the king. It's nice to have some lore. <laughs> there are people that haven't played the game and run it. Can you believe it? <laughs>
always so shocking to me. <laughs> people say they've only speedrun this game, they never played it as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Or people that play it, or that speedrun it now, that were born after the game came out, it's so wild to me. Yeah, 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 honestly. Even, like, even people that are, like, you know, way younger than the game have played the game. <laughs> so it's funny. It's a funny backstory. Okay, so we got, got Delta Slayer, which is not necessary, but the item we get after it is totally necessary. necessary. Here we're going to do a trick to skip another cutscene. Corpser is going to backflip and then get pushed by the bomb chew damage into this cutscene and die before the cutscene activates. That allows him to get the song and also not watch the cutscene since most of the time ah. things are given to you on the first frame of a cutscene. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> uh, I... Wait, 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 what happened? I don't know. <laughs> I do was you, sure that I do hit... you have the song? Yeah, I have the song. Uh, right? Okay, <laughs> you like save and didn't continue? Yeah, I don't know why. I, I, I'm sure I pressed no. Not continue. I mean, wait. Ah, I see where the issue is. <laughs> okay, it's not that bad. Because we can just get back on track. Mm, I don't know if we should go from... No, I don't think... I don't think it's faster to go from the river. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Like, my, my mind just crashed for a second. Is this guy, like, different? Is this guy different? That's so weird. I'll just go through the river. <laughs> yeah, one last try and... Yeah, there's... I don't know. <laughs> That's never happened to me, so probably it's different. It's... It looked like it was gonna work. So I'm gonna, I'm going through the river. Yeah, normally you just <clears throat> get teleported to Hyrule's castle, but I guess I was, I think I was thinking on the next warp that we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna do, I mean. The next save warp. I hear you're gonna get to see another way to escape the forest. Uh, yeah. First, we're going to talk to this owl, because this owl is here after you get Zelda's lullaby. <laughs> and then Corsair is going to use the exit to Zora's River to escape the forest. To do this, there's a number of ways to do it. The first way we're going to try is simply clipping into that stone right there. There's... Yeah, so we're gonna try and clip through this stone right here. And. Kinda tricky. Normally I listen to the music, but <laughs> there's no yeah. music when you have some of those below. <laughs> yeah, you, you can do a ground clip in there and exit the forest that way. And now we just need to make our way to Hyrule Castle. Yeah. <clears throat> Are Please we going no. to take a little bit of time to travel? Yeah, we're hiking. Yes. Well, in that case, I have a $5 donation from Bewildebeast. He says, oh. pause, champions. Can Corpsers say moo? Can I? Ooh. I don't know. That might not be safe. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to do it for him. Moo. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure he appreciates it. Oop. The pause buffered angle change. I was, I was nervous. I didn't want to talk to the owl. The owl is still there, I think. Oh, he's not. No, he's not there. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't want to. Like, I was. I wanted to be very sure. 
Um, should be fine. So. Okay, that was a ride. <laughs> but like what was worrying me the most was actually getting on time because if we don't get here, I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to curse it. But yeah, if we don't get in time, we will have to wait for um, daytime. So yeah, that was uh, Ramonka. <laughs> but yeah, we're in Temple of Time. Wait, oh, we forgot the stones. You also forgot to get the shield, but it's okay. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here we're going to do we're going to do a major sequence break. Uh, normally, you need all three of the spiritual stones and the Ocarina of Time and the Song of Time to get past this door. However, there is a little gap in the door. And if you do a sp precise backward side hop, you can actually clip out of bounds and then jump slash back inbounds to get past that door. Yeah, exactly. Just a tiny gap. But it's enough to get past through. Isn't that funny? Like... Imagine if the devs back in the day were like, hmm, that tiny spot, you can see the other side. We should, like, you know, um, seal it. A funny piece of info is an older version of that door actually did not have that gap. <laughs> so they changed it, and when they changed it, they allowed that sequence break to happen. Exactly. Beating like the three dungeons to open that door takes something like four minutes. Um, uh, so yeah, if like GSR without this like sequence break will be way different. In fact, like like a year ago, I think we actually phrased like GSR with um, child dungeon. In my opinion. It was because um, in 3D, in all 3D, you cannot uh, skip the door of time just like that. So, or at least in the time, no, I don't know. So, <laughs> yeah, the people in the chat know. <laughs> so yeah, to make it able to race with a like person that was running on 3D, we had to <laughs> so actually run with child dungeons and it was like one hour extra of run it was funny but yeah thanks to like skipping the three dungeons we don't need to worry about that as i said at the beginning we just need two dungeons this game is very well code you know all things considered considering how many crazy things you can do in this game it's kind of shocking how well the game stays put together regardless of what you do. <laughs> so it kind of is pretty well coded in some ways. Maybe not in other yeah. ways. Yeah, now that you're talking about it, that's true. Like in some games, some skips like lead to the game, game crashing because it doesn't know how to deal with like the skips. Like uh, in Wind Waker, they were saying, you know, that not completing like a fortress in the first trip will lead to a crash after. This kind of doesn't happen. That happens in some instances, but it's not very common that we will say like, this will be faster, but we have to do it so it doesn't crash. Mm, there's not instances of that, at least that I'm aware of. So yeah, that's true. <laughs> we can do a lot of stuff with the game without breaking it. Like, badly. <laughs> yeah, a little bit uh, more cutscenes. I have to get the shield. Because <laughs> I forgore. Yeah, I was, I was too happy <laughs> about getting in time uh, to the castle that I totally forgot about the shield. But yeah, it's not a big time loss. Because there is literally a shield. Yeah. There's a shield where we're going next. So. 
It's not that big of a deal. It's just it's, it's slightly it's slower. Uh-huh. Less slow than saving and not continuing. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I don't know what, like, I literally was, like, thinking the next one. I literally, like, thought about it slowly. I was like, okay, then I'm going to save and not continue. And then I was like, what happened? <laughs> I don't know. That sometimes happen. happens. Okay, and we actually have to save warp here. Um, there's no way to pass the door of time. Like, the door of time is, is still closed. It's like a flag that it's preserved even if you are adult, which it's funny, you know, because some other flags kind of assume that since you are adult, uh, you have gone past it. Like, for example, the Dodongo's Cavern Boulder. Uh, it literally just assumes that since you're adult, like, it doesn't have to be there, you know? But for, for some reason, like, in in the Temple of Time, that's not the case. Door is still sealed. Closed. Yeah, and most walls in this game are only solid on one side. The Door of Time is, like, an exception because it's, like, a whole like rectangle of walls and that's why you can't go through it it's kind of crazy that they decided to do that just for the door of time but yeah here we are you think they thought hmm did someone actually manage to go out without opening the door of time i don't think so <laughs> i don't think they thought that i think they did it on accident yeah, like designing the, the texture or whatever, like the, the model. It was just like, oh, okay, let's leave the collision there. But actually talking about, like speaking about um, the collisions, that's something that we are very grateful, like the one-sided collisions, because there's a lot of <laughs> cases where uh, you can just go past things <laughs> because they don't have collision. So, yeah, it's it's very useful. Okay, now we have the shield. Ah, oh, you missed, buddy. We're gonna get the next item, though. Yeah, so we're actually kind of going in the correct sequence here, since uh, Sheik tells us to go get the hookshot and Kakariko. We're actually going to go do that first. However, we're not going to be using it to do what is the next thing in the sequence of the game. We just need it because the hookshot is a very useful item. That's scary. Uh, you can actually can get uh, voided if you get hit by one of those. Yeah, sometimes Dampe can be like really mean and put the flames right where you are falling. 54. Still fast enough for the heart piece. Yeah. We still got the heart piece. I mean, <laughs> getting hit twice. That's pretty good. So to exit this area, usually you would go through this door right here and play Song of Time for the Song of Time block. However, since we don't have Song of Time, we're going to have to do a little bit of a different strategy. So since that door shuts not automatically, it like comes down when you walk through it, you can actually side hop back through the door. And if you get caught on the wrong side of the door in this area, you void. So that allows you to get back to the beginning of Dampe's grave. 
And now we're going to be doing a trick known as a hookshot jump. The next place we were going was Shadow Temple, if you can believe that. It's uh, kind of not the intended order of the game yet again, but we're going to use this hookshot jump here. And we're going to walk along the seam that's up here, since there's also a collision up here that you can walk on. And Corsair got Infinite Sword Glitch there. Another property of Infinite Sword Glitch is you can't fall off of ledges. So that just makes traversing the seam a little easier. However, you can also get stuck with an infinite sword glitch like this. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> we saved it, luckily. So normally to enter Shadow Temple, you need either Din's Fire or some way to light all the torches in here. However, if you side hop over the loading zone, you actually will skip the need to do that. And you also don't have the Shadow Temple door loaded, so you can just walk right in. Shadow Temple is one of the few dungeons we actually have to do in this run. You need the Shadow Medallion and the Spirit Medallion to get the Light Arrow cutscene. And so, first thing we're going to do is get Hover Boots. And then after that, we're going to go right to the boss. Which, normally you'd have to like traverse through all of Shadow Temple. And we can technically do that. You don't really need a lot of items to actually beat Shadow Temple. But there is a much faster method than going through all of Shadow. Hello. No music, Monka. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that happens, why that happens, but sometimes you just don't get music. Ah! What is what is wrong with that hand? <clears throat> And yeah, it can get really spooky <clears throat> with no music. <laughs> okay, so now that we have the Hover boots, we're going to do a trick that requires a precise angle and position setup. We're going to do what's called a mega flip here, so you can preserve your speed from getting knocked away by the chew with the shield if you roll into it to gain invincibility frames and then backflip while shielding the damage. That allows you to go backwards in the air really fast. Use that to do a ground clip which allows you to get to, into this unloaded room. And this unloaded room is actually the door, the room right before the Shadow Temple boss. And so now we're doing a complicated setup to clip into the ground under the door. And then we're going to use the chew to get boosted back up into the loading zone, since loading zones actually do stay loaded while most of everything else in the room is unloaded. And now we're at the Shadow Temple boss. Let's go. <clears throat> Yeah, that, <clears throat> that series of tricks are kind of complicated. Uh, they're frame perfect for sure. And yeah, you have to navigate the, the room without like looking at it. So it can get really tricky. So Corpser is going to get infinite sword glitch here. This will keep him from getting knocked up by Bongo Bongo hitting the drum and then now that he has infinite sword glitch he can actually just stand here and have bongo bongo run into him and then the boss dies since yep. infinite sword glitch can also be used to attack things since the sword is always swinging it allows you to kill bosses very quickly like you can stun lock it uh, with certain rhythm but it's just like not worth you know Unless obviously that's very worth to go for it because you cannot if you need for glitch in glitches it'll be funny if you call <laughs> yeah that was shadow temple um 
one of the few dungeons that we actually need to beat uh, Ganondorf with everything from Source. Uh, the medallions need to be from Source. There is a way to, for example, get light arrows, the bridge, without beating the dungeons at all. But it's manipulating the inventory, which is banned. There is also a way to skip these cutscenes after the dungeons, however that is also banned in GSR. Mm -hmm. like there, there's even people that say uh, <laughs> skipping the, these cutscenes is, is not good for content <laughs> uh, in Tassis, so I, I believe them, <laughs> so that's why GSR is very vague. <laughs> it's a joke. Yeah, it's just, you know, restrictions. Uh, there is a category that's called No I Am Wrong Warp that actually lets you, uh, lets you uh, skip these cutscenes as long as you don't wrong warp, you know. It's not as popular, though. Uh, wait, what? Oh, I need this and this. Here we're getting a fairy. Uh, if you play Zelda's Lullaby or most songs in front of a gossip stone, you can get a fairy out of it. This fairy is just so that way we don't die. A little bit of safety. Yeah, it's good to have safety, especially in a marathon run, you know? Now we go to the longest cavern. I said that we don't we only need like two dungeons beaten to complete the run, but we actually have to visit a couple of more dungeons like uh, the longest cavern and forest temple. That's because we also have to collect the items that are in those dungeons. Yes, yeah, so the dungeon item of Dodongo's Cavern is bombs. Bombs are basically just as useful as chews, except for uh, they can be replenished, which is really nice since you are not allowed to get your bomb chews back in any glitched way in this run. We need a replacement for bomb chews at some point since we're going to be using bombs for the majority. Of, or we're gonna use all of our bomb cheese, is what I meant to say. Yep. There are even some people that used to get more cheese uh, in GTA. So this trick right here is known as a. <laughs> it's known as Doom Jump, which I mean I guess you can see why it combines a hookshot jump with dying basically you hook shot the uh ladder on the last frame before you die and then while you're dying you get shot up in the air like in that hook shot jump earlier but the fairy will revive you and since most collision like i said earlier is only solid on one side you can go up through the bridge and then land on top of the bridge and now we have the bombs Yep. And since we don't need to beat Dodongo's Cavern, we're just going to leave right now. That was all we wanted. Yeah, we just casually die, get bombs, and dip. So next thing we need to do is get magic. Magic is required to... I have never seen that setup before. That was funny. Uh, that's the classic uh, chef bear setup. 
Yeah, so we need to get magic. You need magics to be able to shoot light arrows, and since this entire run is based around having light arrows and killing Ganondorf with them, we need to get magic. This is also the only reason we needed to get Zelda's Lullaby. So if there was a way to get magic without Zelda's Lullaby, you wouldn't need to get it. Also, where is Octavia? <laughs> I didn't see the Octorok. Like He jumped down. He did it in a place where I couldn't even hear it. <laughs> And you get attached to them. <laughs> yeah, like this is literally why we get Zelda's lullaby. So as you could see, I tried to do like a glitch with the bombs. Now that we have bombs, we can like um, use more explosives. You know, use <laughs> more explosives than when you own, like we only had shoes because you know shoes are like way harder to get. Okay, so where are we going next? We're going to Forest Temple. But not to beat it. Yeah, so Forest Temple is yet another one of those dungeons that we don't need to beat, but the item that is there, this time instead of being very helpful, is actually required, since that item is the bow. And once again, you can't shoot light arrows without the bow and the quiver specifically. So here we're doing a little setup to backflip past Mido. As an adult, you can just do that. <laughs> they just like, I guess, didn't realize that you could backflip over him. But yeah, usually you would need Saria Song there, but since we don't have that, uh, even if we did have it, it would still be faster to just backflip over him. Here we're doing a clip called a ground or a trick called a ground jump, and that trick basically allows you to do. A backflip but it like gets cancelled and then since you're in your like default animation while falling you can grab that ledge usually when you're backflipping or side hopping you cannot grab ledges in this game but this is the exception and here we're doing another cutscene skip this allows you to get minuet and not have to watch the cutscene and here corpser is going to save and not continue <laughs> this is what he was <laughs> supposed to do before yeah, like, this is what I was thinking about when I died the other time. Yeah, like, we got the minute, the minute, and, like, that's literally, like, what we want. Um, because it's, it's really faster to just go there with minute instead of hiking there. So, and, like, we're literally on the way, so... It's way faster to do it that way. So here we're going to be doing a trick called a hyperextended super slide, or a Hess, or we're going to try to. Uh, hyperextended super slide, basically, it's a lot like the mega flip we did in Shadow Temple, in that you can preserve speed from getting hit with a bomb and then shielding it. However, if you go into ESS position and then shield it, you can actually preserve that speed on the ground. So it's really useful for traversing long distances or really 
even like medium distances, it's like the fastest glitched way to move in this game. Well. <laughs> without SRM. <laughs> right, presumably without SRM. Well, yeah, I tried to... Uh... I, I went for it because it saves a lot of time in this uh, little hike. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, switching angles can be <laughs> can be tough. Hey, we're just trying to do another Hess to get past the bridge. So if you Hess and then put on Hover Boots, you can actually preserve that speed over small gaps since Hover Boots keeps you in your standing state and allows you to skip the bridge. And now we're going to Gerudo Fortress. And we're just going to be passing right on through Gerudo Fortress. We're not going to get the Gerudo card. You don't need that. You don't need much of anything in this game, honestly. Claire, how are we going to get past the gate? Well... You, you see, we're going to do... What what is this trick called? It's like it's a ground clip. Ground clip, yeah. It's a it's a ground clip with a bomb. And so we're just gonna do a precise setup to put bombs in a specific area, and then we're going to get a hover, a one bomb height hover from the first bomb, and then the second bomb is gonna hit him, and he is going to pass through the wall. It's somewhat similar to how the uh, ground clip worked in Shadow Temple, but with bombs you can do it in a lot of different places. Yeah, sadly, I released shield too early. <laughs> uh, but there's ways to... Luckily, there is another way to skip the gate. There is more than one way to do most things in this game. Yeah. This method uh, re will require him to walk around the outside of Gerudo Fortress, and then he's going to jump back and bounds past the gate. So you'll see that here. Oh my god. Ah! No! <laughs> no, 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 you can make that. You can save it. You That's can save it. You can save it. No. Yeah, I could, but like... <laughs> That was funny. Okay, we try one more time. Cause it, it was like not that bad. Hmm. Can I try to go for the ground clip now that I'm here? And that means we're not gonna have, uh, we're not gonna do other tricks because, well, I already cannot. <laughs> yeah, that that was what was supposed to happen. But yeah, I even shielded too early. So here we can actually cross the wasteland with a Hess or going forward. Getting past that first part, you can get through there with hover boots or you can use long shot or you can just Hess over the like sinking sand. And for the first part of this puzzle, it's just completely normal. You just follow the posts. However, the second part of the puzzle, you need to follow an invisible Poe that you need the lens of truth to see. However, if you know the path, you don't actually need the Poe 
So that's what we're going to see him do here. Yeah, you don't need the, <laughs> the the blends of truth. Okay, so now that we're here, uh, we're going to... First thing you need to do in Spirit Temple is get the Mirror Shield. Usually, you have to go through the bottom of the mirror sh er, of Spirit Temple and solve a lot of puzzles. However, there is another way to get the mirror shield, and that's what we're about to see here. Uh, I could have like. <laughs> Uh, try to get more bombs and showcase the really cool trick, but like it's really hard to get bomb drops from those drops. Like going for that RNG. Oh. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, we're just gonna go through the bottom of spirit. Never mind. Yeah, you you can like hover all the way up, but like I didn't have enough bombs to try it. I could have like farmed, but honestly, like <laughs> sometimes you can like check all the the rocks and still don't get a single drop. So bear, go for a little bit of safety, like in regards of RNG. <laughs> We still are going to, like, um, skip a little bit of the dungeon. Okay, so, yeah, this is all pretty vanilla stuff here. Uh, we're just getting into the hands room, and then we're going to go fight the Iron Knuckle, and then we'll get the mirror shield. That dead hand is, or not dead hand, that... Floor Master is kind of funny because you can like avoid him if you do these pushes in a very specific way, but it's like, it's weird. I don't really understand it completely, but it is possible. Yeah, sometimes he just, I don't know, <laughs> attacks you no matter what, and sometimes he doesn't. But yeah, I tried to manipulate it a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, we need a key. To get past this door. No, it fell in the <laughs> void. The bomb? Yeah, the bomb. You didn't throw it far enough. <laughs> yeah, I thought you landed close to it. 
Oh, oh my god. <laughs> that was so close. <laughs> You're giving me a heart attack over here. <laughs> I think it's pretty cool that that's like the intended strat of that room. Like, the devs were like, okay, you actually have to use your brain for once in this game to solve this puzzle in a unique way. I kind of wish they did that more, because most of the puzzles in this game are like not hard. I mean, they kind of tried in Master Quest, but Master Quest feels more like, haha, you talking to us gonna be like in vanilla. How fool. <laughs> and they like hint you to do it, to resolve it like you will do in vanilla and then just laugh at you <laughs> because of it. I feel like that's the master quest experience. Okay, so, so, so yeah, now that we have the mirror shield, we're just going to go straight to the boss door. We don't need anything else. Usually you would need a boss key, but as you saw in Shadow Temple, you can skip boss keys in this game, and we're going to be doing that again here. Yeah, so a, a neat little trick you can do here is you can actually duplicate the bomb drops by simply breaking the pot, not picking it up, and then leaving and then re-entering it. Since the game doesn't set the flag that you actually got the bomb drop already, it'll just make another one. But it also won't get rid of the first one, it's kind of weird. So here we're doing a trick, we're gonna climb the statue, and then we're going to get really close to the head. People. And then, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're... <laughs> they as you can scared. see, the collision on the top of the head is kind of weird and can lead to some pretty interesting situations. But yeah, we're just going to try and get into the head. And then from there, we're going to do the boss key skip. Okay, so... We're going to put on hover boots, we're going to backflip, and then we're going to backflip again, and that'll allow us to clip out of bounds. And then oh from here, uh, we're going to jump slash into the loading zone, except for the loading zone is, is a little finicky, and it does not extend out very far. So we will have to try that again. But yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it's a pretty cool trick. And it was, it's like relatively young. I think my angle was kind of weird. I don't know why. Complete. Okay. Those walls are an example of the walls that have collision by just one side. Uh, so you can actually clip in bounds. Like you can just literally just go past the the wall. <laughs> so if you like, if you get really close to it, you can just get dragged into that tiny um, um, corridor. All right, so this boss fight is pretty easy. You can do a little trick where you get right up next to her and you just can crouch stab her and she just cannot hit you there. So we're gonna do nine and a half. Well, <laughs> nine slashes and then one regular slash. And then from here, we're gonna do a setup where she's going to swing into the corner and then 
clip out of bounds by hookshotting her, and then she's going to die. And while she's dying, Link is actually still falling, and so he voids, and when he comes back, the cutscene is clear. So that saves a little bit of time. Enough to consider it, you know? Because, like, <laughs> failing that means, like, almost three minutes of time loss. I will say even more, depending on, like, if you enter it through, like, up top. So, yeah, it's it's worth to consider it in runs. Probably it will be <laughs> better to not do it in marathons, unless you are, like, um, confident. Because, yeah, it can lose a lot of time. But, yeah, we did it. Oh no, is Beast, is Beast still awake? <laughs> kind of like this boss fight. <clears throat> this boss fight is literally the worst boss fight in the game. Yeah. It is so lame. So you're basically waiting for Twin Rova to shoot at you. But when Twin Rova shoots at you, it's completely random. And as you can see, they can, can just kind of like fly around for a while before they decide to shoot at you. And you have to do this three times for the second phase to start. There's one. Where are you going? <clears throat> There's two. That was weird. <laughs> uh, was that three? Uh, yes. Yeah, this can happen. They just fly out of your range. Where is it? Where is it? You can get really. You stupid. are you are so lucky that it didn't shoot. Yeah, I know. It can get really spooky. Okay, so phase two is much quicker. Uh, so you have to reflect three of the same energy type. However, at the first part of the fight, she will always shoot three of the same energy type in a row. And then from there, well, you won't have to do an extra set of this, so. So now that we're going to get the last one, we're going to do it over here by her. And then we're going to crouch stab her until she's dead. That's this cool. is kind of like the bongo bongo fight, except for it's way less hits and timing it is actually kind of preferable in this instance, since you don't have to get infinite sword glitch and the timing is much easier. Exactly. Like, um, it's more lenient. It's like, especially if you jump slash her instead of uh, do an initial crush step, you have like a lot of time. You don't have to stun lock her. Like, bongo bongo. Oh, there is beast. No! I'm kind of low on health. <clears throat> Actually, yeah, I'm kind of very low on health. <clears throat> um...
I can go for hearts during the fight. Okay, so now we have to go to the forest temple to get the bow. And that's why we got the Minuet of Forest right at the, right at the beginning of uh, the adult section of the run. So, like, anyway, we'll, we'll have had to go there. But it saves a little bit of time to do that, the things in that order. All right, so this is why we got Minuet earlier, so that way we can just go straight back after beating Spirit Temple. And now that we're here, like I said earlier, the only thing we need is the bow. And... <laughs> and I wanted a He was spooked. There. He was spooked. Yeah, I was spooked. Ah, uh, your health is fine. Uh, you know how Stalfos can go? <laughs> Alright, so, uh, usually you would need to get three keys in order to get up to the bow. However, uh, you may have noticed that we've already missed one key, and we're just getting that hard for safety. So, the fight with these Stalfos can be ah. kind of scary, because they do at least one heart each, and there, there you go. <laughs> I knew it. I just knew it. They combo with me. <laughs> It's okay. Doesn't lose his down much of the time. Like the other option was to get the fairy, but I don't know. Probably faster than dying. <laughs> but yeah, it was. Yeah, a probably. Hard <laughs> it was a hard choice. Don't grab the heart. <laughs> we'll direct it to the heart. Wow, I don't know. You are so lucky that that disappeared. The heart? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, anyways. Uh... We needed our health to be low because we're about to die again. That's also why we're getting another fairy. It's going to be another thing similar to the jump we did in Zongo's Cavern. Uh, we're just going to do it again here to get the bow early. So first thing we need to do is get into a very precise position. And then we're going to drop three bombs, backflip, crouch stab, and then we're going to pause buffer until a specific frame. On that frame is going to be one where we get pushed really far back from the bombs. Because there's three bombs in one place, their collisions overlap on each other and the push becomes bigger. 
so that allows us to enter the door and then not actually walk through the door. And so now we're doing a specific setup to hookshot the chest on a very specific frame. And when you do that, you get another hookshot jump. And that allows you to get into the second Stalfos fight room without actually having to go through the rest of Forest Temple. However, since this room is closed, we need to clip out of bounds in order to reset the room. So Corpser is just going to do another mega flip here to get out of bounds. You can get you can get like a weird angle from that wall sometimes, uh, because like you you could notice in the first mega like I got speed like you you saw link like shuffle in the on the ground, so I guess that that was what the issue because I totally got at least the first mega. That's why I was like what. So the reason that we needed to go out of bounds to do this trick. Because you could just go in this room without doing that. Uh, we needed to have the door open until we were in the second room. Your entrance point is not actually set until the door closes. So that's why you need to do the thing to clip out of bounds with the bombs. And now we have the bow. And since we have the bow and the medallions, we're going to go to the Temple of Time to watch everyone's favorite cutscene. And then after that, we can go be at the game. Yeah, and that's because we need the item that we get in that cutscene. That's the only reason we watch that. And I guess the the bridge. Yeah, for some reason, um, well, you can actually see that uh, you're supposed to, like, to, to be able to get uh, Requiem, I mean, uh, Nocturne, you need to be at, like, forest, water, and fire, right? So you're supposed to need all those medallions to actually uh, be able to have the Shadow Medallion. And you can get both Spirit Medallion or Shadow Medallion in any order. Um, so what the devs did was like, you know, if we need the first three um, medallions to get Shadow and you can get Spirit, then we should like just check for, you know, Shadow and Spirit Medallion, spirit medallion uh, to trigger this cutscene. And yeah, like the, games, the game assumes that you... Um, got all the medallions, but that's not the case. <laughs> we just got Shadow and Spirit, and that's enough for the game to assume that, <laughs> that you got every single medallion. And that's literally why we beat Shadow and Spirit. We literally do not need, uh, do not need uh, any of those medallions, but for this cutscene and to get the light arrows. Spoilers. <laughs> yeah, a, bit, a little bit of lore of the game. One of the most important cuts in games today. Well, if we've got a little bit of time, I can remind everyone what we're doing here. Of course, go on. So, Around Horizon is Rejects and Friends' sort of mini showcase event, a way for us to show off the community even when main stage or Sub Zero events aren't in session. The 3D Zelda Relay is the end of our first wave of Event Horizons, but they'll be back. We hope to show off more runners, hosts, commentators, and in many more races, showcases, speedruns, and more. Uh, specifically, the relay it benefits Planned Parenthood, as do all our events. You can find the link by typing exclamation point donate in chat, or by scrolling down to the about section. There you'll find a QR code, a link, and an image that you can click to see the Tiltify page. 
we crushed our original goal. But like I said before, there's almost no over donating to Planned Parenthood. So if that's something you're inclined to do, please do so. Yeah, let's go. Trust the goal. We could... Uh, I love this cutscene so much. I love the cutscenes in this game. Especially in this category. <laughs> yeah, there are yeah some... we even got an extra one. Because we had to watch the intro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some cutscenes aren't skippable. Kinda. Um, like, you can theoretically keep some of them but in the end like you kind of need them for example master sword cuts in even in the most broken category of the of this game like on the SRM you have to watch that cutscene which is not that bad you know because like it's like two hours of like hearing crashing the game <laughs> but yeah that's another category There hasn't been any void out strategy to like die and also like watch this cutscene at the same time so that you don't actually have to. Uh, so the cutscene starts when you load the area. So you literally do not have a chance to do that. Uh. Mm -hmm. I think there might be a possibility, but it wouldn't uh, save any time. For example, in Honda SRM, we watch the cutscene as kid, but we can watch the cutscene again for some reason when you get uh, the medallions. So you can uh, warp. We actually warp uh, to Temple of Time in one, a part of the run. So technically, maybe, but it literally like <laughs> wastes time because <laughs> you already watched the cutscene. So I don't know. It's not at least viable. <laughs> if it's a cool cutscene, I guess that's one possible draw for it. Yeah, like we have to make a category that's watch that cutscene twice. <laughs> <laughs> this game, this game has an unreal number of category extensions. I'm sure they can do with one more. And we are, like that. That's because this game has an absurd amount of possibilities. So <laughs> we can do a lot of stuff in the game. So yeah, that's why. <laughs> I think I'm gonna farm bombs. Cause I'm a little bit of tight on bomb count. I think I'm bomb perfect right now. I'm gonna farm a little bit. Hopefully we'll get at least a drop. So luckily to farm bombs, there are BMOs in the first room of this dungeon. Oh yeah, and we have choose. You have choose. Yeah, wonder why. <laughs> I hey. forgot you had those. Hey. Okay, we got it. mission complete. <clears throat> All right, we good to go. Okay, so usually you'd have to complete all of the trials around the area before you could actually get in the Ganon's Tower, but there is actually an expo exposed loading zone on that wall, and you can just hover up and then jump right into the tower. So now we're in Ganon's Tower, we just need to do a couple more mini-boss fights. Uh, the Dinolphos can be kind of weird. They're, they can be a little tricky. They jump around and they don't like being hit. Yeah, that's close. 
<laughs> uh, for some reason, like you're supposed to charge your sword there. They sometimes jump at you at the beginning, and I'm not sure why. Like they just sometimes wait, sometimes just freaking jump at you. But I don't know, maybe I walk too much forward. Like you're supposed to lure them, but maybe I was too much. It didn't feel like too much though. But yeah, we did it. <laughs> we didn't die. There's no... Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, <that> was... <laughs> you almost got hit so many times there. I know. Uh, everything after the Stalfos here will kill you in one hit if it hits you. Those Iron Knuckles, I think, do four hearts, five yeah. hearts of damage. So, yeah, he would definitely die if he got hit there. You can even die twice. The last heads of the run and we actually got it. So can go. Finally, a hess. <laughs> But yeah, you can die twice to the Knuckles. Um, if you have a fairy, for some reason, when you revive after the fairy like has healed you, you don't get invincibility. Is that or like the Knuckles just don't care about invincibility? I think the Knuckles don't care about invincibility, actually. Like You can roll into the hitbox and it will kill you. So if you die and you <laughs> revive, there's a big chance <laughs> <laughs> you just die again because the hitbox is still active. <laughs> okay, this is literally like the whole the whole purpose of this category. So let's try to to get it right. It's almost done. Yeah, we're close. So Corpse did a little setup right there to get on the edge of the platform, and then he got ISG. That allows him to reflect the fireball and then uh, immediately stun Ganondorf. And then from here, we're just going to stun lock Ganondorf until he's dead, because you can just do that to bosses in this game. Uh, and <laughs> I have something to say. I For some reason, I thought the light arrow was getting hit the first time. So I tried to shut him, but actually it hit. And I panicked. I thought I, I got rid of ISG, so I went for the stun lock strat. And I don't know how, but I did it. So let's go. Yeah, that was really impressive. That was a struggle. I was about to die there. So GG, like, like nice. Oh my god, I... I'm so used to randomizer at this point. I forgot about tower yeah, collapse. I mean the the whole section of tower yeah. I thought you were about to just go fight the final boss, but we're we still have one them. more thing. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Oh. Uh -oh. Okay. That's. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Oh. Oh no. So the trick he's trying to do right now is called a void warp. Basically, we're doing a very specific setup so that way the bomb hits Link in a way that you'll hit the loading zone and the void out trigger at the same time and that allows you to enter this area but at the height of the top of the tower and you would use that to basically fall all the way down the tower and skip the collapse completely. However, we were low on health, so it didn't work. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot. But we can just try again. Yeah, that's why we get bumped. <clears throat> oh no, please don't. Oh my god. Yeah, this is RNG heavy. There's nothing I can do to avoid that. Oh no, I'm low on, <sighs> I'm low on health again. <laughs> I forgot. No. <laughs> That's so funny. This time will be the time for sure. Yeah, like... The rocks are RNG completely. Oh my god. Come on. Ain't that funny? <laughs> uh, you don't have enough health. Oh, right. Should I do... So either die or go down the tower. Uh, at this point, I have just one more try. So... Let's do the last try of this trick. And... If it doesn't work, just... Yeah, it's literally RNG. <laughs> There's nothing I can... I think, even though, I think it, it was not that slow to pull it work. I feel like it was the same speed dying there. Deep rage. Okay, fine. Did I miss it? No, I didn't. Oh, dun 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 dun. Okay, that was close. Holy shit. <laughs> I'm sorry for it. But that, like, you cannot <laughs> understand how close that was. Because uh, there is like a room there. If I like go far enough. But there. But also. Oh, the console can crash. <clears throat> so yeah, <laughs> that was a struggle. That was really hard. <laughs> well, not hard. That was like so close of going really, really bad. But here we are, rocking like a hurricane. Jeez, this run <laughs> has been hella cursed. Very last bomb, oh my god. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of chaos. Oof. Yeah, marathon runs can <laughs> go like that.
I was fearing that. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not that bad, but it can be annoying, to say the least. So what he was trying to do there is he was trying to super slide into this cutscene. If you do that, you can actually keep your sword and make the first phase of this fight super fast. However, uh, since that didn't happen, we're now going to have to use the hookshot to damage Ganon, since we have no other items that can do that. Exactly. Yeah, it's gonna take more hits, like the usual amount of hits, with any other item. That was scary. Luckily, now that he has the sword, the second phase should go pretty quickly. Close. We're close if to I know, <laughs> Yeah. If I know this game correctly, then we're just about done. So, last goodbye shoutouts in your final seconds. Hey, okay, yeah, thank you for having me, and I'm sorry for this one. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. Yeah, great. And... All right. Done. Alright. On to Skyward Sword with your average link with commentary by Pippi in a top hat. Hi everyone! Alright, three, two, oh, sorry. I wasn't quite ready with my slides. <laughs> okay. So, uh, this is Skyward Sword. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that uh, we're playing in hero mode because, uh, well, it has a few benefits. One of which is that you can skip cutscenes, which saves tons of time. So, quite important. Uh, so I'm gonna talk to Fledge here. Uh, he'll have some important duties later on. He has information that um, he probably shouldn't, but it, it definitely makes a ton of sense if you understand how computers work. Yeah, we'll Otherwise, get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that when it comes up. <laughs> and have Horwell talk to us. Uh, you also notice I'm playing on the Japanese version. That's because it has considerably faster text than other versions. Uh, it's about two minutes faster than English. Uh, little tutorial on how to how to run and jump and stuff like that. Despite the fact that we're playing on hero mode, which is the new game plus mode, Horwell is like, yes, you definitely need to know how to Z target because we totally don't know how to do that. Uh, don't quite have the correct angle. There we go. A very yeah, smooth one... recovery on a strange jump. That's a trick. That's a trick. It doesn't look like one. <laughs> yeah, there's another thing that's optional. We're going to save this remlet. 
Um, it'll come up later as well, trust me. This run's gonna be uh, quite crazy, but... Every Skyward Sword run, in fact, saves the animals, so there's no bid war, I'm very sorry. Uh, does all dungeons? Because all dungeons doesn't save the rim. Do, all dungeons does not. Any any percent run. <laughs> yeah. The only any real category. The only run. The only run that currently <laughs> saves the rim. Uh, all right. So I'm gonna save at this statue. We're saving Nixing. for safety, right? Yeah, for safety. Yeah. Uh, normally you'd go up here and talk to Zelda, but this post looks pretty cool. Oh, it does. Oh. It's alright. I'll just go right back up. I think the post hurt you. I think so too. But it's just so, so shiny. Ouch. It's really rare that you see a post that cool. I think it's worth another look, don't you? Yeah, one more time. We'll see if it's nicer this time. Downright tantalizing. Yeah! Ooh. Oh! Oh, it didn't change! Uh. Oh, bad run. Uh, we've, already, we've already died. Bad run. Yeah, I think I think this run's worth resetting. That said reset. It's in Japanese, but it definitely said reset, yeah? Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> now that we're done with the jokes that you hear in every okay. single Skyward Sword <laughs> showcase run ever, this is a trick called Back in Time. You're going to see this approximately 13, or not approximately, exactly 13 times. Hopefully, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Um... There's a lot of cool things you can do with it. No, You'll also notice that uh, my reset screen was kind of cut off in the um, in my game feed. This is because I'm playing in 4x3, which we actually just recently discovered saves some lag. Or saves time by not lagging, I should say. The most recent discovery of Skyward Sword is that we have to use a worse aspect ratio. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm also playing on Wii U, which means I can't use the physical reset button because it doesn't exist. And it also means that the stretch, like, the game will automatically, s or the console will automatically stretch it back to widescreen. So it looks like super widescreen. And it's, uh, it's really something. But thankfully you guys don't have to be subject to that because I have an OBS filter on. So shall we talk about the title screen? Because we're looking at it an awful lot. Yes. Um, if anybody's not familiar, this is Back in Time. Back in Time is uh, essentially what you did was uh, die and then hit continue uh, and then immediately hit the home button to hit reset, which tells the game to respawn Link as soon as possible and then places you on the title screen because, hey, the title screen's a map, right? We can spawn Link there. Um, which gives us control during the title screen, and also unique to Skyward Sword during the file select screen, because it does not cause a map reload in between the title screen itself and the file select screen. And clicking on each of the files, as you've seen Yell do several times now, um, will actually load in some amount of data from those files onto the title screen. And using a lovely little trick called uh, reverse bit magic, which we're doing right now, we can load certain data from the title screen onto the file, which is why it's reverse, because we're doing it backwards. There, there we go. It yeah. doesn't contain actual magic, though, I checked. And um, during, <laughs> during that sequence, I also saved at the statue, which put me on the same layer of Skyloft that you'd see on the title screen which has that weird lighting effect that you saw, and it also has the goddess statue open, which is convenient because it means I can get the goddess sword. Yeah, so and... not everything that happens on the title screen is actually going to get saved to the file because uh, while it is writing to active memory, there's like a security feature or something. I don't know why it's there. Why did, did they know that this was a problem? Um, but basically, when you go to start your file, it's going to revert your file memory back to what it should be. And then it's going to do a fade out animation. And then it's going to start your file actually. 
But if you make a change to your file data during that fade out animation, you're doing it after the revert. So hence starting the file during that cutscene of the pillar of light forming actually spawned in the Farron pillar on file one. So, hey, we can go a Farron now, right? There's nothing standing in our way, right? Nothing at well, all? Well, uh, there's a little thing called a loft wing that we'll also need. <laughs> Sounds fake. I don't think it's real. So, yeah. Uh. <laughs> the next part is somewhat like intended, except we already have a sword. Normally you'd have to go, after you talk to Groose, you'll have to go get the practice sword from the sparring hall. But I've already got the goddess sword. So. And that's just better anyway. Yeah. It this is also the only sword I'm going to be getting. I was going to say, it's such a cool sword that we don't need any other sword throughout the entire game. Master sword? Nah. It First sure would be nice to have yeah. any other sword. <laughs> there... ah, there's going to be a part coming up... Uh, in a little over an hour, where I'd really wish I'd had a stronger <laughs> sword. Yeah, uh, we don't exactly do a lot of damage with the goddess sword, so uh, some fights are hit-based, and that's great, because the goddess sword does in fact do hits, but fights that are damage-based are gonna be a little bit more interesting, because it doesn't do a lot of that. We're essentially going to be fighting bosses with a toothpick. Um... Yeah, it's so fun. another another uh, seemingly random thing. I'm going to be entering and exiting this house. Uh, it will come up in about 10 minutes. Uh, she knows about a very important rope, and by she, I mean the fact that we left her house knows about it. For some reason, it it's setting a flag in memory when you leave her house, which is a nonsensical flag, but benefits us, so... I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, we're just being neighborly. So we're on our way right now to save the Loftwing because our Loftwing is in jail. It's gonna play a lot of cutscenes out of order for the beginning. So um, ignore the fact that Fi was there. So that means Zelda must be kidnapped because Zelda wasn't kidnapped and Zelda is fine and is going to help us save our loft wing so that we can go actually use that Farron pillar. Um, however, we're not going to do it the correct way. We're going to do some more uh, file shenanigans first. Um, if you were very perceptive, you might have noticed that we actually started with two hero mode files, and that's, for very complicated reasons, going to be to set up uh, this coming trick where we're essentially going to obtain the ability to jump off of a loft wing before we have a loft wing to jump off of, which is silly. Um, and, you know, I don't think is the intended progression of gameplay, but we make up the rules here, right? Yeah, the idea is that once we have that ability uh, and we save the loft wing again, well, well, I'll explain when I get there, but it means we'll be able to just dive during the loft wing tutorial, which you're not normally supposed to be able to do, and that's when we'll interfere for the first time. Zelda's gonna try to teach us to use the loft wing a lot of times to varying degrees of success. Uh, however, this is the first time, and we do not have the ability to jump off the loft wing yet, so she's actually gonna give us a tutorial that we do have to sit through. So uh, if you have a donation, that might be the time. Well, as a matter of fact, I do. Renegade Boss donates an additional $10, saying this donation goes to pushing the animals off Skyloft. <laughs> Oh, but so we need the remlet. Yeah, despite the fact that you did not give me an option, th that you told us that it was not an option, um, we are now forcing it onto the game. You okay. actually can you actually can throw remlets or remlets off the side of Skyloft, but they'll just fly back with their ears. Because they can't just be cats; they're like bat lemurs or something. I don't know what they are. Everything can fly in this game. Secretly, everything in this game is a bird. All right, so there's a little trick coming up, and because of it, and because of the fact that I use a metronome cue, I'm going to mute myself uh, for a moment, so...
Uh, this trick is essentially a, it's a two frame window to press the A button to do a side hop input. And there you go. That's a trick. Wow. Really? Um, essentially, there is a, a cutscene trigger box that loads in around Zelda, but it has a bit of a delay before it loads in, and it would lock you into not only a cutscene, but also the entire of the wing ceremony, like chasing the birds and all of that. Oh, by the way, welcome back to Bit. Um, <laughs> but uh, we don't want to do the wing ceremony because that's slow. So you actually have a two frame window to do a side hop, um, which clears you uh, out of the trigger box when it spawns in. And then you can just run around. You can actually uh, go talk to Groose during that time or either of his cronies and they have nothing to say. Um, but don't talk to Zelda, because if you go back to Zelda, you will re-enter the trigger box. <laughs> yeah, uh, oftentimes if people are mashing to get this trick, they'll accidentally hop back into the trigger. Uh, which is really embarrassing. And... <laughs> the worst feeling. <laughs> it's like, I got it! I didn't get it. Uh, so what's happening right now is something called a file dupe. Where using the splash screen, which is the screen that actually has the title on it, um, we have copied all of our data from file three onto file two and are now placing file two just in the sky and starting file two. So we're playing on file two right now, but its previous save, if like we were to die, uh, would put us where we were in file three, which uh, was a copy of file one when we created, or when we saved the Loftwing. Um, so don't worry about all that. If we die, we go back to before we saved the Loftwing. But oh, hey, we're on the Loftwing. That's the important part. And also that we just talked to Fi, and Fi was like, hey, press this button and you'll jump off of your, of your Loftwing. Hmm. Okay, so I got hit by this Gwei twice, which is good because- Incredible. Uh, as we mentioned, we're trying to die. All right, so that was pretty good. Death is very important in this run. Thank you, Guava. Thank you. Or, or uh, as Glubbers puts it, Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> Ernest Hemingway, yeah. So now we're before we saved the Loftwing. So we have succeeded in the goal, and uh, now just Zelda has to be like, oh my gosh, it's your Loftwing that we definitely weren't just flying on. Um, but since we've seen the Phi cutscene, that already happened on this file, and we can, in fact, jump off the Loftwing, which is a pretty vital skill. Um, but also, we're going to be put into the flight tutorial again, because we don't know how to fly a Loftwing. We just saved it. Why would we know how to fly it? Well, I mean, technically, I think in lore, Link... Uh already knows how to fly the left wing, but it's he's, like, rusty. <laughs> Mood. Um, so we're in the, the flight tutorial right now, which actually has a box around it so that the loft wing cannot leave the bounds of the flight tutorial. But that only applies to the loft wing. It doesn't actually apply to Link. So if we leave the loft wing, we can exit that box and go wherever we can get to in the range that we have from skydiving off the loft wing, which includes this really interesting rock that's approaching quite fast. Ooh, that was interesting. That was a little high up. <laughs> um, so obviously uh, we take a lot of damage in this run. One of the other perks of doing this on hero mode is that we take double the damage. So that was actually the maximum amount of fall damage that you can take in uh, uh, Skyward Sword, that on normal mode, it would be two hearts. But because we're on hero mode, it doubles straight to four hearts, which puts us at two hearts, which is uh, very easily kill range. I would also we'd... like to point out that because yeah. of the good Gwei, I did get a best segment there. So oh, hooray. we love that. <laughs> Which is a little bit interesting because uh, when I was doing the Sky Reverse Bit Warp earlier, I did a safer variant where it's a lot easier to time. Uh, because if you mess that trick up, it is very tragic. I think there's a backup, but it loses a ton of time. Most people just reset. If there's anybody who doesn't, um, you have the fortitude of a god. <laughs> Alright. So oh, you coming died. up. 
Yeah, I did die. Unfortunate. So here is coming up probably the most complicated back in time sequence in the run. Essentially, uh, what our goal is going to be is to get into Farron without leaving the title screen and uh, manipulate what are called flags in memory. And flags in memory are just anything that the game wants to remember. Um, so we are, uh, essentially, I like to think of it as a big filing cabinet with a very robust filing system and multiple drawers um, uh, that the, yes. Uh, <laughs> you got this, um, that, when the game wants to know how it should respond to things that rely on information of what the player has already done, it's going to try to look exactly where it knows that information is. And it's always going to look in the correct location, but we can change that location just a bit by uh, switching out the map that it's looking on, because the, the memory addresses are the same uh, throughout the different maps, but lead to different things. So it's essentially you're looking for the correct file location, but in the wrong drawer. Um, so we can do this to set all sorts of flags that we shouldn't have been able to set already. So now that we are getting into Farron, which also, by the way, back in time likes to crash like nobody's business. Uh, when you see Yal juggling flat of files like that. Just assume it's to prevent something from crashing. <laughs> yeah, so what I did there is uh, I selected file one before entering the pillar because file one has not entered sealed grounds yet. Uh, if you'll remember, well, if you were particularly attentive earlier, you saw that I copied file three over to file one. Um, and file only file two has ever entered sealed grounds. And basically, when you enter a pillar for the first time, uh, the second time around, and any subsequent time, the game brings up a map screen so that you can land at whatever statues you have selected. Uh, oh, oops. Oh, poor log. Oh my goodness. <laughs> there we go. Essentially, any time it brings up the map will crash the video game, including, if you notice the giant UI Wiimote on the screen, pressing the plus button brings up the map. The plus button is just a great way to crash the game. That is the instant crash the game right now button. Yeah. However, if you press the plus button for only one frame, it will not crash the game, uh, which is useful you because uh, <laughs> if you if you notice earlier, I copied file two to file three uh, later on, and that was by pressing plus for one frame. So what we're trying to do in navigating Farron is to get to a very specific cutscene uh, and a very specific location. Um, so we're essentially going to enter the first dungeon um, just through back in time shenanigans and not have to go through any of actual Farron. Um, but first thing we need to do is uh, reload the map, which uh, we can do by dying in back in time. Um, so congratulations, we've died before we hit start. Um, but what reloading the map does is it makes it check the file that we had open to update certain things based on the flags on that file. And we had file one open and file one was the file that we were playing when we entered that random lady's house earlier. Um, and because we are so good and neighborly, she's going to put down a vine for us, which uh, we need to get over to the Skyview Temple. Um, also, uh, because we did one of those nice little bit saves, it's actually going to take our location data from Skyloft and apply it to when we start our file, which is going to not just put us inside the Skyview Temple, but put us also about more than halfway through the uh, the dungeon, right? Like, it's it's a decent... We don't actually do much of the dungeons in this game. But then, mm, the title screen's easier. Yeah, so with that, um, I'm going to be spawning, as as Pippi said, uh, more than halfway through the dungeon. Um, 
I'd also like to point out a while ago when I was doing that one frame copy. Uh, normally, if you played in 16x9, there would have been a lot of lag as you're moving over to the upper academy area because you're facing where a lot of stuff on Skyloft is. But for some reason, playing on 4x3, there must just be not as much to render and there's like no lag. Uh, yeah, that was kind of magical. Um, we also have to enter a room and then immediately leave because uh, due to the way we loaded in, uh, not everything exists yet. Um, but if we e exit the room by doing the Staldra fight and then come back, now everything's gonna exist like it should, um, including that Bokoblin and also this spider that you have to do a scary hop. It's not a difficult hop, it's just a scary one. But the big important thing that we care about is the tightrope, um, because without the tightrope, we cannot get to the other side and we cannot get to that big glowy boss door. Ooh. <laughs> I wonder if we're gonna, we're gonna open it. So for safety, I'm gonna save here because if I were to die to gear him one, I would spawn all the way back in sealed grounds. Or, yeah, this is Fathers, so sealed grounds. Um, which would Actually, be- Actually, uh, you'd spawn on Skyloft, I believe, because uh, we're, we bit saved uh, that. <laughs> Actually, yeah. The point is, it's not Skyview, so we'd have it's to redo that entire, that entire segment. So. This also might be a good time to point out that we did not pick up the slingshot. And the slingshot is a very special item because for whatever reason in Skyward Sword, when you pick up the slingshot, you essentially also pick up the bee wheel, which is how you equip and use any item. So we can't use any items for the rest of this run unless we were to go back somehow and pick up the slingshot which we're not going to do. So uh, every any percent run is actually itemless. Um, so th we have to do silly things like skyward strike these vines to get them down so we can swing on them, as you saw, instead of, you know, like just hitting them with the slingshot, the intended item. Also H. H. Yeah, this, this uh, boss key and door kind of looks like H, so... We call it H. It's a very important um, door. Yeah, so were you to pick up any item without the B-wheel, the game would kind of soft lock, and that's pretty sad. Yeah, they'd kind of give them to you in uh, locations where you, you'd get stuck <laughs> if you can't use it. Oh, didn't quite wait long enough. This is our first boss fight and our first time fighting Girahim who is going to come back later. We'll fight him two more times, but not the intended two more times. It's fine. Um, okay, good RNG there. Okay. We love it when he cooperates. Uh, so this is our first instance of actual RNG, other than uh, the, the way Gua Guava. Its name is Guava. Um, <laughs> is that uh, Girahim can spawn darts, or he can dash or pose. Dashing and posing both allow damage, um, which is good because it kills him. Um, and darts are just wasted time, so minimal darts is good RNG. I would be impressed if you were able to do this fight with the blindfold because there aren't really any uh, audio cues, and unlike De like Demise is pretty much scripted. Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, so... Uh, if you'll remember, I'm playing on file 3 right now, so usually getting this heart container would be kind of useless. However, there's a somewhat difficult section coming up, and I'm going to pick up the heart container for safety there. You're picking up the heart container? Oh my gosh. I practiced this part earlier and I had no trouble with it, but you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, so normally it wouldn't be very useful because the scariest part for your health total is the very end of the game. And uh, going through the final gauntlet, again, with a toothpick. Um, but because we do that on file one and we're on file three right now, it's not actually gonna carry over this health total. However, we will be using file three for the next dungeon as well, which is going to be the in Elden. And not actually the dungeon itself is as scary in terms of health as uh, getting there. Because we take an alternative method. Yeah. 
All right. So, just going to uh, save it this prompt here. Um, normally, after you beat this dungeon, you get a little conversation with Machi, uh, and that's kind of slow. And we also want to do back in time anyway, so. Yeah, Might as well. We're... We're gonna keep file two for a while, right at the top of the spiral in the sealed grounds, uh, and at two hearts, because it makes this fun and easy. Oh wow, you died. I did die. Now, there was a reverse bit warp earlier for Skyview. I'm gonna do another one, although to a much closer location. Essentially, a reverse bit warp, by the way, is uh, very similar to reverse bit magic. Instead of using flags, though, and moving memory around, we are moving ourselves, essentially. Uh, you are hitting start and then moving through a loading zone, and it's going to change what room you spawn in um, based on what room you entered after it's already done the revert to your file data. So by hitting start on file three coming up and then entering the goddess statue, we're going to start uh, inside the goddess statue room, which is very handy. It's a nice way to teleport around pretty quickly. And yeah. also because we hit start, uh, we are no longer in back in time. Yeah, so the main purpose of this is so that I can place the tablet normally uh, which, since I haven't actually done that on any of my files, it's going to play the events that normally happen after you place the uh, Emerald Tablet, which is uh, you get the tunic and you spawn in the academy and you go off on your adventure. Uh, I'm going to need the tunic uh, because, for one, it makes it slightly faster to get to the sky and back in time, and for two, it's necessary for an RBM that will come up uh, later. Yeah, unlike Breath of the Wild, we do actually wear clothes, but only temporarily. Yeah, we'll have clothes for Elden, and then... Comfy pajama run will come back, don't worry. But once again, we're starting file two, because... Oh yeah, where did we leave file two? Oh, death! Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it's actually pretty convenient, because uh, since we don't have the tunic... Uh, Sealed Grounds is in a special state called Layer Zero, which is essentially the baseline state of that area, and then all the other layers put stuff on top of it. Uh, and normally there's, like, bars there that prevent you from, you know, falling to your death. But they don't exist on Layer Zero, so hooray. Yeah, some of the uh, the Skyloft layer that we use in Back in Time, I believe, is also layer zero. It's it's just layers that aren't necessarily what you're supposed to access. Um, well, the the Skyloft game. layer, the Skyloft layer is layer twenty eight. Oh, it's layer twenty eight. It's the exact but, opposite. It's way too high. <laughs> there aren't actually twenty eight layers, but this one's layer twenty eight because reasons. I don't know. There's a lot of numbers that go into uh, Skyward Sword routing, and uh, it's done by people smarter than me. And with more ability to do comp sci in math. But uh, as we will do a lot, um, we're going back into the tutorial to go back to Farron to then immediately leave Farron and try to reverse bit warp our way into Elden. Um, a nice note, though, is that while we're in Back in Time and also in the Loftwing tutorial, it doesn't really have a place to go to access our name. So Zelda just forgot our name. We are just exclamation point. Just thanks, yeah. Zelda. I thought we were childhood friends or something. I don't think it's actually specific to like this part. I think it's just generally in Back in Time. Yeah. Uh. It never really knows where to look, I don't think. It doesn't have a file to look at. See, so yeah, I'm saving file three here because I'm gonna want this, uh, these coordinates here. And that's actually all I wanted to do in Farron, so I'm gonna leave now. 
So it's just gonna be that wherever, whenever we next start file three, which we're gonna do really, really soon, um, it's going to spawn on the map that we like are supposed to spawn into based on what we've done so far, except with the coordinates of that save statue. Um, but if it's a different map, it'll be a different location because it's just kind of uh, X, Y, Z coordinates. Y'all remember how geometry works, right? Um, yeah, and also, uh, since we're still in the Laughing tutorial, the game kind of forced us uh, back into the like the feasible range. Also, yeah, really up. there's a lot of teleporting around that happens to... If you mess up that little zip through the speed boost, um, it'll teleport you to try to put you back in bounds, and the camera goes on a wild adventure. Um, it's very fun. <laughs> so yeah, uh, welcome to Elden. Um, I know we did Breath of the Wild like two hours ago, but I think uh, we should do some more Breath of the Wild and Skyward Sword. This is actually yeah. the demo for Tears of the Kingdom. I hope you like it. <laughs> so yeah, those coordinates over in uh, Sealed Grounds are way over here, and there happens to be a lot of collision uh, around here. And so I'm just going to run up to the top. Yeah, we're actually trying to cross that river of lava, but it's too wide to jump across down here. But if we go on an adventure, we'll find a way across. Also, uh, what he did back in time there was just essentially the same thing uh, we did to get into the goddess uh, room, which is start the file and then immediately... Oh, very nice. All right, so so, fortu so fortunately, I made it there without taking damage. Unfortunately, this means I have extra health, so I'll have to take more damage. <laughs> so yeah, I got the safety heart container before, and now it's losing me more time. Oh no. It's okay. It's safety. Um, but yeah, we just started file three, and then entered the loading zone for Elden. Um, and it put us right in Elden. How nice. Oh, also, hey, free damage. damage. Didn't quite have enough stamina there. A lot of the general movement of this game is about stamina management, as you might notice. The final quarter of the stamina wheel actually decreases at half the rate of the rest of it. Um, oh, by the way, death, because back in time, why not? Um, so it's optimal usually to try to just reuse the final quarter over and over and over again because it refills at the same rate but it's just used up at half the rate so, so yeah. normally at this point in the game you will have gotten the digging mitts and these magmas will talk to you about how the door is locked and you'll need a key to get in and you have to go find five key pieces but uh that's that slow, slow and yeah. i don't have and i don't have digging mitts because i kind of ran past them Luckily, I know another way. I have a lot. Also, stick. digging mitt sounds like an item. What are those? Yeah, the file that ends up beating this game is gonna have like goddess sword and the emerald tablet and the amber tablet, and that's it. <laughs> Not even the tablet in the middle. <laughs> Anyone who normally runs this game is going to have a visceral reaction to this part. Exiting to Night Skyloft with file one. Uh, basically, we want to go into Night Skyloft with a file that does not have the tunic. Because otherwise it'll crash. I use file two there. You use file one? Uh, I use file one specifically because it's cursed. That's such a power move. <laughs> All right, so now we're in the Earth Temple. Uh, I'm gonna have to be a little bit careful here because I'm on one heart, uh, which is death range with this keys. So because Whoa. we don't have any items, we don't have the beetle that you would be expected to use to solve this very simple puzzle. Um, so instead, what we're gonna do is use a keys for a fun trick called keys heat. And by fun, I mean pain. Um, Oh. But get back what, here. Oh, ah, okay. I, I turned around a little bit too early, <laughs> so the keys lost interest in me. Uh, I'm sure you can win him back. Uh, this happened but, to me in my PB. 
essentially, we're trying to lock on to the keys and uh, hit it with a Skyward Strike when it is perfect, uh, right between us and that rope that we're trying to cut. And then the uh. <laughs> the angle will be angled upward because we're looking at the keys above us and it'll go right on through the keys and hit that rope and let us hit all three ropes um, to get into the next area. And now for the trick that I fail more often than Kisi, dealing with a single Lizalfos. Yeah. So it seems pretty much RNG whether or not the Lizalfos attacks you, but most of the time it attacks you. Although, you'd think that'd be bad RNG, but there was one time where I the Lizalfos didn't attack me, but it did attack me after I launched that Skyward Strike, so I got hit into the lava and died right after. <laughs> yeah... And then it spawns you at the beginning of the temple, and you have to just go all the way back. Okay, just so... Just walk a shame. As mentioned earlier, we're not getting any items, which means no bomb bag and no beetle. However, I still need to get to the, the rest of the temple, so another back in time must be done. This back in time is fun because... So, when it spawns you in, it's not looking at any of your file data. Um... But the second that you click through the splash screen so you open up the file select screen, it's going to load in the file data from your lowest file, which is currently going to be file three. Um, but if we enter into the place we want to go to talk to Pippet, because Pippet is really cool, um, my fellow Pip, uh, with file three or any of the files, it's going to crash, which is where... The Wii Motion Plus tutorial comes in. So that menu that he was juggling to uh, keep the splash screen up so it doesn't go to like a little demonstration of, uh, you know, all the lore and important stuff that we're about to experience on our epic journey in Skyward Sword. Um, we don't want that to start playing because we've been idling on the title screen too long. So uh, looking at the Wii Motion Plus tutorial will help. Also, Bridge, you didn't raise it. I don't know. Right, and you're okay. on fire. Yeah, I was yeah, momentarily standing on lava. Uh, but yeah, once we reload, the bridge will be up and we can proceed. So we set the flag to raise that bridge, but it didn't update until we died and reloaded the area. Um, so that's why uh, you get to stand on lava for a quick second. Uh, and now we're just gonna avoid some boulders playing with definitely intended gameplay, right? Yeah. The next uh, five minutes are definitely what Miyamoto intended. Yeah, because we are we totally are gonna use bombs to open up that alcove. It's a very cute puzzle. Oh wait, we don't have bombs. Yeah, but if I just try it, my hard est, I think I can make it. Okay. Yeah, so basically, when you uh, press A uh, in relatively quick succession, the game will let you sprint, but without using nearly as much stamina, and so you can just get to the top. It's not quite the same movement speed as uh, sprinting, so we don't use it all the time, but if you can't refill stamina, uh, it is... Very effective to just have Link scream a bunch. That's a great way to climb hills. Alright, there's D. The other boss key. The second second boss key of two. And they both look like letters. And, what do you know, they spell out HD. So I think Nintendo hinted at Skyward Sword HD all those years ago. HD was always in the lore spoken of in ancient scrolls. Uh, the very fun sort of setup of this dungeon is that Boulder's gonna follow us into the next room after Indiana Jonesing us and is going to become the boss. Also, D. Goodbye, D. Um, so we're gonna go fight the meatball. Uh, the meatball, it should be a very fun and easy boss. His name is Scaldera, but he looks like a meatball, so, um, 
However, yeah. again, we don't have bombs, so we have to use the bombs provided by the terrain, which is not quite the intended method, um, especially considering that um, they are not everywhere on the arena. Oh, nice camera angle. <laughs> But before we do that, uh, we have to talk to both Fai and Girahim, and Girahim talks for a while. Yeah, in fact, there is a, uh, there's unfortunately not a practice ROM or anything, but there are practice gecko codes, and one of the codes is specifically to skip this text. Um, and I actually use it for inspiration for a randomizer patch to get rid of this text as well. You are doing very important work getting rid of this painful cutscene. Because this isn't a proper cutscene, so you can't just press 2 and skip it with hero mode powers. You have to just, like, scroll through his text. And it's all in Japanese, so I can't even appreciate the lore. I just make up what he says. Not to mention the fact that compared to other games, Skyward Sword text is kind of really slow. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's not quite as bad on Japanese, but... So it, here we have the bombs. We're just gonna take some damage, that's fine. Um, at the top of the stage, but there aren't bombs at the bottom. So what we actually do during this fight, since we did, can't bring the bombs with us with the bomb bag, is we manage Skaldera's health very intentionally because once he passes a certain threshold of damage, he's gonna transition phases and he's not gonna come high enough up in the arena anymore for us to access these bombs. Um, so if we can do an exact amount of damage using some very specific attack setups, um, which he seems to be cooperating on, um, now he's transitioned phases, and uh, he also, though, has low enough health that his armor doesn't do anything. And that was beautiful good. Skaldera. That is what we call a tricycle, so named because it's three cycles. Also yeah, I had to a roll the bombs down. Uh, I intentionally took damage because it makes him fall directly down. Otherwise, he'd go, uh, like, stand up high and then run up to the bombs. And it takes a little bit uh, extra time. And I needed damage down anyway, so... Also, during that phase transition, it Yell rolled below him. So you're taking damage from his backside because he'll actually jump towards the player. Um, so if you are above him, he's just gonna climb. If you are below him, he's gonna jump over you and roll down to the bottom. If you are in a specific range of angles, um, he will jump over the side and go for a swim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a trick to doing that without taking damage, but it runs the serious risk of having him just jump into the lava. Uh, he also doesn't take damage from the lava because he was born in the lava, molded by it, molded by the spicy floor. Um, so, uh, it, it's just a soft lock. There, there is a way to damage him, but it's so ungodly specific that it it's just a soft lock for the fight. Um, I didn't even you, know there was a way to damage. There is, and I can't replicate it, but it makes the cutscene play sideways. <laughs> See, so yeah, I'm gonna instead of saving at the prompt, I'm gonna cancel and run back inside because there are a few flags in Earth Temple that are useful. Um, they, I think the main one is that the log in Fern Woods is down, which is nice. Do I do log jump? No more log jump. Log jump, by the way, just uh, skips a cutscene of the camera going, "Oh, you did it! You moved a log." by never moving the log to where the game wants us to put it and just uh, doing a fancy little jump instead. But obviously, if we can just move the log via magic and never play the cutscene, then that's infinitely easier and we don't... we don't need to do any fancy jumps at all. Yeah. Not only do I want to bonk file one here, uh... Probably should have explained this earlier. Whenever we're bonking a tree in back in time with a file, it's loading the flags of that file in. So, like for example, when I open file one here, this gate opens up. It's unfortunately you did miss key seed. 
uh... Key seat went very well. Well, besides the fact that I lost the keys' interest at first, which is why I lost Shh, a little bit of time in the segment. It's fine. Don't tell anyone. Nobody knows. But yeah. Uh, the purpose of picking up that rupee earlier is so that I have the amber tablet, because picking up any item in back in time that has an inventory flag will load in the flags, will load in the inventory flags of that file. So this loaded in the amber tablet in my inventory. Hello, Loftwing. Um, yeah, it looked like he picked up five rupees, but he actually picked up five rupees and the amber tablet. And about nothing else, because really the goddess sword and that bloopy is the only items we pick up in this entire run. Um, but we just RBM'd a uh, pillar again, which means we now have the Laneru pillar. And because we started file one, it saved onto file one. So now we can just fly off to Laneru. I'm sure we'll do many exciting things in Laneru, and none of them are die, right? Uh. Well, first, let's see this text box that already happened. Oh, and zoom in, apparently. <laughs> we just really want to look at the map. So yeah, uh, even though I did technically see this text box at some point, it was on a different file, so... Uh, in the game size, it didn't happen. This is file one. So there we go, it, uh, we got the, the nice yellow Laneru pillar over there. We can access all of the areas, so we're definitely gonna go and do the third temple. Just kidding, we do no more dungeons in this run. We're done with dungeons. Yep, we're... Uh, but Laneru... Like, basically, the entire premise of this run is just get to Laneru as fast as possible, because there's a very fun minigame. Uh, yeah, there's a very fun minigame. <laughs> with uh, very magical properties. Yeah, one of the other perks of being on hero mode is that we can access all of the boss rush minigame. Normally you can only access the bosses that you've beaten before, but if you're on hero mode, it assumes that you've beaten all the bosses because you, you have, this is new game plus. So we can access the final gauntlet bosses. So we can access the Horde, Girahim 3, or Demise. And we very specifically would like to play that minigame. It yeah. sounds really fun yeah. and like a great place of time. Yeah. And earlier earlier, I was talking about how uh, you could bonk files in back in time to load in flags. Uh, the file that we were bonking was file 1, and file 1 is now in Laneru, so unfortunately... To get over to the other side of this uh, gate, we're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. Uh, if you remember, like, 45 minutes ago, this is how I got over for the first back in time. You just void out. Because for some reason, if you void out at a certain position, it just assumes you're over here. It's very good at determining where it should put you. This is also uh, a regular bit warp, not a reverse bit warp, which is done just by hitting save and start at the same time. And it's just gonna put you on the map you are on, so Laneru, but with the coordinates of the statue that you saved at, um, which happens to be way out in the middle of nowhere. So welcome to pretty far out of bounds. Yeah, just um, like Elden, there is fortunately some collision over here. And oh. there's a place of interest. Am I even going the right way? I think I am. <laughs> Did you bring a map? Oh no, the map might crash the game, it's fine. The map will not crash the game and uh, not in back in time. I was going way the wrong way. Wow. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, been, it's been a while. Uh, that looks correct. I think I have a terrible sense of direction. Also, I'll have everyone know that uh, it is not cheating, it's magic. The name of the trick said so. Right? M maybe. <laughs> um, I don't know why I have no idea where I'm going. I think you are going... Wait. Hmm. Mm. Where we're trying to get to is um, a nice 
little hole in the ground that's gonna take us to a different part of Lanayru where we can save and thus set our our spawn point so that we can do okay, more Okay, I think I'm actually in the right place this time. I don't know, I maybe I didn't quite go, I didn't quite anger myself all the way. But... <laughs> oh, this does look correct. Yes, you yeah. run up that thing and then you go over that and mm, yes. We found a hole in the ground. Huzzah. And the camera just wanted to show us another hole to walk through. And uh, for once, we're actually going to listen to what the game wants us to do. Uh, yeah. And we're going to go meet my best friend, who's a cactus. Yeah, so this is Lanayru Gorge. Uh, normally, you're supposed to be here way near the end of the game uh, after you've uh, talked to Levias and you need to go get the Song of the Hero. Uh, but actually, talking to Levias sets, sets some important information here that's not here. So, welcome back to Layer Zero. We're going to have to do a few things to get stuff uh, in a workable state. Yeah, so we want to do the boss rush mini game, which requires talking to the Thunder Dragon. However, in order to talk to the Thunder Dragon, we need the Thunder Dragon to exist, which is going to require uh, a bit of finagling with flags. So I hope y'all like bit, because we're going to do a good couple of Farron bits that we're just grabbing some flags from Farron, and we are then applying them to Lanayru. And uh, hopefully uh, the result should be that we both um, set up a minecart and also uh, can like have the, the thunder dragon be in his saved state that we've already done his quest line. Because we're definitely at the end of the game. We played everything as intended. A little bit over. Yeah, skydiving can be kind of fun, uh, especially when there's a giant menu in the way. Um, that luckily we don't have to do the long dive in any percent, but we do have to dive many times, and sometimes your motion controls just don't agree with you that day. Um, also, hey, look, there's the wall that was supposed to be here all along. Um, and it just kind of like drifts in the wrong direction a uh, little bit. It's 321. Oh, okay. That's how I remember it. It's nice and easy for me. <laughs> so yeah, this uh that cutscene that you saw there briefly uh sets a flag every frame. Which is an interesting decision. It feels very inefficient, but it also feels uh really kind for us that you can just like there, there's such a wide window it's weird, that it hasn't, it's weird that it hasn't come up yet but for most rbms uh that blow up the rock okay i didn't see the <laughs> i didn't see the explosion effect that i normally see uh so i was worried for context, uh, that RBM, that's called Rock RBM, and we're setting a flag that will blow up a rock that you would normally blow up to get it out of the way of moving a minecart with bombs that you have in your bomb bag because you have items. There's, and we, we just go around, it's fine. We made the rock go away somehow. But yes, as you were saying. <laughs> Uh, we are also just gonna go back and uh, do another fun Farron bit. Yes. It's also fun to point out that a lot of these require switching your file during fade out sequences which is a little bit scary um, when you're first starting out. 
But it turns out that actually a lot of the fade out sequences uh, in this game are a lot longer than you think that they are, and it's very forgiving, which, thank you. Uh, as as a speedrunner of questionable merit, I, I thank you, developers. <laughs> All right, so doing the same thing again. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit farther this time. This is everyone's favorite RBM, uh, which also known as uh, the one where we get to see Machi and he makes cute uh, little QQ noises. So. This is what should have happened when we got to Farron for the first time, but didn't because we were, you know, in back in time and on the wrong layer. But it's gonna ask us to save Machi, who is uh, being pestered by some Bokoblins. And this is, I think, the really only time in the game where you actually have to use the sword and kill Bokoblins for any percent. Because um, the Bokoblin we killed earlier with the sword was completely optional as just for safety. Um, and we knocked a couple into the void, but then how do I know that they died? There could be a tea table down there. That fight also relies on another perk of hero mode, which is that our Skyward Strike deals a lot more damage than it should, but the blade itself doesn't. So that's why uh, you saw Yal kind of run past those Bokoblins and uh, charge up a Skyward Strike so that it would uh, hit them and kill them with purely the Skyward Strike and not the actual blade because that wouldn't deal enough damage. Um, also, uh, as he's moving around and just, like, doing random things in the world, um, that's called committing flags. And essentially, when we do an RBM, it doesn't actually save the flags that we just set to our game file directly. Instead, uh, we need to make some other change to the world to make it essentially copy over and make sure that the, the data is actually set. So for Rock RBM, we uh, conveniently blew up another rock. Um, and for Machi RBM, after saving Machi, we go and bonk a pillar. That's a scripted bonk. Yeah, bonk I'm going to once again uh, yeah. perform a bit warp at this statue. Uh, it's gonna put us out of bounds, and hopefully, I should actually know which direction I'm going this time. Uh, in, in my experience, I think you just turn to the right. Yeah, that's what I tried to do last time. <laughs> there we go. Um, but we have a question from chat of if you die by accident, does it bork the whole thing? Depending on where you are in the run. Normally, yes, no. Okay. Normally, so, you can retry. Yeah. This is a very specific uh, exception to that rule, actually. So basically, what the Machi RBM did is it set a temporary flag that means that the minecart escort is active, and um, the game will unset that flag if you die. Uh, so it is kind of bad if you die here. Hopefully we can be very careful and not die. This is jank jump, by the way. I don't know why it works. Don't ask me. Oh, and sometimes it doesn't work, and I don't know why it doesn't work either. Um, yeah. Oops. While we're jank jumping, you could probably squeeze into a, a quick go. donation before we get to the end of the run. Perfect timing a $10 donation from Coco. He says, one last donation from me to round out a hundo. Why do people happy? Thank you very much for your, in totality, $100. Thank you so much to everyone who's donated. This has been a lovely event. Oops. All right, so yeah, now we're over here. Um, I always, oh. I always do that. <laughs> I also do, and I hate it. Uh, right. This is called a break slide. Um, it makes you move on quicksand. 
the fast, uh, using uh, some e ESS shenanigans, uh, which allows us to get close enough to that door that when we void out, it just spawns us right on the other side. And the nice perk about layer zero is that there's no Deku Babas here. Yeah. Watching people do other routes of this game as somebody who's only run any percent is always funny to remember what is actually supposed to be here. <laughs> to be fair, I think the only route that even sees this part in non layer zero is restricted bit. Because all dungeons doesn't do this and Hundo does this the weird way, like the way we're doing it right now. Alright, so. Uh, there's also normally a cutscene here, but there's not, because it's layer zero, uh, and I have some free time. So I'm gonna heal one heart, and then take half of it to a cactus. Just because later on it'll end up being fast. I do love chair strats. So yeah, once this minecart reaches the center, I'm gonna save again, and do the hopefully final back in time. We have now done the back in time that relied on the temporary flag, so there will not be any other back in times that cannot be retried, and th which is to say that the last back in time can be retried if need be. We have not borked the files. That will be our last time saying hello to my best friend, the cactus. Can we all thank the cactus for its service? <laughs> All right, so this one is set up just like all the other ones, or all the other ones in one area, I should say. Yep, we're going right back to Farron, and we're actually going to go back to that uh, cutscene that we saw during our first Farron bit, um, and we're going to do it a little bit differently because instead of waiting for Link to move into a loading zone, we're just going to like hit start to steal the flag from a cutscene. Um, but it's a nice, it's a nice memory of where we've come from. Yeah. And this should be our last requirement to have the Thunder Dragon all set up and ready to go, which is going to allow us to uh, do a fun new-ish trick called G3 Escape. Uh, Yell, you don't happen to know an expert on G3 Escape, do you? Hmm. I wonder. We'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. We'll, we'll find somebody who's got credentials in being able to talk about G3 Escape, right? <laughs> but for now, we get to run past the Deku Babas one last time. Also, those uh, fun log teleports um, are uh, a nice example of things instantly changing when you change files, that uh, all you have to do is stand where the log is going to be and jump and the log appears below you <laughs> uh, when you switch over files, which is very handy. Another great example of the no lag of 4x3. Normally, there's a decent chunk of lag there. Oh, come on. We do have to use that rope uh, that we were using earlier, which, if you'll remember, required us to reload the map to make it spawn correctly. So we're just going to reload the map again by, uh, once again, dying. <laughs> And now it's a straight beeline to everyone's favorite flag. Yeah, so the flag that we're going to RBM is weirdly, uh, I guess, important in Skyward Sword. It's the flag that we call 2x20, which does a lot of things. Most notably, if you set it on Skyloft, it opens, it starts a Thunderhead cutscene, uh, which can softlock you, but it also lets you do early Thunderhead. 
We don't need Thunderhead at all in this run, though. So. Hee hee hee. Old routes. And... Ooh, that... Uh... Okay. I, th I thought I might have started my file a little bit earlier. But... That one's nice because you get instant confirmation whether or not it worked. Because if Fi spawned then and to, like tries to talk to you, that means it worked. If Fi did not spawn for some reason, um, that means you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. In the old route of this game, the optimal way to do this RBM involved like harp strumming, so it was really stressful. I'm glad that's no longer a thing. But yeah. So now, uh, here's the boss rush. Um, the boss of interest uh, in this run is Girahim 3. Alright, so, funny story about this. Um, a long time ago, or not a long time ago, but like a few years ago, it was found out that you can hop through a fence at the bottom of the Girahim 3 arena, but we couldn't do anything with it because reasons. Skyward Sword is notoriously, like, anti-glitches. <laughs> um, but, this whole showcase was definitely anti-glitch. <laughs> besides back in time. Um, but basically, uh, I was trying to find a way to like slip past a void plane, and I accidentally found uh, the trick that you're about to see. So essentially right now we're not trying to kill Girahim, we're trying to escape and get to that nice cozy save statue at the bottom. Um, and we're doing that by manipulating platforms to keep Yurahim going lower and lower in the arena. So these silly dangles are actually manipulating the platform below that Yurahim is sitting on so that when he drops onto the next platform, instead of going straight up back to the center where it's supposed to, it's going to move into the center first and then up. Um, which, if we can hit him off before it starts moving up, we will continually be moving down. So, now Girahim is uh, quite far away. So, this is the, the long scary dangle that... This is also uh, the one where usually, if it fails, it's here. Yup. <laughs> Five. Half. And it decided to fail. Uh, okay, so I kind of have to have you kill me to retry this. So I'm not really sure why that failed. I found it. I don't know why it worked. <laughs> There's been all sorts of theories as to what makes that last platform sometimes just decide to move up. Um, it can be also very tricky to get the hang of telling when it failed and when it didn't initially. Um, but essentially, you're looking at the background to try to see if the platform that he's standing on starts moving into the center or up. Um, and we hope it starts moving horizontally first. Um, and why we have to do this is because, so we're in the sealed grounds, which we've been to many times now. We've killed ourselves there many times now. And there's this spiral going around the outside edge. And at the bottom is that save statue, but it's in a little box that is only open from the top. So we have to drop into it. But if we just drop from up here, Girahim has a set distance below him, a void plane. And if he is too high, then we're just gonna hit that void plane and it's gonna put us back at the top. Um, if we can get Girahim low enough uh, with all of our platform dangle and our, our funny funny, um, then the void plane's actually gonna exist below the floor, meaning we can walk on the floor. It's above the void plane. Um, and we can drop right into the top of that little save statue cubby and uh, go save our game, you know, for safety and no other reason. And definitely not because it breaks the mini game. Like. So, try this again. Can we have all the good vibes for the big scary dangle? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five and a half. 
Great. Okay. Uh, I think the I think the first time because I like skewed it forward a little bit, I might have pushed him too far out, but it's worked now. So we're just gonna save and quit to menu and then instantly start our file and uh, the game's just gonna drop us into the actual Girahim 3 fight and definitely be convinced that we totally did all of the required things to get here. Even though we have no clothing and no items and just a toothpick. But unfortunately we are out of bounds. So first thing we should probably do is get back in bounds, which we do by butt sliding up a wall. Provided that Link doesn't jump straight back in. Link, come on, cooperate. Um, but unfortunately, Girahim is not currently inbound, so we're now just gonna hop right back out of bounds. Using this wall that's not real. It's not real, right? They didn't make, the, the, is this a patch? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So this is the clip that I was talking about earlier. Unfortunately, we uh, can't just do that clip to get to the save statue normally, because as I said, the save statue's in a little box, but we can do it to get yeah. back out. You might say, oh, why don't you just run over there? There's an invisible wall. Yep. Yeah, this is what this is what I mean by Skyward Sword being anti-glitch when it's not back in time. <laughs> they put that in was, all when these I was, safety measures, when, but... <laughs> when I got, like when I was getting this to work, I was like close to having it work and I thought, Either somebody else has tried this and I just don't know about it, or it's just not going to work because Skyward Sword. But just Skyward Sword things. Like honestly, the game has no reason for that void plane to be dynamic. Like it could have just been like a little bit above the ground and it'd be fine. But, yeah. All right, so now. Yeah, we also found a hole in the floor. Yeah, so now voiding out there somehow causes gear him to come back here. Um, uh, he is now also out of bounds, though. And fun fact, if we deal damage to him while he's out of bounds, uh, we just crash the game. So we're going to give him a gentle nudge back yeah. in bounds. And we <laughs> just jump, jump on over to the platform. I'm going to drop down to the platform here so that he does this slidey thing. Oh, I... <gasps> no! I I messed this up. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to wait for him to come back. What was supposed to happen is I knock him off. He can that. do that. Uh, I'm told it's it's something to do with how fast the platform is moving. I don't really yeah, care. So it's very because, funny. <laughs> because we came from the outside, the platform has a lot of ground to make up, so it moves a lot faster. Now we are, however, actually doing the, fl the fight much more close to intended. So we're dealing damage to him. And this first section was a hit based, which is nice. Now, now it's going to be damage based. And normally I'm supposed to have the true master sword, but uh, I've only got the goddess sword toothpick. So this is going to take a little while. Have you ever tried stabbing your enemies slowly to death with a toothpick? Uh, so this is a trick using a skyward stab which is a very tight window to get it to work, which is why uh, you see Gal home buffered it. Um, because, uh, and in other categories, it's easy because you have true Master Sword and that makes your Skyward Strike attack charge ah, up pretty much instead. instantly. But the Goddess Sword doesn't do that. So it's actually a very tiny window and it's ah, very annoying. Kind of shook my hand a little. The final gauntlet is a really great uh, test to make sure that you really do know how to use the motion controls. <laughs> oh, I was already right there. Okay, now it is time to count. So normally this time you only got to stab him twice, but the goddess sword is only one fourth as strong as the true master sword. So using our highly educated math skills, we can conclude that one we need to go to eight. I didn't know that any speedrunner could count. I'm impressed. Three. You also, Loki, need to be managing Four. your stamina during all of this, because if you just do it as fast as possible, you're gonna run out of stamina, Five. and then you're gonna be standing, panting, in front of Garagim and Six. not able to poke him with your sword. Seven. Alright, 
so fortunately it looks like I'm going to be well underestimate. Nice. We do like that. I gave myself a very safe estimate, just in case. Because if something goes wrong, it can go really wrong. <laughs> case in point, losing, like, two minutes to gear him through a scheme. That little puff of smoke in the middle was also one of the major por er, portions of lag that has been skipped by 4x3. <laughs> Welcome to Demise. Luckily, Demise is hit-based, so once again, it doesn't matter what sword we have. Yeah. Also, because there's there no be base path. <laughs> Sorry, gonna be a little, uh, There's going to be a little graphical thing here, uh, where it's going to have like the length of the True Master Sword when I charge my lightning here. I've never noticed that. Yeah, see? Huh! And... Time. So, that was Skyward Sword. And that was and that was, Yeah, that was every 3D Zelda game. At a very respectable time uh, for Can Skyward Sword as well. Yeah. It would have actually been close to PBing if I didn't fail to gear him 3 escape. I was ahead until uh, Machi Airbnb split because I lost my sense of direction. All right, well, I have a couple concluding words, but go ahead and give out your shoutouts. <laughs> so yeah, shoutouts to um, uh, Jim for finding reverse, for finding reverse Bay magic that made a lot of this possible. Shoutouts for, uh, or shoutouts to um, uh, Pepernicus for helping out with routing and Azer. Our shout routing to, gurus. <laughs> shout out to the uh, devs for allowing Gear Him 3 Escape to work. <laughs> and shout outs to you, Pippi, for commentating. Thank you so much for having me. And shout outs to you for finding G3 Escape. Makes the run so much more fun. Although the fact that it seems like borderline RNG is kind of frustrating. It's fine. It spices things up. The spicy meatball wasn't enough. All right, so while we uh, observe the Demon King Demise being trapped into a sword, which I think he also gets trapped into a sword in Spirit Tracks, right? Well, yeah, and it's magically the True Master Sword now because cutscenes are weird like that. <laughs> we didn't change clothes, though. That never happened. Yeah, Pretty we beat the game in the, in the uh, pajamas. It is incredible. All right, so we have one final donation from Construct Paper, or perhaps Construct Paper. GG, yeah, and I think we can all agree on that. Uh, this has been really, really cool. Um, Event Horizon has not been a thing for long. We've only done six streams. Um, but despite that, we've raised close to $400 in one day for Planned Parenthood with one event and I think that's a testament to sort of the goals and of community and sort of the goals of generosity that I think all of our communities together foster. And I think that's really, really special. Um, yes, this was the 3D Zelda relay, um, probably one of the final ones before Tears of the Kingdom comes out. Um, I've heard a lot of talk from our runners that perhaps they want to run this back soon. Um, <laughs> so maybe you'll see that in the near future. But for now, thank you all very much for watching. Thank you, Beast and Mini and Dope and Corpser and Noman and Yell for showing off your amazing talents um, on one big final uh, run for the first session of Event Horizon. Um, once again, thank you all and have a good night.